Brown is not. At all here? Uh, no, she won't be here for closed okay. session. Let's, uh, let's get going. We have a quorum. The hour of 12 o'clock having arrived and a majority of the city council having arrived, I will call this meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council on March 14th, 2023 to order and would ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Council Member Brown is absent. Watkins? Here. Councilmember Bruner is currently absent. Um, Kalantari Johnson. Present. Vice Mayor Golder. Here. And Mayor Keeley. Here. A quorum having been established, we will move forward uh, for public comment on any item regarding closed session. Uh, we will have a closed litigation personnel session today. If there is anyone with us in chambers today who wishes to make a comment, on one or more of those uh, items, rather, that this would be your opportunity to do so. Seeing and hearing none, uh, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online who wishes to comment? We do not, no. We do not. Seeing and hearing no one who wishes to comment on our closed session agenda, we will adjourn into closed session and return at, uh, at 2 o'clock this afternoon or when we finish our regular business, whichever occurs uh, second. Pardon me, Mayor Keeley. Sir. Uh, we have a subsequent need item that I would like to ask the council to Please, add to sir. the agenda. Um, the basis for adding the subsequent need item is that um, the need arose after the agenda was posted and due to um, some time constraints, uh, it's necessary that the council uh, discuss the item before the next regularly scheduled meeting. The item is a matter of pending litigation. It's the uh, lawsuit entitled City of Santa Cruz versus the Regents of the University of California. Without objection, that will be added to our closed session agenda today. We, we require that it be uh, adopted by motion and it requires. There is a motion so by Ms. Watkins second. and a second by Mr. Newsom to add that to our closed session. Is there any debate or discussion concerning this matter? Concerning the motion, seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown is absent. Uh, Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Absent. Uh, Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes unanimously and so ordered. We now stand adjourned into closed session.
the hour of two o'clock having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council is back in session uh, for our afternoon session. The uh, clerk will please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkin? Here. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Uh, I am going to recognize Council Member Kalantari Johnson for some remarks regarding Persian New Year. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Persian New Year is called No Ruz, and it's the first day of spring, and it takes place on or around March 20th every year. And this year, um, thank you to our mayor for the proclamation that you issued. We'll be presenting that at an event that the city's co-hosting at the MA on this Thursday, March 16th, from 6.30 to 8, and all are welcome. So we'll describe what Persian New Year means, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the women's freedom movement that's taking place in Iran. Very good, thank you for that. Uh, I would also like to invite the good folks from Hope Services who are here with us today. I can see smiles, so I think I know who's who from Hope Services. Uh, we are so grateful for all the work that Hope Services does in our community every single day. Uh, council members here with more experience than I have sitting on this body know better than I do how how much that work is is, is so meaningful in people's lives. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge the Parking for Hope program uh, where the city of Santa Cruz each year decides to use a portion of the uh, money and parking meters to uh, provide additional support for Hope Services and the very good work that they do. Uh, I would like to invite Hope Services Manager Heather Perez, Employment Coordinator Jessica Guzman, Crew Supervisor Hector Castillo, and Litter Abatement Crew Member Sarah and Cassie uh, to come forward. Thank you so much. This will help support our programs for six months out of the year to support the downtown litter abatement crew. So thank you. Uh, you're certainly welcome. Certainly welcome. All right. Uh, bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, We're under presiding officer announcements. Uh, uh, there are none. Statements of disqualification. Any member wish to make a notice? Uh, Ms. Bruner? Uh, out of an abundance of caution, I will be disqualified from item number 17 as it relates to my employment. Very good. Thank you for that. Additions and deletions. Uh, Ms. Bush? There are none. No. There are none. Thank you. 
city attorney report from closed session, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Keeley, members of the city council. Uh, the council met in closed session uh, this afternoon at 12 o'clock in the courtyard conference room. Uh, Councilmember Brown was not present for that portion of the meeting. The following items were discussed. Uh, first of all, prior to adjourning to closed session, an item of subsequent need was added to the agenda, and that is pending litigation, the matter currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court entitled City of Santa Cruz versus the Regents of the University of California. Um, that item was discussed in closed session. Um, first item on the closed session agenda was real property negotiations, properties at 333 Locust Street and uh, APNs 022-721-0708 and 09, located in the city of Scotts Valley, um, city-owned property. Those items were deferred to a, a subsequent meeting. Item two was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. Those are the claims of Laurel Pennebaker and Davida Seliger. Uh, those items are also listed on your consent agenda this afternoon as item number nine. The third item was a conference with legal counsel concerning anticipated litigation. And that is the council met to consider initiation of litigation uh, on one potential uh, case. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, city versus regents case was discussed in closed session, but there was no reportable action. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, any reports on the council meeting calendar? Um, no new items, but just a reminder, next Certainly. Monday is a special meeting. Monday is a special meeting. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on the consent agenda at this point. These are items who, which are all clustered together uh, that will be voted upon on one motion. Uh, what we will do at this point is I will go around the council and ask if there are questions, comments, or a desire to move any of these items off of the consent agenda. Then you will be given an opportunity to comment upon and request any item to be moved off the consent agenda for, for further discussion. These are items six through 14 inclusive on your agenda. Let me see if council members wish to comment or pull any items. I'll start on my left, Ms. Bruner, Ms. Kalantari Johnson, Ms. Golder, Ms. Watkins, Ms. Brown. I would like to pull item 10. Item 10. Item 10 will be pulled And for those of you, this is item 10 is the Santa Cruz Police Officers Association and Santa Cruz Police Management Association tentative agreement for successor memoranda of understanding. Uh, there has been uh, a request for extra time on that uh, for Mr. Meisler. That has been granted. So when this item is prepared, Mr. Meisler, I will recognize you for that purpose. Uh, and Mr. Newsom, any, okay. Uh, let me ask if there is anyone with us today who wishes to comment upon the consent agenda or request that an item on the consent agenda be placed on the regular agenda. Yes, sir. Good, good afternoon, sir. I'm not sure it has any real relationship, but I've, I've wondered since the, uh, the August uh, of 2021 uh, Santa Cruz maniac ride out that came through this town with 5,000 bicyclists and caused all kind of havoc. I've been trying to find out if anybody, anybody in the city ever wrote a report on the incidents in that. I did a records request for anything that was referred to 911 calls uh, that were referred to city services. But I would think given the complete failure of being able to prevent what happened and all the problems that happened that weren't reported, that somebody would have taken the time to report. So I'm asking, okay. and, and that's 
it's a police affair and it, it has to do with their duties and whatnot. So that's the reason I brought it up right now. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Under oral communications, we're, well, no, I'm sorry, this is not oral communication. This is a, a comment on the consent agenda. Thank you. I think what I'll do on that is let me see if, if uh, you would leave your name and phone number. Uh, I'll follow through with, with the city manager and, and the chief police, see if we can get a, an answer to your question, okay? Well, you've all got my contact information on that yellow hand. I'm not sure I do, but. Oh, yes, you did. You got I one, do. too. All right. Absolutely. Well, I've got it then. Okay. Other people are glad to give it to me. Very good. Thank you, sir. Anyone else who's with us today wish to comment on the consent agenda? Seeing and hearing none. Someone did just raise their Mr. hand. Mr. Meisler. Mayor, uh, sorry, someone me. did just raise their hand. On Somebody my... did just raise their hand. Let's go to them then. Good afternoon. You are with us online. Good afternoon. I'm going to count to three here. One, two, three. There we go. All right. Uh, a motion on the remaining. Mayor, before you go, I'm wondering, I, I intend to comment on item 10. Is That'll be the appropriate time when you pull it off the agenda. When we take it off, that's Good. right. We'll, we'll be with you then, Mr. Norris. Uh, seeing and hearing no further items, uh, a motion to approve the remaining consent agenda would be in order. I'll move the remaining consent agenda. Motion by Ms. Watkins. Second. Bruner, second. Bruner. Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Thank you. Uh, we are on item 10, and uh, this is the item that was requested to be pulled by Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown, would you care to open on this item? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I just want to say I received uh, multiple requests from members of the public to pull this item from the agenda today and agreed to do so. Uh, the item is... Uh, approval of the Santa Cruz Police Officers Association and Police Management Association um, contracts, uh, labor contracts, and uh, the, the requests that I received included concerns related to specific, um, I think it was primarily related to specific positions and uh, the vehicle abatement position in particular in the uh, police budget. And while that is not something that we can necessarily discuss um, here, because it's not within the scope of our labor negotiations, I wanted to give an opportunity for uh, folks who made this request to speak about their concerns before we take a vote. Thank you. Anyone with us today who wishes to make such comments on item 10? Good, good afternoon. Hmm. My name is Leanne Sherwood, and my father was the pastor, uh, associate pastor of the Circle Church from 69 to 85, and I know he would approve this message. This is for the Santa Cruz Police Department and Santa Cruz City Council. This is for all backyard meters and burn beaters, bum beaters. Associate Path will stand there and watch watch you cry over the pain that they have caused you with a glint in their eye, a smirk in their face, no remorse, no apology, and they will keep winding you up and mock you for crying. Shame on you. Anyone else on item 10? Good afternoon. Hi. Um, my name is Reggie Meisler. I'm a member of Santa Cruz Cares. I work in a coalition with a large number of other groups to defend the rights of people who live in vehicles and tents. 
Um, we have a request for you uh, regarding the Santa Cruz police labor contract, uh, namely that you either reject the MOU to make changes to it or you amend the MOU to remove the vehicle abatement officer position and the vehicle abatement hotline from the Santa Cruz police force. I'll talk a little bit about why this is a deeply problematic role and speed dial number for our police. But let me first address this in a wider context. People need housing. They need housing they can afford and they need a lot of it at this point. They can't wait 10, 20, or 50 years from now for housing to become available. More people are living in their vehicles and tents every year and so there's a desperate need for people to simply be allowed to exist while our government attempts to address a multi-million unit deficit of affordable housing throughout the state. That is what this is really about. People need a way to exist while they're poor. We need a bottom to this capitalist system that is currently creating a downward spiral of suffering. You lose your job, you lose your apartment, you lose your vehicle, you lose your tent, and then you lose your life. <sighs> We need a bottom to this system because the way things are working right now, people are led to death. They're led to death by exposure or death by suicide. So with that in mind, let's talk about why the vehicle abatement officer and the abatement hotline are perpetuating that downward spiral. For those who don't know, the vehicle abatement officer is Recording a role in the Santa in Cruz Police Department dedicated to handing out 72 hour tow notices also known as abandoned vehicle notices or green tags to nuisance vehicles. For a wide range of community complaints, including complaints which are purely subjective and aesthetic, like general unsightliness. Complaints by neighbors sent to the SCPD are not investigated before a tow notice is given, and reporters are not required to provide personal information, meaning complainants cannot even be held accountable for false police reports of an abandoned vehicle. As you might imagine then, unfair reporting and abuse in this system is rampant and normalized. Groups like Santa Cruz Neighbors are very public about their intention to use this vehicle abatement hotline liberally. Uh, not simply to address public health and safety concerns, but also to address what they consider to be blight in their respective neighborhoods. The biggest target for this program is our neighbors most vulnerable to tow orders, people living out of their vehicles. I've heard numerous stories of the system being used to unfairly target and harass people for simply having an unsightly vehicle. People getting green tags within hours or minutes of parking. People getting green tags while actively occupying their vehicles. Officers cracking someone's windshield when they place a green tag on their vehicle. Officers telling people, move one mile and aggressively chalking that message onto their tires when the law they're citing only requires they move a short distance, which is not actually defined. The ACLU recently sent you a letter, which I uh, was supposed to give you a physical copy of. I'll send it to you again uh, via email. And that letter details how green tags, what the vehicle abatement officer gives out, is neither lawful nor enforceable. So why continue to support a program that is discriminatory, abusive, unlawful, and unenforceable? amend the MOU or reject it to erase this shameful role from our city police force and stop the downward spiral while we await for truly affordable housing to be built. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Greg Bankson, uh, registered voter. Um, I'm a resident up at the Armory right now and um, I hope we have more room to get people in. Basically, I believe that you know the politicians need to have their feet held to the fire or just warmed at the fire. But the police, uh, you know, I think we're I think we're lucky to have the cops that we do have. Um, I've been in Chicago. I've been thrown 40 feet by two cops, and um, these guys do a pretty damn good job of letting us be foolish. And um, and uh, I asked them one day. I was like. Or they said, well, this is what we signed up for. And then I chased them down and I said, you signed up to babysit 50-year-old drunken men like me that are, well, I'm older, but, and uh, that do no better. And they're like, well, and they, sh you know, they shouldn't have to do that. But I've been sober for 14, 15 days, and, but I'm still mischievous. But um, 
we need to, like I said, at the Benchlands, I was co-chairman of the Benchlands Council, um, which means I was the only person that did anything or that showed up anymore, but that's mischief too. Uh, let's keep the focus on the origins of, of uh, what's causing things, you know, and we could, you know, those 70 outdoor beds do not really count according to Boise versus Wade, and we could flip a lawsuit if we needed to, but um, there's other ways to get stuff done, and it, the most important thing is let's remember, you know, the multiple people that have died out on the streets, mostly from drugs, but um, it's not easy to get the cleanest over out there. Let's make things good for them. Let's keep uh, keep us safe. Let's let the cops go home to their families and um, let the politicians go home to their families. And um, and I will and can stay there. No, no, no. We need them to do stuff until I get to office. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Smith, good afternoon. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here. I'm glad you're all here receiving. And the rain let up and the horrible rain, I mean the wind, but people from Chicago are used to it. And I, um, I've lived in Santa Cruz for 53 years, staunch Democrat. Why I'm here, I um, am concerned when, well, tell Public Works to get in gear. I'm waiting, as many people are, for the fencing around duck, the duck pond to be removed, and there are still lights that are out on the walkway. And uh, the, for those of us who love to walk to the park and through the park in downtown to get to TJ's. And as Sandy knows, I told her I wish that I could get a little commission once a year. I live near the river bank and I walk a lot and constantly picking up trash and thought of <laughs> mentioning it since lo and behold, trash to pick up on my way here. And beyond that, Mayor Keeley, I left a telephone message for you that I presume you received, if not, about a brilliant book I want to give you. I'd like to pass on brilliant books. I said, who can I, who really would love and deserve this? Besides uh, supervisors. Um, Golden Gates, The Housing Crisis, and A Reckoning for the American Dream by Connor Darty. And it's, it, it's historical and sociological, and it'll inspire you all, but for the mayor to take it home and eat it up and read it all up and uh, use it for future, Ms. Smith, here's it's what I'll do. It focuses on San Francisco. Here's what I'll do. I have a policy about not receiving gifts, but you can... Well, it's not but, a gift. It's but, a but, but, citizen input. But you can, you can gift that to the city of Santa Cruz, and any of us can read it. So if you would give that to the city clerk, that would be great. Of course. Sir. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Jewell, how are you? Thank you. I'm good. Um, I just wanted to take a quick minute to echo what Reggie Meisler said. Um, as many of you know, I spent four years living in my RV. Those tickets, the green stickers, they do nothing to help individuals get housing. In fact, it hurt my family quite a bit. The resentment is still very much in my heart about that whole situation. Um, the money that's spent on tickets could be saved to help people get housing. Um, I spent a lot of money on tickets that could have been used on food for my family, um, could have been used on a lot of other things. So I do want to echo what Reggie said as the truth. Um, he said a lot of truths that pertain to the unhoused community and people living in their vehicles. And so I think that, again, I will say the focus needs to be on services and not criminalization. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kidd. Good afternoon. I, I'm not sure whether I used up my time. It was kicked off the agenda, the, the, uh, the memo of understanding with the, the police. But this concerns the issue that people have been talking about, about parking. So it's very, very short. Okay, okay. So I've been, I think, pretty uh, liberal in uh, allowing people to speak to number 10 without speaking to number 10, so. Well, this is exactly about the issue of. I'll tell you what, well, you, you use your time as you wish. Your time okay, starts thank you, now. Thank you, Mayor Kaley. 
Keeley. Um, in case anybody has a problem with a Santa Cruz parking ticket, I know a legal way to challenge it and win. I've known this for years. I'm not going to reveal the secret here in front of Council and Tony. <laughs> but uh, it's very effective, and I've done all the thorough legal research on it. So uh, part of the process of the parking tickets uh, is unconstitutional under um, a decision by the California Supreme Court. So that's all I'm going to say. If you want to talk to me and get in touch with me, anybody can. And my, if you can find the yellow sheet, that's got all my contact information on it. Love to help somebody out. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Norris, good afternoon. And uh, hello to the community and the city council. Um, in these chambers, we are c constrained to wedge our groans of pain and shouts of outrage into a two minute slot. Uh, adding insult to injury, oral communication has been denied its traditional spot today at a time certain, so most people. My, don't even know when to come and speak, unless I've been misinformed. <clears throat> Any MOU, which is what we're talking about on this, in this period, must, of course, severely cut police funding, if not shift it entirely to real community organizations that provide actual services for Santa Cruz. Ask how many times a police officer has helped you in the last five years. <laughs> Ask yourself that question. I mean, honestly. Uh, not do it with any disrespect to individuals who get their salary that way. Police murders and militarization in other places, lack of accountability here, and police collusion with DAs and business interests plagues us. Should more money be spent on funding these armed goon squads that forced hungry and homeless people to eat in the rain in the past week? Right outside these chambers, it happened on Friday. Should we bolster the weaponry of uniformed gunmen who drove community members away from here, the seat of government, because they were setting up food under the eaves so that people would not be rained on? Do we continue to ignore voices that point to increasing discrimination against black and Latino residents in San Francisco and San Jose and has also been documented here with dangerous and life-threatening traffic stops? Documentation is shown in San Francisco and San Jose. These stops threaten minority folks two to six times as heavily as us privileged white folks. Is this the truth? And this issue, what, what does it have to do with memorandum of understanding? Well, this is a, this is a pay raise. And when, when it's hard to oppose a pay raise to our employees of any kind, but when you have individuals who are violating people's rights without accountability, one has to put that into a real examination before one raises their salaries and commends them for the good work. I mean no disrespect to any human being here or in the broader water-soaked community. But as a matter of principle, it's important to preserve our First Amendment rights by not being afraid to show disdain and outrage for a local government and a local mayor, amiable as he may be, who has refused to open broader shelter for this winter, but most outrageously for this series of storms coming up. They may be drenched, shivering, with the only warming center accessible to all on those few nights to be open closed. The current depot center is a joke. The other centers are too far from town. A stated capacity of less than 30 at depot, an actual capacity of less than 60. Meanwhile, across the street, the Civic Auditorium lies empty and guarded by the promise of violent force should anyone attempt to escape the atmospheric flood there. It should not be tolerated. Thank you, Mr. Lord. Is there anyone else who is with us who wishes to comment on item number 10? Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the council. A motion is in order. Ms. Brown? I will move the item. The item's been moved. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Is there debate or discussion on the item? Ms. Brown. I would like to make a few remarks, uh, given that I pulled this item and have been in communication with some of you who are here today. Um, so I just want to say that I, I share uh, your concerns that have been expressed, and I'm going to try to speak just to this item here, um, but I just want to generally say I share the concerns that uh, you all are expressing. I have consistently uh, expressed concern and opposed uh, efforts that are enforcement 
based approaches to addressing our homelessness crisis in our community. Um, what people are going through is um, obviously, you know, really unconscionable. Um, and <clears throat> I'm not saying that to place blame anywhere <laughs> in this room. Um, we have some major challenges to, to try to work through. And, um, and I think that um, trying to work on those changes in the context of a labor contract uh, with the people who do this work, um, go out every day, and um, you know, you know, I, I think that that's important that we support our workers. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of leave it there. I guess it, I could say more, but um, this is a workforce issue as well. And as uh, management <laughs> here, that, as I am, I think it's really important that we support our workforce. Um, and this is an a MOU that was negotiated in good faith. Um, but I do take your concerns seriously, um, and we'll continue to work on them elsewhere, elsewise. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Others on this item? Please call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Consent agenda and additional item 10, or item 10 rather, are approved as submitted. We are on item 15. Uh, this is an item that is an appeal of Transportation and Public Works Commission approval of parking removal on Laurel Street as part of the Laurel Street Vision Zero striping improvement plan. Staff presentation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Starkey. I'm the transportation manager here at the city of Santa Cruz, joined by transportation planner Claire Glogley. And we will hear from uh, Lieutenant West Morey and uh, Director Nathan Wynn is uh, in the audience as well. We're here to talk about uh, Laurel Street and our Vision Zero striping plan that we've prepared. Uh, so I'll share a little bit of the project background, some of the policy framework that brought us here. Um, existing conditions that are out there. We'll hear a little bit from the Santa Cruz Police Department on the safety concerns on this area. Uh, and then I'll get into the design details to show you what we're proposing. So the project background here, uh, we're taking an opportunity to um, improve Laurel Street uh, with the Pure Water Soquel project. Uh, this project will be microsurfacing and restriping the roadway. And at a very low cost to the city, we're working on making these improvements. The bigger improvements uh, to this roadway that um, we've heard from constituents about are not always possible in these projects. Right now we're constrained to just working within the existing curb lines that we have. Claire's gonna share with us about the policy that brings us to this project. So the policy framework is really getting to the why of this project. If we wanted to proceed in a status quo manner, what we would do is go out and restripe exactly how it was before. And we feel fairly strongly that we have really clear marching orders from uh, mayor, council, and past councils to not do that, to make positive changes in our community that really align with our general plan, active transportation plan, climate action plan, vision zero policy, local roadway safety plan, and health in all policies. And expanding on each of those briefly, our general plan has a plethora of goals, policies, and actions that relate to increasing multimodal transportation, increasing safety, and increasing accessibility for those who walk and bike in our community. Our active transportation plan sets aggressive goals for us to improve not just the number of facilities, but the quality of facilities that we provide. We know there's really clear data that shows when people feel safe walking and biking, they're more likely to walk and bike. And the um, improvements in front of you today directly relate to that. Our climate action plan calls for 
aggressive increases in walking and biking and decreasing people driving single occupant automobiles, as you can see from the graphic on the screen. 69% of our emissions in our community come from transportation and mobile sources. That's something that we need to address dramatically if we want to really make an impact on climate. Uh, you know, very recently we've seen some climate impacts on Westcliff and we'd like to you know, start, start turning the tide. Uh, with Vision Zero in 2019, the City Council adopted a Vision Zero policy. Stated bluntly, this says that no injuries, uh, fatalities, or severe injuries on our roadways are acceptable. So when we look at transportation improvements that we are proposing, we do it through a Vision Zero lens. What is the safest type of infrastructure that we can put into those facilities to directly address a history of injuries and fatalities that we've seen on our roadways? Our local roadway safety plan did a deep dive into our entire city and pulled out Laurel Street as one of our priority corridors to make changes on to address our history of high collisions. This is direct in direct alignment with that. And finally, getting into health in all policies and equity. Specific to this corridor, 20% of the trips are made by people walking and people biking, but they represent 67% of fatalities and that is, uh, for us, an unacceptable rate. Our most vulnerable road users are most exposed to traffic, to vehicles, without protection. And so in this context, Matt's going to go through the improvements that we are proposing, but they are all based in the policy framework that Council has directed, and in particular, are primarily safety improvements, looking at our multimodal roadway users and thinking about how we can best align our infrastructure with our policies. An important thing to remember with these policies is we're really working on how we move people in our community. And we're gonna hear a lot about how people are having trouble parking uh, after they've driven to their homes in this neighborhood. One of the challenges with cars is that they're very inefficient with the space. Uh, the graphic on the screen shows you how many people you can move in a 10-foot wide lane. So you can see here that it's much easier for us uh, in our city to move people who are biking, walking, and using transit, which is luckily uh, the least carbon-intensive forms of transportation we have. So think about how we make these changes in our community. It's, um, it's nice to look at this model on the screen here. Uh, we know that there's different groups of people uh, in the community. Uh, about 7% of people, uh, this is from a nationwide survey, are uh, in the strong and fearless cycling category. These people will <laughs> ride their bike no matter what. I'm sure you know some of those people. Uh, there's also the enthused and confident folks. These people might be comfortable in a bike lane. Um, and then there's also people who aren't biking yet. They're interested but concerned. And they might not choose to bike now because they don't feel like roadways are safe enough for them. Then there's also a group who I think we'll also hear from that are never gonna ride a bike for various reasons. And, and that's okay. It's interesting to look at these numbers and how they compare to our bicycle mode share currently. We're at about 6% currently, um, but we really have to grow in our climate action plan we have to reach 30% biking and walking trips. So what that means is we need to really uh, capture the people who are interested but concerned. And we do that by creating the separated bike lanes um, that are proposed in this project. So what do we have on Laurel Street currently? Uh, Laurel is a major roadway through our community. It carries about uh, 13,000 vehicles per day. Um, based on the peak hour counts, uh, I believe there's about 300 bikes a day on the roadway. We do see that there's a bit of a speeding issue on the road, and I think particularly this is impacted by the curve uh, coming down from, uh, from California. Uh, you can see the speeds are much higher in the eastbound or the direction into the city. Another important piece of this corridor between Walty and Chestnut is 88% of the properties have off-street parking. One good piece of good news out here is um, we've made some improvements in the past that are actually showing that we can make these sort of quick improvements to reduce the crashes on the corridor. So in 2013, the left turn lanes and the medians that were installed actually helped us reduce the two year crash average from eight crashes a year to two and a half crashes a year. I think that really speaks to um, how these, these small improvements actually can make a really big difference for the safety of our roadways. One of, the, one of the challenges we have, though, is as a Vision Zero community, uh, we have to get to zero, not 2.5.
So the Laurel Street crash daddy here in, in bigger pictures helps us show what's happening out on this roadway. Um, so this is 2011 to 2019, so nine years of data available. Uh, I excluded the pandemic years because they're kind of odd uh, travel years. So there's a really high proportion of broadside collisions. Uh, that's the major contributor out here, which means um, people are turning into other people. And we see that in the majority of the violations out there, improper turning or right away violation. Another interesting thing with the, um, the data is we see that the majority of the victims are under 24 years old. Uh, the demographics actually represent uh, the community. It's about a 50-50 male-female split. Um, but one thing that really sticks out on this chart is the majority of the people getting hit by cars are people biking and walking, shown in orange on this chart. So here's what we're going to do about it. Uh, the thing that we have to change is um, we need some additional space. And this is what is under appeal this afternoon. And it comes down to the one primary issue here, which is parking. And this is something that we've evaluated very carefully since our Transportation and Public Works Commission hearing back in January. When we initially proposed this project, there were 19 stalls proposed to be removed on the corridor presented here. But we heard at the meeting that this was a really big deal for the neighbors. Uh, so what we did is we evaluated the site distances or the visibility at all the corners here when you turn in and out of the intersections. And we also looked for an opportunity to increase additional parking. So now what we've done is we've reduced our um, clear corner site distance areas. And we've also added additional parking stalls on Myrtle Street to change the net parking loss from 19 stalls down to four. And with that change, there's no longer a parking impact on Walty Street. Uh, we're now only removing one stall on both Felix and Blackburn, and then we're adding, again, 10 stalls to Myrtle Street by changing it from parallel parking to angled parking. Here's another close-up version of what we're proposing to do on Myrtle Street. Uh, we're lucky out here that the roadway has additional width. Um, there's currently angled parking down by the high school, and we're carrying that treatment through the corridor here. Another thing that we heard at um, the council meeting, TPWC, was that there was a concern about people having to walk an, an additional distance if we remove their parking in front of their homes on Laurel Street. Uh, so Lieutenant West Morey from the police department is going to come talk to us a little bit about um, the safety of these roadways. Lieutenant, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mayor, council members. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've worked for the city as a police officer for 22 years. Uh, and I've worked the west side uh, many of those years. And for most of my career, I've been involved with traffic and traffic safety. So just a little bit about me when I talk about this. Uh, transportation manager Matt Starkey did uh, come to me and, and talk about the project and uh, asked my opinion about it uh, as uh, speaking for on behalf of the police department. I was very excited about the project, um, uh, being involved in several accidents in that area involving bicyclists and skateboarders and pedestrians. Uh, I thought, I looked at the project, I thought it was a great idea. Uh, and then he asked me, he said some of the community members had concerns about that area being a high crime area. My immediate thought was that's, that area is a safe neighborhood, it's not a high crime area at all. Um, so instead of just taking my opinion, uh, what I did is uh, I ran some data uh, talked to officers that work that area every day, and I came back with kind of a uh, some information for Matt. And uh, so basically, on a in a six, I just went back six months. I went, went back in a six month uh, period in that area on Laurel Street for uh, Myrtle, Walty, Felix, that whole area. And in that six months, we took a total of four reports from that neighborhood. Two of them were auto burglaries, where somebody had, had broken into a vehicle and stolen some stuff. One, uh, one case, somebody stole a bicycle in that area, and I don't know what the other uh, theft was, but they were all um, low-level property crimes, no, no violent crimes in that area, which is, is what I, I figured uh, from that area. I also talked with officers in that area that work there every day. Uh, they do not feel it's a high-crime area at all. They think it's a safe neighborhood. I talked with one officer today, so the last time I went out there was for a bicycle accident. Um, so just to kind of give you a perspective of that, of that neighborhood. Um, 
one thing I did want to bring up is that the, the our city receives a, a, an OTS traffic grant every year, $97,000, because we are, uh, when you look at our data, we are very high in bicycle accidents versus cars, or uh, bicycle, or um, cars versus pedestrians, uh, cars versus skateboarders. So we actually are granted this OTS grant every year so we can go and try and reduce those crashes and reduce those, those numbers. Um, and then also I wanted to talk about how, our, how the accidents went down to 2.5 uh, a year. Now, what happened was is, uh, with our reduction in workforce for traffic accidents, we reduced the number of traffic accidents we actually took and wrote, so for the data basically. So now for us to report an accident, to get the data, somebody would have to ha be injured and go to the hospital. So there are more accidents in that area, just we didn't report them in an actual official police report. Um, again, with my, my 22, 22 years, uh, I, I believe that this area is a, is a safe area. Uh, I've had friends that lived in that area that would walk to work. Um, I would personally live in that area. It's a nice area. Uh, there are a lot of people walking, a lot of people biking. The high school's right there. We have a lot of students walking around. Um, so I, uh, the police department is uh, on board with this project, uh, especially to keep these bicyclists and pedestrians safe. Lieutenant, thank you very much for being here. I think knowing some of the trade-offs we have to make to improve our roadway safety, I'd like to just show you what we're getting out of this project um, to wrap this up. So at the Laurel Curve, uh, we're working on, um, you know, how to reduce the speeds uh, and the issue of cars turning into the bike lane as people going up and down the hill. So what we're doing with that is we will have additional posts on the roadway here shown in these buffered areas. Um, that will help keep cars out of the bike lane. And that additional sort of vertical uh, object there is shown to help uh, show people to slow down more. Um, we're also adding these speed reduction markings on the roadway. Uh, those are often used on curves, maybe in more rural settings actually, where you create an illusion that people are going faster, so you actually slow down as a result. Uh, at the side streets, um, this really ties into the crash data that we saw where a lot of people are um, having angled collisions. Uh, oops, sorry. So the, uh, one step ahead of myself. Uh, so here we have the, uh, the widened medians here, which we know are a, um, a safety benefit for the people walking out there. Uh, and we also um, are keeping the left turn lanes uh, because we know those are helping people who are making these um, making these turns into their side streets. And we didn't we when we considered the changes on this corridor, we wanted to keep those because we've seen the improvements and we know how important it is for people to get into the neighborhood. Well, the next piece is the the daylighting, and this is what we're talking about with the, um, the increases in angled collisions out here. Making these changes will help people see um, cars that are coming in and out of the side streets more effectively. In addition, see pedestrians and cyclists that are crossing, um, shown in that green and yellow bars there on the screen. This is also one of the elements that we adjusted in our design at the Transportation and Public Works Commission meeting. Uh, initially, we proposed 20 feet of these daylighting treatments, but we actually went out to each corner to review them and reduced some of them down to 10 feet to help us uh, reserve parking. And here's an example of this treatment on Myrtle Street. Um, sometimes it's done with planters, but on our project, we'll be doing it with striping. So then this gets down to the big, the big change for us is the separated bike lanes with protected corners. Um, these treatments are really shown to reduce bike collisions, and they're also shown to reduce crashes for um, pedestrians and all users of the roadway. One primary reason for that is they're shown to reduce speed, which gives more people uh, time to react to, to unpredicted situations. And we also know that these improvements will help um, people in that interested but concerned group uh, maybe consider giving bicycling a, a chance. So with that, uh, we're asking to um, deny the appeal on this project and um, to have us investigate further the diagonal parking on Myrtle Street with the neighbors to see if that's an improvement they'd like on their street. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna now call up the appellant, Robin, Robin Belkin, and you'll have seven, 17 minutes to speak and present evidence in support of the appeal. Did you mention the 17 minutes? 
Thanks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. First of all, I can't see this from where I'm standing. It's kind of very blurry to touch. Um, yes, Bill, can, sorry, can you talk into the mic? Thank you. First of all, there we go. I cannot do this in 17 minutes. Unfortunately, there's just too much information about the improprieties in handling. Well, here's my suggestion. Get on with it then. <laughs> It'll help you get through your minutes. Okay, fine. Good, thank you. Okay, briefly I'd like to outline what I'll cover and try to provide some signposts along the way because it's all complicated. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about my tenants that live on Laurel Street and others like them in the neighborhood whose voices are not being heard. They're at great risk for their personal safety despite what the officer says about his 22 years of experience mostly with traffic. Um, and it's a great infringement on the lives of those that live on Laurel Street and their lack of equitable accessibility to their homes by taking out all the parking on their street. Uh, so first I just want to describe the location, which was uh, up on the screen a minute ago. Um, then uh, some of the circumstances around that striping and parking elim elimination plan. Then I'd like to talk about the stakeholders uh, that are impacted by this decision and some of the positions on the matter. Then I'd like to elaborate on my view on behalf of my Laurel Street tenants and many neighbors and more, as well as my concerns with the positions of some of the other stakeholders that have driven my appeal on which the city council must rule. And finally, fourth, I'll state the more equitable outcome I hope we will achieve. Uh, first of all, though, I want to just say that I would like to kind of establish the context for the, the council uh, in this regard. This is called the Vision Zero Striping Plan. So removing parking on all of Laurel Street has nothing to do with striping. And Vision Zero, as we've heard, has to do with access and equity. It's supposed to be a holistic approach. And all these loaded terms that by using Vision Zero, you're supposed to assume are included in this plan. But in fact, it doesn't address accessibility and equity of people that live on Laurel Street and can't park in front of their homes. And I also want to, to quote uh, Transportation Manager Starkey at the hearing. Uh, he said at the hearing that he does not know how to balance or measure the safety of the bicyclists, the 2.5 per year, versus the safety of all the women and people that have to walk from lo remote locations where they're supposed to now park instead of in front of their home, uh, back, back home. So we're looking at 2.5 bicycle accidents or other accidents per year, that safety, versus the daily safety and accessibility of everyone that lives on Laurel Street between California and Chestnut. So show of hands, how many of you would like to have all the parking removed from your street? So when your guests come over, anybody? Uh, when you have to carry groceries in your house? Let me just say, we, we don't respond to that. It, it okay. doesn't mean we don't want to agree with you, it's just that, that Okay. Please testify. Okay, I could address it to everyone, you know, in the in the room here, but Fair enough. I Thank would just you. like everyone to think personally how do you feel about this. And um, again, show of hands, you can't show them, but think about this. How many of you would encourage your daughters, your wives, your sisters, other friends, young people, old people, to walk alone? in the Laurel Neary neighborhood over by the 7-Eleven on Chestnut and Laurel uh, or anywhere in that neighborhood at night. It's not okay. This is, it's not okay and these women were not heard. 
Here we go. So I sent each of you, and I don't know if you looked at it, a map that was up on the screen. It basically was this one. Would, would okay. you like us to put that up on the screen? Do we have yes. that? Do we have that? Please. Uh, uh, can, any, can you do that? The, this won't be taken from your time. Wonderful. Let, Thank you. Let us pause for a second while we get this up for you. Okay, this is a Google photo, Google Maps photo of Laurel the Street. Clock again. Go ahead. This is a Google Maps photo of Laurel Street. And you can see on the left is the hill. It's called the Laurel Hill, where all the accidents are taking place at Walty Street. Okay? After that <laughs> is where they want to take out all the parking after the fact. After the, after the scene of the accidents, they want to take out all the parking on Laurel Street, the rest of the way down the road, all the way to Chestnut, which is in the end over here. So just the logic of that alone is not right. It's just not right. And one would hope that the Transportation Commission would address the issues where they are happening without infringing on the daily lives of everybody that lives on Laurel Street with this other kind of stubborn insistence on putting in bicycle bollards and removing all the parking. Uh, there's already a bike lane there. Uh, so I, I'm just telling you it's kind of bewildering. Um, so I just also want to say that I have another map to put up. Let's pause the clock here for a moment. Okay, this isn't the perfect map, but I'm going to have to do it anyway. Okay. As soon as the map comes up, we'll turn the clock back on. Okay, clock's back on. Okay, I just want to point out uh, in black, you'll see the streets that are affected all along Laurel at the top right, where <laughs> the red curbs and Bicycle ballards are supposed to be installed uh, beyond the Laurel Hill. Uh, and I'm asking you to note, see where the Neary Lagoon Park is? Mm -hmm. There's a trail there <laughs> that is designed, their words, not mine, to circumvent the Laurel Hill. It says right on their site, to circumvent the steep Laurel Hill, and it's a shortcut walking to town. And I sent it to you in letters. I hope you read it. Also note in the blue and red, that is the like $18 million segment seven of the Santa Cruz Rail Trail. It is designed for bicycles and pedestrians. So why are we spending all this money to try to make this steep, dangerous hill safer? And as transportation manager has said in your agenda packets, Putting in those bollards and those expanded bike lanes is supposed to increase use on the dangerous hill where all the accidents happen by 21 to 500 percent. His words, not mine. So why are, we, why are we even doing this? Why don't we just use the trail, the, any of the two trails? And finally, why don't, if there's really a problem, because he's trying to find the simplest problem, uh, solution to this problem, why don't we just have people walk their bikes down that dangerous hill? Put up a sign, walk your bikes down the hill. Rather than inconvenience everybody that lives on the street, not just now, but forever. Uh, I will tell you that at the hearing, again, in your agenda packets, it says, in quote, a couple of people voiced concerns about safety walking to their homes from remotely parked cars at night. I counted 41 people being represented, okay? Women called in and they spoke up and they spoke on behalf of their whole households. Uh, one of them said, I'm sitting here with all my roommates. I live with seven other girls and 
we have been followed, we've been harassed, we've been attacked, we've been touched in the street, and we don't feel safe not having home adjacent parking to our homes. We don't feel like we can go out anymore. Uh, my tenants on Laurel Street, there's six girls in the two-story top levels and three boys right now uh, on the duplex below. The six girls, the first week they moved in, had somebody try to break down their front door. And they had to stand on the other side trying to hold the door, which was cracked by the time we got there. Um, they've had people sleeping on the sidewalk, blocking the entrance to their gate to get into their house, uh, camping out on their front porch, and in their backyard. So I don't know if the officers are not there at night. In the day, it has a great walkability score on Zillow. It's like in the high 90s. It has a 99% bike score. It's called Biker's Paradise. Um, and a 45% out of 100 transit score. Um, because people still need cars. That's why. They still need cars because you can't go everywhere people need to go without one yet. And I'm a huge advocate of public transportation, and I hope the day comes when people can take buses and trains and other forms of transportation everywhere, but we're not there yet. Um, let me see what else here. The stakeholders, we have the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Uh, they seem to be working at cross purposes with the Planning and Development Commission. The Planning and Development Commission wants to build high density housing. Uh, and they're doing so with skimpy parking. And while they're doing that, they're also encouraging people to build ADUs without requiring parking because they're just trying to get houses for people. Uh, at the same time, transportation and public works is tearing out existing parking. So we're not ready for that yet. We don't have the public safety yet. We don't have street lights, which he said, you know, it's not their domain or it's, they're not here yet. So we're not ready to, to impose this plan on all the residents. We don't have the public transportation yet, and we don't have proper lighting and public safety at night. Um, I will read to you, oh, I have a petition that over 100 people signed online. It's only been up for a couple of days. Um, and it's addressed to you all, Mayor Keeley and the Santa Cruz City Council. So I gave you all links, and you're addressed on the... If you would be kind enough to give that to the clerk, we'll enter it into the record. Okay. Thank you. You resume your time now. So, thank you. So, a hundred over 100 people signed in just a few days. Uh, their support of my appeal and their... Uh, support of your vote to reject the Laurel Vision Zero striping plan components of parking removal, very specifically. And I will also say that in the spirit of cooperation, all those signers said that by signing, they also approved all the other changes proposed in the striping plan and other ones that have been recommended. Those changes would be properly maintain and enhance the existing green pavement bike lane that's there already, and crosswalk delineation by, re by refreshing paint, et cetera. Implement high, vis high visibility crosswalk markings with reflectors and in-use in flashing lights. Add new crosswalks if warranted. Monitor and reduce dangerous bicycle and skateboard speeds on the steep Laurel Hill by rerouting it altogether to the rail trail or other safe streets, or with signage, or by simply walking bikes and skateboards down the double wide sidewalks on the steep Laurel Hill. And with regard to the sidewalks, Laurel property owners paid for them. I had to pay $3,750 for a sidewalk that I do not own. <laughs> Uh, supposedly to make it more safe, 
and now the Transportation Commission is telling me I can't use the adjacent parking to the double wide sidewalk that I paid to repave uh, because apparently it's not good enough for people to walk their bicycles down or walk on, I don't even know. But <laughs> that, that's very concerning. Also, uh, the signers support add and or expand pedestrian, pedestrian medians, add neighborhood street lighting and police presence, particularly at night. <laughs> add speed bumps on Laurel Street to reduce automobile speed where warranted. And the undersigned neighbors strongly urge the Santa Cruz City Council to reject the red curbs, bollards, and parking space eradication in the Laurel Street striping plan. They further support the appeal submitted by the appellant of record, Robin Belkin, challenging and opposing the Transportation Public Works Commission's recommend recommendation slash approval of the Laurel Street Vision Zero striping plan, and likewise support and urge Santa Cruz City Council to reject the Laurel Street striping plan in its current form, i.e. the plan should be rejected if it contains provisions to add red curbs and bollards and to remove street parking on Laurel and adjacent side streets. So that you can, so that you can measure your presentation, you have about a minute and 40 seconds. Uh, okay, well, um, there were a lot of improprieties. All I can say is I submitted an appeal in two letters, one written on December 13th, one written on December 15th. Only one of those letters was included in the commission packets, so on the appellant and half of what I wrote wasn't included for them to talk about. Um, I will also say that the transportation manager who was spearheading this and the spokesperson at the hearing when he said, I don't know how to measure balance of the safety of the cyclists versus the safety and accessibility issues of all the people that live on Laurel Street, when challenged by the one or two only commissioners that were listening actively and not defensively, he said, this is just our recommendation. The city council can amend it at its will. So rather than discuss it or defend it, or address the concerns raised by the other commissioners. He just said, hey, the city council can change it if they want to. And he's already alerted us that he doesn't know how to balance and measure the issues of safety between bicycles and people that live there. So it falls on your shoulders to do that balancing and measuring. The daily safety of all the people that live there and the accessibility and equity of access to homes to move your furniture in and out, to carry your groceries in and out, to have guests and send them safely back to their cars in inclement weather. All the reasons why none of you would want all the parking removed from outside your house, uh, especially in that neighborhood. If you need a couple of more minutes, take a couple of more but we're gonna to try to keep it to a couple of minutes. I wanna make sure you get through your appeal. Okay. Thank you. I'll jump to my closing. The general residential parking safety concern expressed today at the Transportation Public Works Commission hearing in both my appeal and online petition is an economic and social justice issue, a women's rights issue and an accessibility and equity issue. Every renter or homeowner is not a young adult single cyclist. Cyclists don't exist in a vacuum, and they are perhaps the most able-bodied among us. So surely they can walk their bikes down the steep Laurel Hill on the double-wide Laurel Street sidewalks, ride a few blocks over to the rail trail and or the Neary Lagoon Trail, rather than gravely impact an entire neighborhood of hundreds if not thousands of paying residents by forcing them to relinquish their essential street parking in front of their own homes. Furthermore, this area lacks adequate public transportation to intentionally target car owners for whom we have not provided adequate public transportation alternatives to justify trying to eliminate their cars yet. Our city council ought to look out for these women, families, disabled, and mostly renters that seem to be viewed with disdain as if low density homeowners are justified to have their own cars 
uh, but high density renters aren't. This is a high density area because there aren't enough homes for everyone to own one. The majority of people can't afford to own at current rates. They yeah, have to I'd share homes. To, I'd ask you to try to wrap it up now. You've had like 19 minutes of your 17 minutes, so see if you can wrap it up. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, I'll just say that the photographs provided in your exhibits of the properties on Laurel Street that supposedly have parking, that's so ridiculous because a photograph of where people would park a car has nothing to do with how many people live in the house. I have space on my property Five seconds for four left. cars, Five seconds but left. 10 people live there. Thank, thank you, thank appreciate you your consideration. Thank you very much, we appreciate it and pleased to give you the extra time. Thank uh, you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the matter is, uh, let me ask if there are council member questions on this item. Let me see where anybody who wants to raise questions on this item. That's a yes. yes. Ms. Collins Hart Johnson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you um, for staff for your presentation, Ms. Belkins for your testimonial and the work of the TBWC. Um, I just want to bring out a couple of the points Ms. Belkins made and ask if you could speak on them. Um, if you could speak to the striping and parking removal beyond Walty, she spoke about um, the challenges that hill up to Walty. Um, why move beyond that? If you could speak to that, that would be great. Yeah, the, um, the majority of the parking removal is focused around um, <clears throat> between the Blackburn and Myrtle Street blocks. Um, there are cr collisions between bicyclists and cars at all of the intersections on this corridor. And furthermore, we're, we're looking at this on a two-prong approach. It's one, our Vision Zero goals of reducing crashes, but it's also the goals that the city has to increase uh, bicycle and walking mode share. And we know how to do that by creating uh, separated bike lanes, which takes the parking up. Hey, I would add to that also spot improvements do not build a network. Uh -huh. And so only doing this piecemeal does not lend itself to building out the protected network that we've expressed we want to build out in order to achieve our policy goals. And so doing it piece by piece doesn't make sense. Thank you. Um, I, a couple more if that's okay. Sure. Um, Ms. Belkins also spoke about uh, the strategy of increasing police presence in that area. I know um, Lieutenant Westmore gave the data that there isn't currently a lot of crime, but could you speak to how much police presence or Maybe the time you come up. Um, how much police presence is there currently, and are there opportunities to increase police presence in the future? Sure. The uh, West Side officers that work that area um, go through there all the time. They drive through uh, Chestnut. They go through Jenny. We, we go to uh, Neary Lagoon Park all the time. So officers are always going through there. Also, Laurel Street's a, a, a main a main uh, roadway. So we're always driving up Laurel Street to get to, to Mission or the whole Upper West Side. And also, we have um, we have a lot of activity at the 7-Eleven there at Chestnut and, and Laurel. Mm -hmm. So there are there are, and also this this whole area is two blocks from the police department. So officers are constantly driving through that area, um, driving through the neighborhoods, making sure everything is uh, making sure everything is safe. Um, and when I, when I spoke with my officers earlier that worked this area, um, they say they, they drive through there all the time, especially at night too. Um, I drove through there last night, uh, went through the whole neighborhood, uh, noticed that the actual lighting is, is adequate. It has good lighting there. Um, and it was, a, it was a very nice, calm, quiet night. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more question. Uh, the TBWC had a number of conditions that uh, they put forth that was voted on. Is that included in your recommendation? Yeah, we were able to address the um, conditions from the TPWC, and we actually went a step further to, to look at these parking changes. So yeah, we address, we adjusted all the um, corners, uh, the daylighting pieces, and then we went uh, and looked at Myrtle Street further to see if we could add the parking there. Uh, and those both um, were able to achieve both of them. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions for now. Council Member Brunner. Thank you. Um, you asked a couple of my questions. Um, I did want to ask about um, what was brought up as parking equity on Laurel Street, and um, Ms. Belkins mentioned 
uh, for parking spaces at her property, however, 10 tenants live there. Um, what, can you remind me what the total parking count is for Laurel Street? Not that's being removed, but I know like some of the properties, um, is there a way to, do you have a number of what, what you have as parking? I'll try to answer your question, I think, to what you're getting to is, is there enough parking for who's there? Right. Is that generally what you're getting yes. to? Um, and it's a really interesting question because many of the homes on Laurel Street were built originally intended for a single family to live there. If you drive down Laurel, you see, you know, a kind of single family or um, smaller scale multifamily housing. Um, as the appellant said, she has 10 tenants in her home, which is probably not what the original builder of the home thought was going to be there. She has uh, four or five parking spaces. She said many of these homes were built having parking as required by our code, but that doesn't reflect, we don't state mandates of how many people can live in those homes. So there is oftentimes a mismatch between maybe a single person that has four parking spaces or a home that has four parking spaces but has 10 people living in it. So 88% uh, of the homes on this stretch do have off-street parking. We, we didn't go through and do a census of how many people live in each of those homes. Um, what I will say is on the public right-of-way where we are proposing losing four parking spaces, those four parking spaces are often used for private car storage rather than a public benefit for the entire community, which is what we're proposing today, which is a reallocation of space away from private car storage, where many of these homes do have private off-street car storage, to a safety improvement for people walking and biking. Thank you. Uh, was there any look at um, options of maybe a loading zone or kind of the, the issue and concern brought up about um, accessibility, moving furniture, groceries, kind of the, the things that people encounter <laughs> in their lives and, and having that option? Yeah, that's, that's a definitely a fair question. I think Globally, we, we look at those issues, especially when we have um, like commercial businesses on the site. I think if this was a, a lot of commercial frontage here, we might take a different approach. Um, small sections of loading would be, would be challenging on Laurel Street itself, just with the width we have and what we're trying to fit in with the bike facilities. Uh, if that's something we wanted to look at more, I would say um, something on the side streets where maybe we uh, do some time restrictions, maybe two hours, 30 minutes, 15 minutes of loading zones on the side street corners might be an effective way to achieve that goal. Further questions? Not right now, thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Watkins. Um, I appreciate the questions that my colleagues um, already asked, so thank you for getting at some of that. Mine is just in regards to uh, figure that you mentioned in your presentation with 24 years old and younger were the fatalities majority and I'm wondering if that is um, in the range I mean I, I'm assuming is it the U, is it the UCSC type students or are you seeing more with the, the Santa Cruz High students or children like we're within that range are you seeing any yeah I'm trying, oh, I wonder if I had it I'm just and, and what I'm, at, I'm trying to get at essentially is if there's opportunity for conversation around our partners in education around safe practices in addition to what is being suggested here today in return in regards to what we can do environmentally right but in terms of how we're communicating with some of the education partners if that's such a young age range. yeah I, I, it is really interesting how this group of people really stands out I think we've we've heard that there's a lot of UCSC students that live in this area in particular so they're probably the ones biking up the campus it's obviously close to Santa Cruz High um, and we do programs with other schools elementary schools in particular about um, safe biking practices so yeah there are other sort of educational encouragement options we could we could take as a community to help people um, use the roadways more safely great what I would add to that also is that globally in our city that under 24 is overrepresented in our collision statistics Getting to equity, one of the things that that does represent is these are populations that oftentimes don't have the means to own a car. And so in thinking about how people have the opportunities to travel in our community, 
those who have the least means and the least ability are the most exposed to roadway violence. Sure, yeah, and I think in terms of just learning from these tragedies, how do we inform our prevention and kind of partnerships to support not having these happen in the future, so, okay, thank you. Ms. Golder. I changed my mind. I do have a question that just builds on something that you said. Um, you said there's no way to know how many people could be, or, or there's no requirements. Isn't there a fire code around how many people live per bedroom? Does anybody know? Crickets? Okay, maybe someone will tell us someday. But that's a question, because I feel like there should be some capacity that doesn't seem very safe. And then just correct me if I'm wrong, I was looking on Google Maps, and I was, or Google Earth, and I saw all, between this stretch, all but four of the homes are on a corner, and the four that aren't on a corner have driveways, have off-street parking, am I wrong? I think you're right. Think that's what I look, so every house. home is either on a corner or has a driveway. Or access from the alleyway. Or from the other side, <clears throat> like another corner, another street parking on their other side of their home. Or the alleyway. Got it, okay, thank you. Other questions by council members? A uh, Couple of quick questions, one is I, I uh, want to offer another way to look maybe at these older homes. Uh, I happen to live in 135 year old home, uh, which has depending upon whether my daughter-in-law is there or not at any given point, <laughs> two or three of us living there. Um, many of these older homes that were built actually were built for quite larger families. Uh, it is, uh, you know, a, a, a modern phenomenon to have smaller families in homes it is not at all unusual back in the 1800s or the 1900s when many of these homes were built for there to be much larger families. Um, so I wanted to uh, make sure on, on that we recognized, you know, what were these houses built for versus what are they used for now? I don't think it's unusual that a Victorian or an older home has eight or ten people. That doesn't surprise me at all. And I suspect when the original family lived there, that might have been multiple generations living in the home. So, a thought. Uh, on those accidents that occurred to you, and maybe you answered this already, and I'm sorry if you did, because I didn't hear it. Uh, of those accidents that you have recorded here, how many were the fault of the vehicle, and how many were the fault of the, of the other party involved? Uh, I don't have that available. Uh, Lieutenant, from what we know, generally speaking, if you don't have the precise data, that's okay, but generally speaking, do we find that auto bicycle accidents or auto pedestrian accidents tend to split in any particular way in our city? In that area, all the accidents that I have gone to, and which speaks to the primary collision factor of uh, uh, a broadside is basically the bicyclist is coming down the hill and the car is going to make a right turn on one of the streets, Walty, Felix, Myrtle, and then the, the bicyclist crashes into the passenger door or the uh, front passenger side. So the accidents that I've gone to, that's usually the, the uh, primary collision factor. And he would say that broadside or unsafe turning movement sure. is the primary collision factor. So, so yes. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, sir. So in that circumstances, from what I've seen and been out there, it, it's the it's the driver's fault turning turning making a, a, a right turn into the bicyclist, and then in most of the accidents that I've been to, I can remember was two specifically. There were there were at high school Santa Cruz high kids where we had to call the parents out, and then uh, specifically uh, college kids. So from the accidents that I've been out there, it's mainly college kids and uh, high school kids, with primarily the cars being at fault or the yes. vehicle, the moving vehicle being at fault, not the bicyclist. I cannot remember a time where we put the bicyclist at fault in that area, coming down that hill. Uh-huh, okay, uh, well thank you for that. That's, uh, that's helpful in understanding this. Um, I do think that the appellant has at least the color of an issue from my perspective, and that is uh, the, this issue of not having enough off-street parking and the changes in the law as that is developing, I suspect we're going to, I don't think there's a neighborhood in the city of Santa Cruz that doesn't have cars parked one by one by one by one in the evening as people come home and 
and so on. Uh, so uh, sort of saying that, well, that person can access because they have a driveway or because there's a, an alley or uh, whatever it might be, I think may to some extent ignore or or not quite look straight on at what this parking problem is that we have. Uh, and I think that what the gentlelady was talking about with regard to uh, especially women at night, I don't know that there is a neighborhood in Santa Cruz or in most modern American cities where, and I mean cities, not suburban environments, but, but cities where women feel quite comfortable walking around or carrying their groceries from two blocks away over to whatever. So I think there's a colorable case here that the, the gentlelady has raised. Now the question is what's the solution to that? And I'm going to defer to my colleagues who we now have district representation, so I'm going to defer to them on how they want to handle this in their district. But I think there's a couple of quite good points that have been made here. And I'm wondering in that regard, uh, like I say, the council member would do what he's going to do here. Uh, if, for example, you did everything but the removal of the on-street parking, you did striping, you did the ballards up on the, coming down from California, whatever it is you're going to do, uh, do you still have a project? Yeah, we, we still do have a project, um, but we don't have one that would help us achieve the type of goals um, that we're talking about here. You know, as, as Claire mentioned earlier, there's a the real challenge with creating a cohesive network that people feel comfortable um, making a choice alternative to cars. I mean, that's what people were doing in the 1800s when they had these smaller homes. They weren't, they weren't driving everywhere, they were walking downtown. Um, and that's kind of what we're trying to return to in some ways. I, I think that's, I, I understand the objective. I think that's good public policy goal. It uh, is one which is uh, certainly complicated by the modern usage of, of property in, in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, understanding that it would be less of a project uh, if you allowed the on-street parking on Laurel. Uh, how would you, if, if, if uh, I'm trying to probably ask you to do something that's difficult to do, but if you think this is an A-plus project in terms of obtaining the goals you would like to attain in terms of our public policy pursuit here, if you left the parking, would it become a D? <laughs> or would it be a B minus all of a sudden? I'm, yeah. I'm trying to get some sense of when you say we'd still, have, I asked, do you still have project? Yeah. You said yes, but probably not as good, certainly. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I hear you on this concern that's been raised by the appellant. And um, we have listened to the public on this issue. And that's why we tried to add parking where we really could, which is on Myrtle Street. The real focus of the parking removal is in that corner. And so we went out to Myrtle. It's a wider roadway, luckily. And so we're able to convert the um, parallel parking to angled parking, and that creates a more efficient parking scenario. So we have really, we've done our best to really offset these issues. Um, so with that additional parking on Myrtle, again, we're only losing four spaces in the neighborhood. Yes, it's a little further to walk to your front door, but I think that's a really nice trade-off for this really great project for our community. And I'm sure that that assessment is in the eye of the beholder, right? The, the very last thing you said, and I, I think that's a good comment, but I think it's a subjective comment, not, not that I think it's any less valuable. It, it, it's, I think that's in the eye of the beholder, who's, who's having that experience. May I offer a, a point to that? You Please certainly so. should. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I think it's really interesting to frame it as the eye of the beholder, because some of the things that we heard were, it's okay to bike out of your way, it's okay to walk out of your way, that's okay, but parking a block away is, is not okay. And so framing it as the mm -hmm. eye of your beholder and what policy objectives you're trying to put forward, I think is really That's important. right. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, if I may, members of the- How are you, the... Mr. <laughs> public Works Director? Yeah, Nathan Nguyen, uh, Public Works Director, City of Santa Cruz. I'm Mary Keeley, members of the public council members. I just wanted to also voice my um, thoughts with regards to the parking loss on Laurel Street and how critical it is as a component to the um, plan that's been presented to you guys as we presented to the uh, TPWC as well. Um, 
while we're not necessarily putting a grade on the current design versus if we had to remove the parking, what would the grade be? Um, it is a critical part to add a remove parking to in order to add these protected bike lanes, these protected intersections. Uh, again, goals that are um, aligned with our Vision Zero policy. Now, with regards to the where we're talking about where the parking removals are at, a majority of those parking removals are on Laurel Street between Myrtle and Blackburn. Um, the parking that's uh, proposed to be reinstated or uh, what we're seeking direction to, to go work with the neighbors on Myrtle Street to add parking back on Myrtle is within that same block. And so we're talking about parking spaces that are within three or 400 feet of the original parking spaces that are being displaced on Laurel Street, but being added back, potentially added back on Myrtle. So I just want to make sure that there's a little context. It's not multiple blocks that folks are walking in other locations that, that does happen in this case. It is the same block, it's just not on Laurel, it's just on Myrtle, it's in that same intersection. So that's where the parking would be re-added. Thank you, sir. And I, I, I'd like to respond to that a bit without hopefully being argumentative. I just would like to respond to that. Somebody has to go two to 300 feet further. That's correct. Is, is I imagine in many cases that would not be considered by folks who have to do that if you're carrying your groceries you've got one kid and your child rather in your arm and your you know your work you know, computer and a bag of groceries and you're walking two or three hundred feet I get it but that's not like more or less parking in front of your house and being able to to walk that distance so uh the, the change is the hardest thing we do as human beings. I understand that, but uh, but th thank you for your response, sir. I appreciate it. Let me ask uh, if there are further questions or comments by members of the council. We'll go over, to Ms. Brown. Thank you. I do uh, have a, a question because I think I'm I'm not entirely clear. So, uh, and and we did get some communications about it. Could could you talk a little bit about the. Um, daylighting and the, the, the distance. Um, I, I did read over the attachments and everything and I thought, well, I'm not sure, I can't really tell <laughs> what that's telling, I mean, it wasn't telling me what I think it's telling you. So i just like to um, better understand the distance on, on daylighting for the decisions that have been made here in this plan. Yeah, so day daylighting is the treatment we're making on all the side streets as they approach Laurel. Um, Originally, what we proposed is to just remove 20 feet of parking for, from the crosswalk back, which would, you know, pretty much just take out one space automatically. Uh, we heard that was a problem for everybody. Uh, so we went to uh, each side street and we looked at what's called the intersection site distance. And that's where you take a measurement from about 15 feet back from the crosswalk. And you look and you make these, um, these site triangles to investigate how much visibility you actually need um, uh, through the intersection. So when you do that triangle, it actually can reduce the distance down to about uh, 10 or 11 feet we found. So that was one of the changes we did through extra work is we went back out, we evaluated these site triangles, and we reduced our sort of broad blanket daylighting treatment we were proposing uh, to really custom fit it to each intersection to reduce our parking impact. Thank you, that's really helpful. Is there any other comments or further discussion? Questions from the council? Do we go out to the public now? Okay, I'd like to open it up to members of the public that would like to comment on this item. I do have people online also. Okay. My name's Andrew Jarvis. I live at 905 Laurel Street. My house is 120 years old. 19, oh, excuse me, 1903, bad math. It's been a long day with the trees down. Uh, I was gonna talk a lot about the daylighting because you've trusted me for the past 25 years to write nuisances about line of sight intersections. Uh, but really di what disturbed me was Lieutenant's comment that there's no crime in the area. Uh, my wife and I were terrorized just a few months ago oh, by- I wanna, I wanna- Sure. Uh, just I don't think he said that. I want to make sure we're clear. Okay. He didn't say there's no crime. He said it's a low crime area. There's a lot of crime. But I just want to make and sure that we're That's clear. fine. I understand. I take that back. There's a lot of crime in the neighborhood. 
Matter of fact, I called the lieutenant the other day and didn't get a response back about the increase in crime on Walty Street. We've had our tires slashed, cars broken into, all kinds of items stolen. We've been told by the patrol officers there not to even call or bother calling because their lack of officer's availability unless it's a violent crime. So there is a lot of crime in the area. Uh, the appellate's absolutely right about her tenants. I feel for the older people that live in the neighborhood. Um, I've got a new titanium knee. Yeah, making 300 feet extra makes a big difference to some of us. Can't carry my groceries all the way home from downtown. I'm sorry, I can't even ride a bike right now. I'd love to do so, but I can't. Uh, I just want to support what the appellate has said and her arguments about that. And we do support everything else in the project. It all sounds good. But removing all of our parking lowers the value of our homes, makes it more difficult for us to get around. We're not all 24-year-olds. And the appellate also had a very good point that the majority of the accidents are on the hill. It has nothing to do with the rest of the street. I'm not sure where we got our statistics from, from the traffic thing, but there's a lot more accidents than just 2.5. We see probably 2.5 a week. A lot of people don't respond or report them because they're intoxicated or they're moving too fast or they admit that they've done wrong. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you all for taking the time to hear about the appeal today. Um, I am one of the residents who stand to lose street parking in front of my house if we proceed with the Laurel Street striping plan. I'm a father of a 10-year-old son, and we are walkers, and we are bikers. Um, <clears throat> I will be speaking specifically about the straight and flat stretch of Laurel Street where the existing parking is proposed to be removed, not Laurel Hill between California and Felix. Um, the city does not have the data to justify the removal of the resident parking on Laurel Street in the name of safety. According to the city's own transportation safety reports from 2018 and 2019, there were zero reported incidents involving pedestrians or cyclists in the six year span, <coughs> excuse me, between 2014 and 2019. Additionally, using the mapping tools on UC Berkeley's transportation in, uh, injury mapping system known as TIMS, <coughs> in a five year span between 2017 all the way up to 2021, there were again, zero incidents along the stretch of Laurel Street where parking is proposed to be removed. This is actually great news. It shows that the existing bike lanes with green striping have already proven their ability to keep bicyclists safe along this stretch of road. Also, removing the resident parking on Laurel Street will not and technically cannot decrease the number of bicycle collisions along this stretch of road. <clears throat> the street parking, on the other hand, is used by my elderly mother, by other parents when they pick up or drop off their kids at our house for play dates, and when they pick up or drop off our child for carpooling. Lastly, please remember that able-bodied cyclists are not the only residents of Santa Cruz who are worthy of your plans and considerations. There are the elderly, the young, the handicapped and disabled, and others who may be vulnerable for a variety of reasons. There's a clear lack of equity mindset in these plans by the TPWC. I sincerely hope, thank you. If you want to take 10 more seconds or so, go ahead. It's just a thank you. It says, sure. I sincerely hope that you will listen to your homeowners and residents of the neighborhood. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yes, hello. Um, I'm Narayan Wilder. I've lived in, Cali in Santa Cruz County for my entire life. I was born here. Um, I've been riding the bus since I was 14. Um, every single day to go to school and back and just for a variety of other reasons. Um, and I'd like to address some of what I've been seeing as what feels like somewhat ableist language because disabled people are not just able-bodied people. I am legally blind without correction, so I cannot operate a car or really safely even a bike. I can ride a bike, but my vision is not good enough that I feel safe in being able to see threats to my life and read road signs. I can't usually read them until I am far too close for it to matter. So, you know, there is a lot more. Of, I am a permanent pedestrian, essentially. I walk everywhere. I walked here. I rode the bus for like an hour to get here because it had to route through Quail Hollow because of the flooding in Felton and it's a whole thing. And 
so yeah, there's a lot more than just bikes when it, you know, not just bikes when we're talking about accessibility and these kind of things. And so, you know, we need to really focus on, you know, like they were saying, a network of transportation. Because like, yeah, we, there are people like elderly folks who can't use bikes and those kind of things. So we do need to also strengthen our other forms of public transportation. We need to densify our urban areas so that, you know, you don't have to necessarily be driving everywhere to do everything. You can maybe take a bus that's 100 feet from your front door to the store and then back. Like, you know, it's not the focus upon the able-bodied bike rider feels like it erases many other kinds of pedestrians who are not just pedestrians because we're interested in health or those kind of things. It's a much more diverse and complex issue than just focusing on bikes. And that's something I wanted to say. Also on the, the hill issue, um, I'll be really quick, you know, the focus on like the hill, the speed at which people arrive at the hill is enforced by the context of the infrastructure around the hill. Mm -hmm. That is all, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Sagers. I'm a long-term resident on Felix Street. And I encourage the council and the mayor to deny the, um, the appeal. Um, there needs to be traffic calming of the feral traffic that is on Laurel Street. And this project, I believe, will help that. Um, car ownership, it seems like, um, People are very entitled owning cars. Everything is geared toward the car. If you wanna reach climate plan um, goals, um, you need to start planning for the future. You know, two households, there's 2.3 cars in each household. And it's just, you don't wanna like plan for more cars and traffic. I believe um, the issue is a parking management problem. There is a problem when one household can have potentially 10 parking permits. We don't need to encourage that any more than it already is happening. There's something fundamentally wrong when one house can have 10 parking permits and they wanna have parking right in front of their house. If every house behaved that way, there'd be no room for any, where's everybody gonna park? Um, the more parking spaces you have, it's going to cause more driving. Um, traffic calming on Laurel will help protect elderly, less experienced commuters, and youth crossing the street and passing through that corridor. I don't know if any of you have been through that corridor, or if any of you walk or ride your bikes personally, or if you all drive. And so I think that there's a disconnect there with the council um, not being aware of what it's like to go through that corridor. I encourage you all to get out of your car. If you do drive, get out of your car for a month and see what it's like to, to uh, go through this corridor. Thank you. Thank you very much. But let me just say for those of who are gonna testify, when the bell rings, your time's up, but take a few more seconds to finish your thought. It's really okay to do that. <laughs> good afternoon. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Gorn. I live right across from the Begori on Cedar and Maple. I am also a USC student, U, sorry, UCSC student. So I use the, I go up Laurel to um, King and then I go up Bay pretty regularly, almost every single school day to get to school. And I wanna voice my support for this project. And I wanna give an analogy. So uh, they're talking about connected network and I think that's extremely important because imagine you're driving your car and you're on the interstate, right? And then there's, a hundred or two hundred foot patch of a dirt road. You don't want to, like that just doesn't work, right? So the importance of a connected network is super important to encourage cycling. Um, also going down that hill, although there, like uh, uh, some people are saying, there might not be any accidents in that like stretch of block. Go, there's still the threat that a car door can open and uh, get like get you on the side, and that's not the bicycle bicycle's fault. That's the driver's fault. So this is why I support um, this restriping. Uh, is not, it is not enough. However, it is a step in the right direction. I want the council to consider what's more important um, for parking spaces or people's lives. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good 
Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and council members. Uh, I was on, uh, allowed five minutes to speak for a group of citizens in the neighborhood who would like to um, den request that you deny the appeal. State your name on behalf of the others, please. My name is Susan Monheit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council members. Newsom, Brown, Watkins, Golder, Kalatari, Johnson, and Bruner. I know some of you. Um, okay. Your job is to balance competing and conflicting uh, uses. And you're trying to achieve this for everybody. And that's not an easy task, and I don't uh, relish. I would not relish having to do this myself. We have built our cities around the automobile. It is practically making our cities unlivable. The city council has um, chosen many times to begin to uh, implement policies that are for less cars. You're allowing, as the state does, developments with less cars. It's a reality we might not like. There is not room for all of us and all our cars. Laurel Street Corridor, starting at the top of the hill at California, is, I want to say, a death trap. There have been people killed in crosswalks um, in the stretch at the bottom of the hill. I understand there was a car that flipped over last week, and everybody went to the hospital. The, the speed is too fast. I represent a neighborhood group. We've gone out there with a radar gun and measured the speed of the traffic both up and down Laurel Street Hill. And the maximum speed is what's important, not the 85th percentile, because it is the maximum speed that has the maximum ability to injure and kill. And that was clocked at 38 miles per hour in both directions. You got it going up and you freewheel it coming down. So. I really support the Department of Public Works embracing Vision Zero, its Vision Zero fatalities. And our group has worked to take what the city is doing. They feel constraints. We don't feel constraints um, to implement a full Vision Zero plan. And we have also developed um, designs which if fully implemented, if only by painting all of the elements on the tarmac and on the cement, would reduce speeds and create a safer corridor. I've only got five minutes here, the other lady had 20. Um, okay, you need continuous paint on the bikeway in order to signal the automobile that they are not the only and entitled vehicle using the roadways. It's a, it's a, is it a question of entitlement or privilege or ability? The people on bicycles and crossing the streets are not armored as the cars are. They need protection. The elements of a Vision Zero plan, and this is was drawn up by a vision, certified Vision Zero international designer, is that the elements and the intersections build one upon the other in a synergistic fashion that make the safety achieved by implementing all of the elements at the multiple locations along the corridor, it, it, it makes it bigger than the whole, bigger than any individual piece, right? The sum is greater than the sum of the whole. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. Um, we need to slow traffic. You can do it by your design. Um, I would like to see, we would like to see Vision Zero not look like a permanent construction zone. There are elements like elevated uh, by, uh, curbs instead of posts in the, uh, that line the bikeway that can achieve the same safety objectives. There will. Okay, we're going to expand, we're going to build a mega, mega development downtown expansion plan. There's going to be 1,600 to 1,800 new units, minimum 3,600 people, potentially 3,600 cars. 
entering the Laurel Street corridor, the main arterial to that new huge downtown city multiple times a day. You're going to have traffic increase this safety plan will protect everybody. It's to protect the most vulnerable, the pedestrians, the bicycles, and the automobiles. And you cannot make the privilege to park a four cars on Laurel Street at the expense of the life of the other people trying to use the corridor. You want them out of their cars. I know I've run over time. Um, if you fix the Laurel Street problem, you are supporting your downtown expansion plan, which is going in. I'm sorry to be emphatic. Um, so much I could say. Thank you for your time and you consideration. Please look out for all of us out there. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is the first city council meeting I've ever been to, um, and the first one I've come to that. So this is well, pretty exciting. We're glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Um, so I'm 19. Um, I'm a young student at Cabrillo, um, and I've used Laurel Street before. Uh, I'm here to ask you kindly to deny the appeal to item 15. The city of Santa Cruz adopted a Vision Zero policy to eliminate all traffic fatalities and serious inju injuries on city streets by 2030. As all of you are aware, we need to rethink how we approach street and road design in Santa Cruz to achieve these results. <clears throat> that is exactly what the Laurel Street Restriping Plan project does, and adding car parking back makes absolutely no sense for a street that is already one of the highest in death and injury rates, making it one of the least safe streets in the city. Car parking for these few tenants is already being made available on residential streets of Myrtle and Blackburn. Adding back these few car space to Laurel Street, a convenience only uh, for these residents and nobody else, will create new contact points, such as being doored or run over when exiting their parking space. I myself have been doored twice, and as my mother, um, one of which was nearly fatal, as I fell into the street into oncoming traffic, my head nearly squished by a two-ton vehicle because someone opened their door while I was riding my bike. Um, this was not on the hill, mind you, it was next to Myrtle Street. I do not want the same to happen to other mothers, fathers, young and older children who use Laurel Street every day to access upper bike parking for Santa Cruz High School. The same goes for the future, for the future young families or any age individuals who will move into the new developments on Front Street and Pacific Street, who will certainly use Laurel Street, such as existing bicyclists who use cargo bikes or bikes with children bucket seating. This is not counting those who already use the street to get into downtown. <phone rings> Additionally, concerns of crime. I was not expecting the lieutenant to be here, so my comments on that are not worth being brought up because he already overrules me um, and made great points. But on that point, where Laurel Street is not crime-free is of cars and the frequent deaths and injuries they bring upon, bring upon residents. To make our Vision Zero policy a reality, oh, we need to move forward seconds. on Cut projects presented seconds. to us that prioritize pedestrian and bike safety rather than housing empty vehicles. Thank you. Hey, before you leave, hey, seriously, thank you for coming to council. I Certainly when I was your age, and last thing on my mind was going to a city council meeting. So thank you for doing that. And uh, I encourage you to stay engaged and stay involved, irrespective of what the outcome is here today. Thank you very much for, for being here. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Yeah, it's awesome seeing people, uh, young people getting, jumping right in. I wish I had as well um, at that age. Um, one thing is I haven't driven a car since for 12 years and um, learned many ways to get around and find very amazing experiences in Santa Cruz and anywhere um, without a car. Uh, but cars are convenient. I uh, I lost my license after two DUIs and flipping my car going 110 miles an hour on Highway 1, uh, flipping it six times, with, didn't have a scratch. Um, could have killed somebody. Um, I think I might start driving now, though. I, I'm just never going to drink and drive. Nobody should. Um, cars are reality. Um, I love cars. I've got a 65 Jaguar um, sitting, growing mold right now. Um, but... Uh, um, the reality, we've got to figure out a way to 
decrease their impact, negative impact, but uh, you know, learn your own program without uh, without getting a DUI or something like that. But um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm the elderly mother what my son mentioned. I'll would, would you be kind enough for our record, would you be kind enough to state your name? Um, oh, sorry. My name is Keiko Taniguchi. Thank I live so in Felton. I came here to attend to this important meeting. Um, first of all, I don't think removing the parking from the Laurel Street will decrease the amount of accident. It's nothing to do with it. You should have limit for the speeding and the limit for the bike list. Bi bicycle is very dangerous vehicle. You don't think so. You don't think bike list is very innocent, but it's not. It's very dangerous. Many bike lists kill many people many times. That's all I want to say. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming down from Felton to share that with us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Pauline Seals. I'm appearing today unexpectedly as an elderly cyclist who also drives, and also, of course, a climate activist. We have to move to make it safer for people to be without cars. I strongly encourage traffic calming, protected bike lanes, and I don't know the specifics on this exact issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seals. Good afternoon. I haven't signed in yet. Uh, my name is Michelle Taniguchi. I'm a 14-year resident on Laurel Street and a daily pedestrian on Laurel Street. If parking is removed, my child will not be able to get pick safely picked up by carpools in front of our home, nor will his friends be able to get safely picked up and dropped off at our home. My elderly disabled mother and my elderly mother-in-law will not be able to park close to our home. Our family and friends will have to circle the neighborhood to look for parking. Friends and family who are disabled will be unable to visit our home due to the parking, lack of parking. As noted in the city's traffic studies, the major traffic issues on Laurel are at the intersections of Felix, California, and Walti. The street parking down the street has zero impact on those intersections and the crashes happening there. Removing parking also creates safety issues for those parking at a distance from their homes, particularly women at night. This issue was brought to the attention of the Transportation Commission by many women, only to be totally dismissed by all but one commissioner. This safety issue is not unfounded. Just a couple of days ago, my neighbor had a trespasser in her yard attempting to enter her home. I had someone attempt to break and enter my home just two weeks ago. We have other dangerous situations happening to women in our neighborhood. Removing parking blocks away will not change the number of accidents caused by speeding vehicles on Laurel Hill. The city needs to create a way to slow down bikes and cars on the hill and all the way down the street, be, be too, sorry. <laughs> Lost, particularly coming down the hill from California and Walti, and by putting in blinking lights and or stop signs and crosswalks at Myrtle, Felix, and Blackburn, please do not misdirect our city funds by needlessly removing our parking on Laurel. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Good afternoon. Hi, um, Christine Hawley. I've lived in Santa Cruz since 1966, and I mostly ride a bike. And I don't really, I wasn't expecting to talk, but in terms of safety, it's totally complicated. I don't envy you trying to figure it out. But just one thought I had listening was on King Street, they've made bicycles and cars share the lane. It's really slowed everyone down and made it much safer for everybody, the, the passengers, the drivers, the bicyclists, and the pedestrians. 
my thought, since when I go down that hill, I pick up speed probably close to 20 miles an hour. Um, if you just painted those share the road signs, you might not have to do the more expensive stuff. And it sounds like most of the accidents happen by that hill, not further down. So that's just a thought of a way to slow down the traffic without a lot of expense. The one other thought I have for long-term safety, and I've thought about this for years and never come down or written a letter, which is kind of lame, but oh well. The whole car door opening in the bike lane is so scary when you're on a bike. And when I went to the Netherlands, they had the cars next to the street and the bike lane protected by the parked cars and the sidewalk. And I would just like to ask that maybe we start considering doing that. Move the bike lane so it's pedestrian bikes, parked cars, moving cars. It would save a lot of lives in terms of bicyclists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'd like to suggest that as a compromise, let's start by implementing Please. all the safety measures. Hang on just one second for me. I, I want to make sure that we're using, you're the appellant, correct? I am. Okay. So I want to make sure that I'm, from a protocol point of view, are there others who are going to speak? We're going to take the folks who are online. Then you'll have your opportunity to come back up. Oh, you've already spoken. I see. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But thank you. Thank you for being understanding. Ms. Bush, we have several folks online. Is that correct? Let's go with the first one. Good afternoon. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I don't mean to disrespect this issue in any way. Um, I support safety for all citizens, uh, housed and unhoused. I just wish that our public works leaders felt the same way. I would like to see public works staff spend the same amount of energy they have here preventing the deaths of our unhoused neighbors as well. I was quite disturbed to see that city staff quietly tried to repaint parking spaces uh, in Delaware Avenue, Schaefer Road, Natural Bridges Drive um, with no public comment, no democratic process, and did not really do any of their magic math to figure out if this was going to be life-threatening to them. Um, and so where is the transparency? Where is the care? Where is the, like, interest in reduced parking uh, with the repainting, restriping of, like, hundreds of, like, parking spaces in that area? But we're focused so much on this one strip of road, which I understand this is an issue for people, right? This is an issue of safety, and I want to support... The folks who want to uh, make the changes necessary because I think not making the changes is not great. Um, but it's just, you can see the discrepancy here, right? You can see the discrepancy um, of what who we care about and who we don't care about. So let me just say one last thing. Uh, Council Member Brown, cops are not labor. Cops break strikes. Cops are the enemy of labor. Police unions are not labor unions. Thank you. Another person online, please. Good afternoon. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Ron Goodman. I am your current Transportation and Public Works Commission Chairperson. I apologize that I wasn't able to be there in person today. Um, this project had a good discussion at the last commission meeting and many good suggestions were made. In my opinion, the commissioners and staff carefully considered all of the speakers' comments. Staff did, I think, a really impressive job updating the project with respect to those comments, including reducing the impact from 19 to four spaces. To me, the process worked really well and it feels really good. Um, it's not always the case and I think this was an impressive example of process working. Um, if we want dense housing downtown, we need to start encouraging alternatives. 
yes, not everybody can ride, but if people don't feel comfortable riding, it's not reasonable to expect anyone but the most intrepid to do so. A big part of increasing cycling in our city is making facilities that feel safer and protected bike lanes are a critical example of that. These types of facilities are especially important on key downtown corridors like Laurel. At the commission, one speaker stated that their household had six cars. It's really not practical for each resident downtown to be able to own and park a car, especially in our denser housing future. So I understand that it's challenging and does create problems. There's no perfect answer here, but this is an important project that begins to address our need to promote alternatives. I hope you'll deny the appeal to this thoughtful Vision Zero project from your Public Works Department. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Bush, our next person online. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi there. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Bodhi Shargell. I'm a young person, often a cyclist, um, and I am a community member. I live just a couple blocks away from the area that is being discussed. Um, I go to UCSC and I ride my bike up there almost every day. Taking Laurel Street is about equally as fast as taking um, Bay Street. And I choose to take Bay every time because it's simply a safer place to be on a bike. Um, I don't think I need to explain to the council why bike lanes are beneficial on issues of you know public safety, uh, mental health, um, climate, uh, equity, just on and on. Um, we know that this is um, a, a goal of the city that goes along with our um, climate action plan and the goals that we've set out for the year 2030. And there's going to be a lot of smaller decisions like this that come up um, that are going to be where the real decision making happens that determines whether or not we meet these goals. It's not going to be one vote that's held in 2028 to determine whether or not we we fix climate change. It's going to be these kinds of things that happen um, in, in unexpected places. Um, I was really interested to hear the uh, language of intersectionality and equity that was brought up by um, the appellant. And I think that it misses the point that transit equity is an hugely intersectional issue. You know, we have to make it possible for people to get around without uh, cars because the, the people who aren't able to own cars are disproportionately poor, people of color, all of that good stuff. So um, I think that uh, the original Transportation and Public Works Commission restriping plan is in line with um, goals of improved equity and for reasons um, like those and many, many more, I encourage the council to deny the appeal and support the original Transportation and Public Works Commission plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shargell. Ms. Bush, we have yet another person online, correct? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to try once more. Good afternoon. Let's go to the next one. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, Ryan Meckel, current Vice Chair of the Transportation and Public Works Commission. I'm calling in in support of the staff recommendation and in support of our original decision to deny this appeal. Uh, I think the other commenters have put it much better than I could have at this point, but I just wanted to reiterate some of what they said. Uh, first off, from a policy perspective, Council both present and past have set goals in the general plan and our climate action plan and a vision zero plan and among other plans. These are really great goals, but they were only goals. And now it's time to implement these goals. And when we go into the implementation phase, we have tough decisions. This is one of them. But if we do want to achieve the goals that we set out in years past and continue to strive for going forward, we must make these tough decisions, even if they're challenging in the moment to make a better future for our city and its residents. Speaking from a personal perspective, I am somebody who does not own a car and I commute solely by bike to work up at UC Santa Cruz. Even when it is more convenient for me, I generally avoid Laurel Street. It is, in its current state, it feels unsafe, even with the striping that is there, but I believe this plan would make it feel much safer for myself and others who 
either currently ride a bike or are hesitant to ride a bike due to safety concerns. Um, if we want to cut down on traffic deaths and traffic violence in the city, removing four parking spaces seems like a very, very good compromise to me. I'm sure we'll have more difficult decisions in the future, but this seems like a non-brainer to me. Staff has gone above and beyond addressing the concerns of the appellant and other citizens, and I think you should go forth and deny this appeal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, our next person online. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, hello. Um, my name is Nairi, I'm a resident in the west side, and I frequent um, Laurel Street as a way to commute. Um, I do sometimes commute via car there, but I'm also a frequent um, pedestrian and bike rider on that road as well, and I support having um, the bike lanes on Laurel Street and denying this appeal. Um, I think it's crucial that we take bold steps to create a robust, protected bike network to make Vision Zero a reality in our city. We all know that that cannot wait. We can't push climate change needs further. Um, my question is why should we be prioritizing people's desire to be able to park their private vehicle on a public road over public safety and climate health, just so they can be right in front of their doorstep? Our public roads need to be prioritized for everyone, especially those who are vulnerable to traffic fatalities. That's people biking, walking, rolling, anything along this corridor. Unfortunately, the reality is that we cannot meet everyone's need for door-to-door -door parking while achieving Vision Zero. The shift away from car reliance in our city and worldwide is, is going to be an uncomfortable one. And these little steps like these are going to get us to them, but it's a vital um, step that we need to take for the health of our communities um, and our climate. So, yeah, I appreciate you having me. Thank you very much. And we have yes, hello. next. Good uh, this afternoon. is uh, Garrett Phillip, and I'll be brief. Uh, I'd like you to add my name of support to the Appalachian's protest as far as parking goes. Ask yourself, are the parking spaces themselves actually what is unsafe? I would add riding a bike is inherently less safe and actually quite dangerous compared to car travel at any speed. I don't believe for a second bikes don't wildly speed down that hill. I see all the time unsafe bike riders taking wild chances in general, including routinely running stop signs. But I get it that bike lanes are somewhat blind spots for cars turning right, and bike riders need to understand this problem, approaching intersections somehow, and solutions to that that make sense are needed. I see a lot of bikes that flaunt their right away, I think on some perceived kind of protest principle at their own considerable risk. Maybe that is part of this problem, even if cars are held at technical fault for accidents. I can plainly hear the bike Nazis that don't care for other forms of freedom of travel, and this added discouraging that of uh, single-use car travel, it's pretty Nazi also, as far as I'm concerned. Those anti-car types and also those citing climate change on this one need to sit down and get a grip on the real issue, which is safety. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You probably need, there we go. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Yes, my name is Kersha Durham. I've lived 300 feet from Laurel Street for the last 20 years. I am a bike commuter and pedestrian, so I know the street very well. And I have actually, even though I teach bicycle safety, I have been hit and knocked unconscious on my bike by speeding traffic on Laurel. And so I'm encouraging you to deny this appeal. Yes, I'm sorry it's painful for a very few people. My partner and I walked the street after 10 p.m. We met in the pouring rain for an hour with Matt Starkey. Thank you, Matt, for enduring the neighborhood group. We walked the street and we found that there were about there's a house there, by the way, that has two houses that probably has 10 cars, 10 students. So they would have to walk 30 seconds around the block. Luckily, they're fully physically abled. And there was every night there was at least 10 spaces. I don't really think you need the parallel parking. I think that would be a waste of time and energy. 
because around the corner on North Laurel and North Myrtle and South Myrtle, there is plenty of parking. Now, Michelle Taniguchi, I know there's two spaces in front of her house, but when her disabled family members come, she does have two very wide, uh, she has a wide driveway and two cars. So I suggest she do what I do when my 94 year old father visits, is he gets to pull into my driveway and have the one parking spot. So my, I support this. I know people are very addicted to their cars and it's going to be hard to change, but thank you. And thanks for um, thinking about making our city a safer city and safer so that I was on the transportation commission for years and people are always wanting safer. They feel safer to get out of their car. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for your service on the commission. I believe that uh, Mr. Kelly is next. Is that correct? Good afternoon, Mr. Kelly. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this is Kyle Kelly, uh, also a transportation commissioner, uh, now in school board. Um, but I'll be speaking uh, in my personal capacity, um, but about safe routes to school. Uh, this is an essential connection for Santa Cruz High School, Mission Hill Middle, uh, and even Bayview. Uh, I've talked to some parents that um, currently do not have their kids walk from the north end of Laurel over to school on their own because they're worried about Laurel. And, and the safer we make this route, uh, the more parents like those will be able to, to walk and bike to school and feel more safe doing so. Um, and then I'll actually take cars off the road. So I really, I just wanna see uh, more safe routes to school and that we continue on with the, with the current plan that we have for, for safe routes to school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you for your service in so many ways in the community. I believe Ms. Kiroga is next and I am very sorry for if I mispronounce your name, which is likely. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. It's Kiroga, Lola Kiroga. Um, Thank you. This is also my first meeting. Um, I'm a resident in the King Street area and I'm a UCSC student that commutes by bike and I live my life car free. I'm encouraging the council to deny the appeal to the proposal. I'm one of those bike riders who rides their bike everywhere, no matter what. I want the freedom to live this lifestyle safely. And, but it is difficult when your city doesn't prioritize cyclists and have strong bike infrastructure. I avoid biking on Laurel every time I need to bike downtown because it, because it always feels unsafe, even on the flat areas because a painted bike lane isn't enough. I always take a detour through California Street to go through Walnut Street because it's a much smaller street, but it's a lot harder for me to get where I need to go when I need to constantly be taking detours to get on safer routes. If there were protected bike lanes on Laurel, myself and cyclists in Santa Cruz would feel far more encouraged to ride on Laurel and feel a lot safer. It's an insult to say there's already a bike lane on Laurel and that should be enough because having a painted bike lane isn't true safe bike infrastructure and doesn't protect cyclists from cars. It's literally just paint on the ground. We can't expect people to take detours or walk their bikes because realistically people are gonna ride on the dangerous road regardless. So why not make it safer to do so? And it's unrealistic to expect cyclists to walk their bikes because it's an inconvenience and it doesn't make our mode of transportation equal with cars like it should. We deserve equal respect and rights as car drivers have. Again, we have to go out of our way constantly when we want proper infrastructure that requires car drivers to make um, a small compromise, like what a horror when the cars are inconvenienced, but we're inconvenienced all the time. Bike commuters don't commute because of the infrastructure we have, but we often commute in spite of it. Um, thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. Two more folks online. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And um, thank you so much for all the time that you've spent on this issue today. My name is Candace Brown. I'm also on the Transportation Public Works Commission and was the one that entered the motion originally for the bike lanes with the conditions as seen in the minutes, but I also was one of two commissioners that um, accepted the appeal because I felt like there was uh, a great need uh, to do redesign on that project. I also still feel that that is the case because the whole reason for doing this in the first place is for Vision Zero, and one of the other commissioners that was a champion of Vision Zero on the commission also voted for the appeal. The whole goal is to reduce the um, accidents down to zero and it's really important to reduce the speed of both bicyclists and cars, mainly cars, um, going down that hill. 
and this design does not really uh, address that issue in many ways, which I don't have time for today. Uh, so there's still an opportunity uh, to do redesign there, and by accepting the appeal, you would encourage the staff to do that. Um, as far as removing the parking, um, if you were to do that, I still think there's a need for some type of loading in certain areas along the street. And also there's the opportunity uh, to change the daylighting because the daylighting isn't just removing parking, it's also visual barriers, which has not been looked at in some of those streets. By removing two parking spaces does not mean it's necessarily safe. And in fact, the San Francisco Municipal Transportation um, siding that was in the staff report um, was actually for only 10 feet, whereas in the plan it's 20 feet on many of the intersections. So just by changing that alone, you could add back five parking spaces. So there's still opportunity for changes. We on the Transportation Commission, including myself, who was an avid bicyclist in my youth, I went to Davis. Um, I stopped biking because of almost two near-death experiences on my bike, and I'm certainly looking forward to the opportunity um, to do it again with uh, some new bikes. So thank you very much for considering this and, and for your time. Thank you, Ms. Brandt. Thank you for your service on the commission. We have one more. Is that correct, Ms. Bush? One more? Good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Cayley, council members. My name is Phil Boutel. Uh, I'm a former Transportation Public Works Commissioner, and I was chair of commission when this came before us for the appeal. Um, I am calling in to uh, repeat what most other commissioners said. Uh, this was really an illustration of fantastic process by the city. The, the commission is there to accept the first level of appeal. The appeal was denied, but staff still responded to those concerns uh, as brought up by the appellants and by neighbors. And staff, I just think it's important to highlight that staff did an excellent job of directly responding to those concerns. Um, through their agenda report attachments, you can see the calculations, and the geometry regarding how much uh, actual removal is needed for daylighting. There was the interaction with the police department regarding safety in the neighborhood. Um, so, uh, as well as photo documentation of the existing off street parking. So I, I just want to highlight that uh, this is an exemplary uh, version of process that happened. And as such, I think you should support staff. I don't think it does need any redesign. And I, I will just uh, uh, say in regards to the last call, I guess I consider myself one of the original people advocating for this. When I first joined the commission in 2015, I brought vision zero. Uh, to city staff and uh, I've been fighting for it and I still am fighting for it. And part of Vision Zero is certainly accepting when projects like this absolutely need to go through. Um, and so for me, as uh, again, I know a couple of commissioners voted against it, it was 5-2 and uh, I really think you should deny this appeal, move forward. Let's make Co Laurel Street the transportation corridor that it nearly can be. Let's make it safer so it can handle both all the transit that it gets, all the cars and all the bikes and walkers. Thank you so much. Mr. Butel, thank you very much. Thanks for your service on that commission. Further testimony before the council on this item. One more opportunity if anyone is with us in chambers that would like to do that. Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the city council. Ms. Kalantar Johnson is recognized. I have a motion. So as the appellant, you oh, five more minutes. Excuse me, my error. That was my procedural error. Please come up. I apologize to you. You do have a rebuttal opportunity here. I believe that is five minutes. Is that correct? No problem. Thank you. I'd like to propose a compromise. Uh, I don't know why we're racing to implement all these things that are so controversial and affect so many people so drastically. Why not try implementing all the safety measures that have been proposed and suggested in addition, minus removal of the parking and installing parking bollards, and let's just see how it goes. Also, why are we not directing people to the rail trail that is designed for this just a couple blocks away? And the Neary Lagoon Wildlife Refuge Trail a couple blocks away that's designed to get people to and from school. It says on their website to circumvent the Laurel Street steep hill. I'd like to read some, a comment from the online petition. 
uh, from a resident. I live on Laurel in a house with five other women, and we have repeatedly been harassed by strangers outside on the street. People have threatened to kill us and rape us, screaming that they know that we are helpless girls, quote unquote. There have been men that have had the guts to even sleep in our backyard and come through our gate and up on our porch to take things like furniture and bikes. Our cars have been broken into and we have had multiple attempted break-ins. We understand the police and city can only do so much, but it would be dangerous for us to walk from the side streets to our front door, especially at night. We are all college students and often get home late from school and work. Please take into consideration the people affected if this plan goes through. Here's something that I wrote to Lieutenant Morey, and he didn't respond, though I asked for him to respond. As I'm sure you're aware, Santa Cruz has about a D-plus crime rating. It is safer than only 3% of US cities, and is number 17 on the list of top cities in California with the highest number of thefts per 100,000 residents. And the mean numbers of robberies, assaults, burglaries, thefts, and auto thefts, thefts is not just in quote bigger, but quote much bigger than the state average. Further, I'm sure you are well aware, rape and other sexual assaults are among the most underreported crimes. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, only 30.7% of women who are raped report the crime. So many, if not most women, do not feel comfortable walking alone in most neighborhoods after dark when streets are mostly abandoned, whether lighted or not. Therefore, when the concerns of those 41 women who expressed their valid concerns at the hearing, and surely there are many more that were not represented at the hearing, are dismissed, and the plan is pushed through anyway, who will be held accountable? Uh, regarding the references to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions that are going to be reduced by taking out the parking are basically irrelevant in this case. If the Transportation and Public Works Commission wants to reduce greenhouse emissions, as I advocate, they need to develop public transportation so people won't need cars. If you just do it by taking out parking, you can't park your car anywhere, that's just a public nuisance. My house is on Laurel Street, mid-block. There is 48 feet of red curb between my house and Myrtle Street. And on Myrtle Street, the intersection has pop-outs that are red for 48 feet. So my house is in the middle of the block. There's 48 feet, only need 20 for sight lines, but 48 feet already of red curb. And they're proposing to paint the entire curb red. Oh, by the way, on the other side is the Salvation Army, which is already completely red curb, I don't know why, because that would be really great parking, but in the middle of the block. So all the reasoning and explanation about sight lines and 20 feet from the intersection and a new thing in your packet about zero, I don't even know what it was called, does not apply in this case and perhaps some other cases. Uh, finally, I will note that uh, when I called the transportation manager to ask him if there are any other residential streets in Santa Cruz that have parking bollards and red curbs lining the streets, he couldn't think of any. But then he said, oh, but on Bay Street, uh, it's red on one side. So I drove up there because I'm a UCSC graduate. I don't remember whether people live there or not. So I went up there. There are no red curbs. There are signs that limit parking weekdays in during the day and you can park at night when not many people are riding bikes and on weekends. So that's a suggestion too. I don't advocate it, but it's better than painting the entire curbs red from now on for everyone that needs to live on Laurel Street. And finally, we're not talking as many people have referenced about four cars versus 2.5 lives. The cars are driven by drivers. And I am trying to explain that all 12 spaces on Laurel Street are being removed. We're talking about 12 people every day that can't park there. And there are spaces that are supposed to accommodate them around the corner that's not safe to walk from at night. It's just not. So 
It's not four cars versus 2.5 people a year. It's 12 people every single solitary day that are going to be exposed to Check. an unsafe situation if you take out their parking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. With that, the matter is back before the council, and I will recognize Council Member Kalantari Johnson for a motion. Great, and I um, sent um, the language to Bonnie, and I'll read it. Please do. Let's. Uh, we have that up on the screen. Good. Motion to adopt resolution number NS-30. 119, denying the appeal and upholding the Transportation and Public Works Commission's approval of the design and installation of the proposed striping on Laurel Street between Mission Street and Chestnut Street, including mitigation conditions set forth by the Commission, and to the extent possible, ensure the Commission's mitigation conditions are implemented prior to or simultaneous to striping and removing of parking. Part two, direct staff to continue to pursue grant funding to increase lighting on Laurel Street. And part three, direct staff to pursue additional diagonal parking on Myrtle Street with neighbors. There is a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. There's a second by Mr. Newsom. Ms. Kalantari Johnson, you may open on your motion. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank the appellant. I want to thank all of the neighbors and all of the community members who came out and spoke. Uh, this does not have to be a cyclist versus car drivers neighbors conversation. It does not have to be an us versus them. It's all of our community. And as we evolve as a community, we'll have to make incremental changes. If we look at pictures of Santa Cruz 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 20 years ago, it didn't look like it did today. Um, and these changes can be really difficult. I'm in the green bar area that you all showed. I like riding my bike, but I'm not comfortable riding my bike. So I am car reliant. My kids, 13 and 15, are in the confident area. Well, they think they're confident. I'm not so confident that they should be riding some of the corridors. I'm not, and they ride Laurel Hill every day to go to Santa Cruz High. Um, so I, I understand the challenges that are before us, and, and I do think that what has been brought before us that was altered uh, based on the discussion at TPWC uh, is that incremental change to help us get there, to help me get there and help other community members get there. Uh, I appreciate specifically that we moved from 19 spaces removed the four spaces removed, and I understand that it is not just four spaces, it's other individuals that are reliant on those parking on Laurel. Um, we reduce the length of daylighting. There's a number of other, other conditions, so I know that's part of what you're recommending, but I wanted to explicitly name it in my motion. Um, I do want to briefly speak to the challenges of safety for women. I think this is a really important issue, and I appreciate that it's being brought up. Um, and as Mayor Keeley said earlier, it's a broader issue that we really need to focus on as a city. Um, I'm going to directly speak to the commissioners on the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, and I know that some of my colleagues sit on the Public Safety Task Force, but I want to take this specific issue about safety of women on Laurel Street to those commissioners to see if there are other ways that we can address this, because um, that's something that I, I, is important to me and I believe is important to the rest of the council. So I'll leave my comments there and, and allow my colleagues to uh, weigh in here. Further on this motion, Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Um, I, a lot of reading, a lot of talking um, and listening and um, this was an interesting um, an interesting project and there was a lot of components to it and listening um, to everyone who spoke today and everyone having their valid reality and experiences and while um, you know safety was brought up as um, a major concern I think this this project addresses all of the the safety that we have to consider um, on our roads, and um, I appreciate the mitigation um, results from the, the commission and staff um, directly influenced by the input from the community. Um, and so thank you for calling that out 
explicitly, I do support the motion. Um, I was going to recommend that um, our public safety committee um, explore further concerns of safety um, <clears throat> for this neighborhood. I know that a white male police officer may feel safe, but someone else may not feel safe. Um, the data that is was presented is um, someone's experience um, and you know, I'm happy I have gone out after getting this agenda report and gone to these streets and this area and I went at night, I got out and walked and um, drove Myrtle Street to see where the diagonal parking would be and um, you know, I'm also someone who's comfortable walking uh, alone at night downtown as a woman. And so I understand that doesn't make it right or safe um, to someone else who um, does not feel safe. So there's a larger issue here. That was the primary concern that I was concerned about with this. But I, I don't think it's in place of this very um, great project. And so I think it's both and. And I'm happy to um, suggest that we explore um, other ways we can um, continue to have safety be a priority in this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I recognize Council Member Newsom. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, you know, I, I want to thank um, everyone who came and, and uh, spoke today and, and shared um, their thoughts on this agenda item. Um, I agree with uh, uh, the notion or what Council Member um, Colleague Harry Johnson said about how this is incremental change, but I think it's positive incremental change within our community. Um, I do uh, take seriously, as I'm sure um, everyone on this council does, of the safety of uh, those who live within their district and within the city. Uh, and I, I support um, efforts to go to the Public Safety Commission and to the uh, Commission on the Prevention of Violence Against Women to uh, look for any possible solutions to make the neighborhood safer. Thank you, sir. Ms. Golder. Thank you. I appreciate all the comments of my colleagues. Thank you to um, staff and to the appellant and to everyone that came to speak to this issue. I think in terms of this decision, I'm really taking into account um, the kids that uh, bike or walk to our neighborhood schools, Bayview, Mission Hill, Santa Cruz High, from that um, neighborhood down there. And from what I keep looking, I keep looking on Google Earth, and a lot of that curb already is red. And um, in addition, there's parking signs up that don't allow parking from midnight to 6 a.m., um, from what I can see, and two-hour parking restrictions in other parts of that those blocks. And I think in this case, um, no, you're right, I would not want no parking in front of my house, it would be really inconvenient. But I think in this case, I, I'd, I, you know, even if it was my street, I would have to outweigh the greater good for the community and especially um, the, the, the number of kids that we, you know, partner with Ecology Action, we have a whole um, Safe Routes to School program that we're encouraging to try and raise the next generation not to be as lazy as me and um, to get out on their bikes. I do like to walk, but um, biking's not my favorite. And um, and so, you know, to move to those goals, I think in this case, I'm gonna support the staff's, staff's um, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Council Member Watkins is recognized. Yeah, hi, I'll just be really brief. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanna thank our staff. I wanna thank all those who came and spoke. I know these, one of uh, the community members who spoke mentioned these, these decisions are always tough because you are trying to balance all kinds of components and I appreciate the motion before us. I think um, there has been work that's been put in to get us to this place and um, the balance of the broader community with those of the neighbors and trying to do our best to really move forward in a, in a direction that's gonna be good for everybody, I think is what um, ultimately we're, we're seeking to achieve. In regards to the public safety, as the chair of the public safety task force, I just want to commit that I'm happy to have that agendized and I can work with staff to do that. And I do think though, um, it is a broader issue. It's a community and a neighborhood issue, but it's it's a city issue. And I think as, uh, as, a, as a task force or as a, a committee dedicated to this purpose, that's a, a really applicable and important component for us to discuss. So just wanted to commit to that as part of the motion and a next step. Thank you. 
Thank you. Ms. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Uh, thank you. I'll just quickly say I uh, want to I want to thank uh, the Public Works, the, the city staff who have worked on this uh, first and foremost because you really have um, incorporated uh, a lot of the recommendations that that came out and the and addressed the concerns. Not all of them can be addressed through this project, um, and those concerns extend well beyond whether or not we do this project or we don't. So um, and I really appreciate the. Um, the concern uh, and the interest in exploring this through our commissions and and hopefully uh, through the city council at some point, um, you know, we can uh, be more pro we can be proactive about how to how to address those challenges um, and real really I mean concerns challenges just doesn't seem like an appropriate word when people are, are afraid you know and they feel traumatized. I want to take that very seriously. Um, and I also want to add that I, we're hearing a lot about safety on the the. Laurel Street Hill. I lived at the bottom of it. I've ridden on it. I've, I mean, I'm very familiar with it, as many of you are. Um, so I have my own personal feelings about the, you know, wanting that to feel safer for people who are navigating uh, those streets. Um, but I did want to ask because the point has been made, and we all know that um, simply adding the, the bike lanes is not going to address the, um, the hazards of, of high speeds on the road. And so I just would I'd be I'm, I'm concerned about that, and I'd like to continue to talk about that. Um, um, and so I, I don't have really a question here, but I just want to make sure that that um, stays in the mix. And, and I know that you're aware of it, and, and I think it is really important that we acknowledge it here as well. So thank you. Okay. Everybody good? Everybody good? Okay. Thank you. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, one, I, as I said earlier, I. I think the appellant did a very good job of raising a set of legitimate concerns. Uh, I think that the council member Kalantari Johnson's amendments to the recommendation are helpful in that regard. I wonder if I might offer something as an additional direction. See if this works for you. Uh, add additional direction that the city manager return at budget hearings with a plan for installing safety devices that prohibit remaining on traffic islands or medians at the city's 10 most busy intersections. Does not, let me see if that's okay with you. If I, okay with the second? Okay. So I, if I might engage the city manager for just a moment on this. Uh, the thought here is that much of what I heard this afternoon can be the same critiques and criticism of many of our other uh, intersections in the city. Uh, I think that it's, at least from my perspective, uh, having folks, the only reason you should be on a median at an intersection is because you didn't walk fast enough <laughs> when the lights said green. <laughs> and so if you're still there, I understand that. But people essentially setting up shop on a city median is, I think, dangerous for that person, for the general public, for other folks who are trying to get through the intersection, for motorists and everybody else. So if you would be, if that motion makes sense, I would like to include it in the direction. And I see that the public works director is inching his way to the microphone. <laughs> uh, Mayor, Mayor Keeley, if I may, before uh, Nathan weighs in, um, our city attorney was uh, whispering some concerns in my ear. I'd like to give him an opportunity to speak to it first. I think that the direction is fine, um, but we will need to do some legal analysis about potential um, First Amendment issues associated with, uh, with what is essentially tantamount to a, an, an anti-loitering. Yes, say, say it again. What is essentially tantamount to a, a, a prohibition on loitering on uh, traffic medians. Um, there's, a le there's a legal analysis that needs to accompany that, uh, that discussion. So. Well, thank you. Just I imagine to make when the it council comes back, aware we'll of that. Receive that. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon again, council members, mayor. If I may, just get some clarification with regards to safety devices on islands. 
Um, I'm, I'm as, as I heard the, uh, the friendly amendment to the motion, if we're referring to rectangular rapid flashing beacons, pedestrian activated devices that help pedestrians cross uh, um, those type of intersections, we usually put them in medians. We actually have a, a grant funded project that we're working on. We've applied for uh, grant funding to install these RRFBs actually at this location on. Uh, what are they? I'm sorry, I don't know. I, I, I lost the thread here. Sorry, I, I was referring to the traffic kind of traffic devices that you're referring to, and I wasn't sure if it was a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. I have no idea. I, I, okay. I'm not sure, but let me let me make it clear from from my perspective. It wasn't clear. I think it's very unsafe for anybody to remain in the middle of a street on a median or a traffic island, except when you are crossing the street and the light didn't give you sufficient time to get across and you can only make it to the median. That should be the only reason that you are there, that there is no other reason that makes any kind of public safety sense. That's what I'm trying to get to. Gotcha. Um, one, one other thing that we can do to help address that, actually we do on some of our medians, is we do install a river rock in our medians, some of them where it's uh, basically you know, four to six inch boulders that help deter people from standing on those medians. Yeah, I don't think that works well. I think that we can, we all observe that that doesn't work well. So rather than negotiate it here, that's the direction, return it budget hearings with a way to do that at the 10 most, at the 10 busiest intersections yeah, in the Mayor, city, I, understanding that there are legal issues that council would like to draw to our attention. Sir. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, so with uh, with some of the feedback initially from our, our public works director and our city attorney, I, I, we understand the spirit of the request. And so what we can do is bring back some options um, at a later date as we move through budget hearings. Thank you so much. Further debate or discussion? Yes, Ms. Bruner. I'm just trying to understand how this connects with this item. This is about safety in our roadways and desires to reduce the conflict between vehicles and individuals not in vehicles. I think that's the nexus, or at least the one I'm trying to draw. Okay, I was just trying to understand the median question and what median exists here, and, and I understand your intention, but I was trying to understand the connection to this item. If, if I could weigh- my connection to the item. If I could weigh in Let here. Me Excuse me? Pardon me, Mayor, if I could Certainly. just weigh in on that point Certainly. that uh, Councilmember Bruner made. I do think that this discussion needs to be um, circumscribed because this is not an item on your agenda. What I understood the requested direction was to bring it back for council consideration, which um, is appropriate uh, under the Brown Act. Thank you. Good. Any other questions or comments? Seeing hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you for being here this afternoon. We are going to stand in recess for 15 minutes time. We will be back here at 510. We stand in recess until that time. urban development uh, with regard to a consolidation plan uh, and how we would spend such funds. We are going to have a presentation by both Jessica Mellor and Jessica DeWitt, and that will be followed by the normal course of things. Good afternoon. Welcome to Chambers. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Member. I'm Jessica DeWitt, the city's housing manager, and next to me is Jessica Meller the city housing team's principal management analyst. So every year, the 
Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, allocates community development block grant funding and home funding to designated jurisdictions. Now, the city of Santa Cruz is one of those designated jurisdictions and recently has received its notification of its annual allotment. So now Jess Meller is gonna walk us through our funding rec staff funding recommendations and the proposed budget based off of the RFP process. Yes, thank you Mayor Keeley and council members for having us here today to discuss the HUD annual action plan budget. Um, as Jessica mentioned, we do receive federal funding every year um, from the Housing and Urban Development Department. And the annual action plan is a city proposal on how to spend those awarded funds. So before you today, the council needs to make initial funding recommendations for the 2023-2024 annual action plan. We also need you to amend or approve the amendment to the 2019-2020 annual action plan to reallocate $100,000 in CDBG funds. Uh, we also would like you to direct staff to publish the 2023 NRSA plan, which will be posted for review next month uh, for public uh, review. And then we also need you to um, support us amending the citizen participation plan as well today. So jumping right in, um, here's the CDBG funding for program year 23 uh, at a glance. HUD has awarded us $568,725 for this program year. We estimate that the city will receive $50,000 in program income, and program income is just income that's earned on loans that have been funded from prior year CDBG funds. Um, there's also $100,000, which we mentioned on the prior slide, in prior year funding available to reallocate. And so prior year funding can be a combination of underestimated program income, canceled projects, and projects that have not used their entire funding award. And then those amounts are returned back to the overall CDBG pot each year. So in total, we're looking at $718,725 in CDBG funding. So HUD has a formula that sets aside 20% of that grant and program income for administration. And what this covers is the city's administration costs to administer the CDBG program. Uh, we do also have some administrative costs associated with two other city programs, the rehab program and the home security deposit program that we need to cover with these funds. So that leaves us with $583,080 to split between the public services and projects. So for our programs this year, we received three applications one from the Teen Center, which is run by our Parks and Recreation Department and provides teen-focused programming to the community. We also have an application from Second Harvest Food Bank for their food distribution program, which reduces food insecurity to our lower-income residents. And we also have an application from Nueva Vista Community Resources, which provides programming to lower-income residents at both their Beach Flats Community Center and La Familia Center. So HUD does cap funding for their public service programs at 15%, which would be about $84,000 this year. Um, but HUD does also allow um, certain organizations which are community-based development organizations or CBDOs, which operate in a neighborhood revitalization strategy area or NRSA to receive funding above that 15% cap. So the city currently has one CBDO, and that's Nueva Vista. We've marked it with a gold star on the slide so that you can easily pick it out. Um, therefore, the total amount that we can award to public service programs can exceed that 15% cap when we work with CBDOs. Um, so we're recommending that we fund all the programs at an in increased funding level when you compare it to last year. And it's worth noting that this would be a one-time increase in funding and next year's funding recommendations will have to depend on what applications we receive and how much money we receive from HUD. So, to, so we're recommending this increase in funding this year to maximize our allowed spending on public services. And so the total recommendation for pro programs is $205,000 this year. Moving on. To our project applications, we received two of them. The first from Monarch Services for renovations to the Mariposa House. 
um, this project will fund improvements that will benefit the health, safety, and sustainability of the project and its participants. Some of the improvements will include touchless hygiene and lighting systems, installation of an HVAC system, as well as other improvements to reduce water and energy consumption. The other application we received is for the Civic Auditorium ADA improvements, which will benefit users with lots of safety features. And it will be beneficial not only for public events, but also for emergency events as well. And the total requests we received this year for projects was a little over $375,000. Uh, thankfully, we have enough funding to be able to re recommend funding both of these projects fully. Um, so the total amount we're proposing for projects is $378,080. So in summary, our CDBG recommendations are to fund our community programs at $205,000, fund capital <laughs> projects at $378,080, and fund administration for city and city programs at $135,645. And that completely spends out our estimated $718,725 for CDBG. Moving on to our home funding category, um, HUD has allocated us $499,440. And we're also estimating we'll receive about $100,000 in program income and we do have $226,972 in prior year funding available for reallocation. So in total, we're looking at $826,412 for our home program this year. And just like with CDBG, HUD has a formula set aside of 10% for administration. And that, again, that covers the city's cost to administer the home program. Um, and that's $59,944 this year, or program year. Um, HUD formula also has a set aside of 15% for CHOTOs. And what a CHOTO is, is a community housing development organization. They're a private nonprofit that creates affordable housing for the community they serve. And CHOTO set asides for this program year would be $74,916. So that would leave us with $691,522 to split between programs and projects in our home budget. And this year we had two applications for our home funds. Um, one is for the security deposit program that we uh, operate in partnership with the Housing Authority of the County of Santa Cruz. And we also received a application for our affordable housing for Pacific Station North project. Um, so a little bit about these two projects, projects and programs. The security deposit program um, has been funded by alternate sources for the past two years, but we've completely exhausted those funds. So we're looking to fund it with home funding again. Um, this the security deposit assistance is primarily limited to low income households. So th those would be households at or under 60% of the area median income. And this program provides households with one month's rent as a security deposit. So that's how the main focus of that program. Um, we have been communicating with the housing authority and they've said they anticipate a 42% increase in the need for this program just for this current program year that we're in that ends it at the end of June. Um, but they also think there's going to be an increased need for assistance next program year as well. And a little bit about Metro Pacific Station North, it's a 128 unit family project with a majority two and three bedroom rentals. It will be 100% affordable. And this allocation will target filling that gap in funding needed for this project to help it go forward. So all that said, we're recommending the Home Security Deposit Program be funded at $80,000 and the Pacific Station North project at $626,524. And I just want to point out, like I put on the slide, that does include that CHOTO set aside. So if you're looking at that total number and the total number from the previous slide, that's why it looks different, because we've rolled the CHOTO set aside in there. <coughs> All right, next steps. After we get your budget recommendations today, uh, we're going to draft the 2023-24 annual action plan, make that available for public review and comment. And then we'll have a second public hearing on April 25th for the action plan and funding recommendations to be finalized by council. 
And then after another review and comment period, we will submit the action plan to HUD in May. Funding for our programs will be available as early as July 1st, and project funding will likely be available in fall or winter. Just a little bit more. Um, so this is item three on that, that list of items I need you to approve today. Um, we have prepared a two-year 2023 NRSA plan to link our NRSA time period with our five-year consolidated plan cycle. And that's so that future consolidated plans and NRSA plans will cover the same time period. That's a goal that HUD has. They like to see those two plans match up. Um, so once again, NRSA, it means Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Area. It's a mouthful. Um, and it allows jurisdictions like the city to coordinate our resources and engage in community revitalization strategies for designated low-income areas while encouraging reinvestment of human and economic capital while empowering low-income residents. And in order to achieve this, HUD does require grantees like the city to have a realistic strategy and implementation plan, and that's what that NRSA plan is. Um, we do get, get multiple incentives from HUD, uh, which encourage the development of NRSA, and the 2023 plan is gonna focus on two strategy areas. The first being CBDO, community services aspect, and that's when we talked about that 15% cap, that's, that's that perk that we're looking for to go over that 15%. And then we also have housing and economic development, uh, which has the potential to provide job opportunities and increase access to housing to help improve economic stability and household self-sufficiency. So it's an important note here that having an NRSA doesn't give us any extra funding, unfortunately, but it, it is a way for us to target our CDBG funds um, in the city. And also, the two strategies that I just mentioned, it's not anything new. We don't have to launch any new programs or projects or anything. We're just focusing on activities that are already happen, happening and making sure that we're getting credit for them with HUD. Um, so the draft NRSA plan will be posted online next month for everyone to review and to, to be able to comment. And if you have any specific comments or questions, please feel free to email me at the email on the slide. And one last part here, um, because we've had some changes to um, community or council committees, we need to update our citizen participation plan to reflect that. Um, so with the community programs committee being incorporated into the health and all policies committee, we're gonna make that change in our participation plan. We're gonna change the name of the committee and then in order to accommodate the Health and All Policies Committee regular meeting schedule, we're gonna change a couple of our action plan release schedule items. So every year, our notice of funding available for these CDBG and home funds will be released in October instead of November. Our applications are gonna be due in December instead of January, which I'm sure a lot of our grantees will be excited about. Um, and then we'll be meeting with the city council uh, committee, Health and All Policies Committee in January. Um, and a copy and red line of this plan will be available for review um, prior to the next public hearing. And again, any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to email me at the email on the slide. Thank you very much, and please let Jessica and I know if we can answer any questions for you. Well, thank you both very much. Let me ask if there are council member clarifying questions at this point. Okay, uh, this would be the uh, opportunity for public comment. Uh, we'll recognize you for up to three minutes time and uh, if we have folks who are calling in online, what I'll do is I'll start with Mr. Reese, then I'll go online, then I'll go to a person here, then we'll go online, we'll alternate back and forth. Good afternoon, Mr. Reese. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor and fellow council members, my name is Gary Reese. I'm the executive director for the Santa Cruz County Symphony, and we have been across the street for 65 years in the Civic Auditorium. Um, one of the things that I, the thing that I am here uh, tonight for is to uh, wholeheartedly support the staff recommendation for the $320,000 ADA 
improvements for the Civic. This primarily revolves around providing handrails for the Civic Auditorium. We have been calling for this for dozens of years. Um, most of our um, patrons are like me, they're old people, they can't do <laughs> stairs. Um, and every year I lose more and more subscribers because people are not in, uh, unable. We try to, we do our best to accommodate them by moving their seats to better locations, but if there comes a time when people just say they're, they're not coming back. And as much as I don't like the lost revenue, what I, what I am more fearful is when that actually there is an accident that involves um, some severe uh, injury. The, these are concrete stairs, they're wooden backs on the, on, the, on the chairs. I personally have fallen on them during rehearsals. Um, I don't intend to sue the city, but I don't know if the next person won't. And I think that none of us, I've sat through the, 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 the item preceding here where we talked a lot about safety and I think that the city needs to consider this, if nothing else, as a risk management issue because I think it's a lawsuit waiting to happen. And I know that there is great talk and we've had talks with the Santa Cruz Warriors about a new auditorium and that uh, hopefully will happen. But in the meantime, and that's several, if not five years away, this could be, provide an opportunity to continue to service our organization. We are the largest revenue producers for the Civic Auditorium, followed closely by the Cabrillo Music Festival. And if Ellen Premack had known about this, and I'm not blaming anybody because it sort of came up late, she would have been here as well. I probably, if I'd known a little bit in advance, I would have had the auditorium filled, and I will intend to have it filled on, on April 25th. But um, so my, that's my pitch. Please approve the staff recommendation. And this council may have heard many people come up to here and talk about how city employees aren't any good, they don't have good service. Let me tell you that your civic staff is one of the, the, the best staffs that I have ever worked with. They are accommodating, they do everything they can to provide revenue for the city, for us, and any organization that goes in to perform at the Civic. So thank you for having wonderful people at the Civic. Mr. Reese, thank you very much. We have someone online, let's go to them. This would be uh, Mr. Phillip, is that correct? Yes, Mr. I, Phillip, good afternoon. I found it disturbing in item 16 that the poverty rate of targeted areas is 36% and the citywide is 18%. Poverty is calculated in various ways, usually understated by including handouts as income and CPM poverty. So I'm not really sure what your figures mean, but the poverty rate for California CPM poverty is only 12% because CPM discounts the handouts. The point is poverty in Santa Cruz sounds wildly high, similar to the homeless situation. There must be factors here that import or sustain poverty at above average levels. Maybe city sanctuary status plays a role. Maybe people becoming dependent on subsidy does. Government dependence is an undesirable condition that some of this grants money should, as a priority, seek to reduce. However, I suspect a defective equity narrative exists here that assumes under average no taxpaying earners have some sort of an unearned privilege right to endless benefit instead of a generosity combined with a mutual moral duty to improve their self-reliance. Perhaps that explains the missing element here, best described as teach a person to fish, then insist that they fish. Uh, that is not represented by most of these perfunctory handouts to the same organizations without much in the way of real metric performance demands beyond stating their handout methods that would permanently improve to self-reliance lives or like tenant sanctuary could be replaced with individuals spending 15 minutes on the internet getting tenant advice. For example, an idea would be tying extra money to organizations for each graduation of an approved English uh, second language improvement class that then qualifies individuals of such achievement to paid admission to more costly other extra skill building adult ed class fees. Now back to these grants and in general, which are part of the big outside money that has its own interest. I wonder about the accounting of administrative costs as these are a fixed percentage of total amounts of outside money interest, not local, which are willing to pay for and whether that actually pays the total administrative fate, such as freight, uh, such as pensions, 
or even the actual real-time operational administrative costs. I doubt anyone here even knows. You just assign the max to yourselves. It matters either way what it really is. We hear city accountants lament systemic financial problems that will only get worse in the city, but no one ever says what those are. Got to be something. I've always wondered what the percentage of overall administrative costs of the city is for comparison. You should be concerned with the importation of poverty as well as homelessness, insofar it is not a stretch to say if poor people find it extremely extra doable to just stay poor or homeless here, they will survive that way, but their numbers will accumulate again, indicating the need for some skill building towards self-reliance demands instead of just handouts. Anyway, I'm glad you're spending money on the Civic. I'm sure many of these organizations do good work. I just don't know if all the accounting adds up to a work in poverty. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Uh huh. It is the Honorable Clam Chowder Cookoff Judge. Yes, sir. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Um, hello, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you for giving us uh, a moment to speak today. My name is Jesse Bond. I'm the Recreation Supervisor at the Civic Auditorium. As you know, the Civic was built in 1939 and just doesn't have adequate ADA accommodations. This is our number one complaint from our patrons and producers, like you heard from Gary today. We hear from many patrons that they just can't buy tickets anymore due to our steep stairs and lack of handrails. Um, the Santa Cruz Symphony issued a survey to their patrons um, based on COVID, what patrons would like to see from that. We overwhelmingly heard that people were more afraid of our stairs than COVID. <laughs> um, this will be a, a begin to affect our business and who can use the venue. Aligned with the health and all policies, we should be providing a performing arts center that is accessible to everyone to enjoy. Um, I ask you to vote in favor of the staff recommendation. Thank you for your time and thank you to my fellow Jessicas for the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Ms. Bush, uh, do we have uh, Mr. Snyder, is that correct? No? Oh yeah. We do, okay. Mr. Snyder, good afternoon. Hello. Uh, I, I actually, I, I think I'm, I'm speaking on the wrong, uh, the wrong topic, but um, I'm fully in support of them uh, improving okay. uh, access then, to the train. <laughs> that's fine. We'll, we'll get back to you on, on the item you called in about. Uh, is that all right with you, sir? Okay. Good. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon again. Um, yeah, I, this is H, this is HUD stuff as well as, I mean, CDBG that's, um, <clears throat> I had the pleasure of, of like chatting with uh, HUD's um, Inspector General staff for about 12 hours one week um, because I'd had a, a, a voucher for 15 months and just couldn't, market rates were other than what we were being funded for. Um, and <clears throat> my only point is that, um, I am highly motivated to um, help some of my friends that are ready to get housing and um, finding creative solutions. Um, uh, you know, I read 800 and some pages of the um, of the Section 8 thing. Found some because we were creating a uh, some a marketing uh, or a marketing collateral package to to show to landlords about you know this is how cool it is to rent to us. But um, but I found some loopholes that. I'm not going to mention, but um, on page 800 and such and such. My point, um, anything, I know they've had some little sitting, just chat committees, whatever, um, back when, um, I don't know, four years ago, and Martin, maybe, I can't remember who was there. Chris um, Chris Crone and, and um, Drew Glover were still around and um, sat in on things. Um, anything that needs to be done, I'm looking for a job, but I'm happy to do things for free that, that that results in some creative solution finding, um, and I'm highly motivated. And uh, I'll be up next to for the uh, for the final chat if I can stay awake. Thank you. Thank you so much. And is Peter next? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, City Council. Uh, this is Peter Bichier, Community Liaison for the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, some of you council members know me and uh, know some of my work that I do with the city, but uh, some of them I've knew. Uh, so I just want to share with you that uh, the Nueva Vista Center is uh, very crucial into our work uh, in doing outreach in uh, Beach Flat area and the Beach Flat community. 
Uh, in that center, we most of the time we host a lot of our workshops. Uh, for example, in the last month, we've had two workshops. One uh, with Tiffany Wise West on erosion and sea level rise, and that was actually five different sessions starting from the end of the year to now. Uh, and then also we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago on the San Lorenzo Parks and Rec meeting as well, just to share and have input from the community. And many times that uh, those people just don't have access to really computers. And they uh, usually at the time of the city council, they're still barely coming back to work or also busy. So they don't have much of inputs. And the community center usually is a very good place and area where we can reach out and hear a little bit the underserved uh, so they're really crucial, and I encourage you to uh, fund them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Hi, Darius Mosinin here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I guess I accidentally walked in on the last presentation. I'm here for the other ones. But uh, I noticed a deposit program, the city's deposit program administered by the housing authority was covered. And as a landlord, I'll be honest with you, and I, I, I kind of have to hold my nose when I'm taking those deposits, and I've taken a lot of them. The reason is the folks that are on Section 8, they're getting vouchers, they've had 10 years, if they're on the waiting list, 10 years to save for a deposit. They will know they have to pay. Say the average deposit is $2,500. Anybody could save the equivalent 68 cents a day towards that deposit. I would suggest maybe doing a matching program. The city matches dollar for dollar the deposit. So, A, you could then help twice as many folks to get the deposit and have them put some skin in the game. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, next person online? No more. That's all the folks online. Anyone else who's with us wish to provide comment to the council on this item? All right. The matter is back before the council and uh, let me ask if there is a motion that... Uh, I'll make a motion. Excuse me? I'll make a motion. Sir. Motion. I'll second. And your motion is moving the staff recommendation? Okay. And there's a motion and a second. Under discussion, would you like to uh, open on your motion? Uh, yes. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm very excited to see this agenda item. Uh, you know, it provides uh, funds for community programs that uh, serve uh, the uh, vulnerable um, members of our community. Uh, it also helps provide funds for an affordable housing project uh, that is needed in our community, and it uh, helps promote um, a community revitalization uh, in lower income areas of our community that desperately need it. So I, I support this recommendation, uh, this agenda, agenda item. For the debate or discussion on this item, Ms. Collintar Johnson. Just a brief comment. I want to um, thank the work of staff on this and the organizations and the city departments that are providing the services to the community. Um, and I just want to acknowledge and thank Councilmember Brown for her years of work on the Community mm -hmm. Programs Committee. Thank you. Further question or comment? Ms. Brenner. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad with that um, the possibility to assist with these programs and funding um, exists. Thank you. Uh, if I might for a moment, uh, thank you for your very fine report. I think that every element of what you have suggested is worthy and important, and I support it, comma, but one. Uh, the, uh, the idea that we would put a third of a million dollars into a facility, the Civic Auditorium, which is far past its useful life and I don't think is going to have a bright future in front of it, especially when, as opposed to if, when a new facility, multi-use facility, is going to be constructed in our downtown in the very near future. It does seem to me that it is likely, anyway, that the Parks Department, which made the application for this item, I would imagine they also have other ADA-related unmet needs, uh, such as on the municipal wharf, uh, which, in my judgment, mm -hmm. might be more worthy of our investment of a third of a million dollars 
than investing a third of a million dollars in a facility, again, that is, I think, be way beyond its useful life. And there is no plan by this city to try to, in effect, rehab this thing so that going forward, it's where we're putting all of our eggs in terms of an auditorium in the city of Santa Cruz. So my question is, if Mr. Elliott is available, Mr. Elliott, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor. So let me do in public what we did in private earlier today, and that is me ask you if there are other capital outlay parks needs in terms of ADA deficiencies, for example, on the municipal wharf uh, that would fit into this category of funding instead of the civic auditorium. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council Members. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, and um, yeah, happy to speak to that. So across the city's park system, we've got a number of deficiencies from an ADA perspective. Um, the city uh, adopted its ADA transition plan um, pretty progressively after ADA was adopted in 1990. The city adopted its first transition plan in 1993, which is pretty, pretty good. Since then, we've continued to assess ADA conditions throughout uh, our park system and as things have um, sort of fallen into disrepair or as ADA code has changed over time, we've continued to assess the needs uh, across the system. So we do have a lot of needs. Um, what I would say is that a lot of those needs are have been identified in a report. It's sort of a compliance um, and condition report that we did a few years ago. So that includes the wharf, that includes the civic auditorium, um, as well as parks. For most of our projects, we don't at this time have specifics in terms of what a project scope might be. So Mayor, to your question on the wharf in terms of a, a specific project, we know what the deficiencies are. We don't have a project identified at the wharf right now. And with some of the questions around the wharf master plan and the future of the wharf, Similar questions, do we invest in the wharf and some of these ADA improvements in the immediate term? Do we wait to do those in a more holistic, strategic way as part of the wharf master plan? So for the council, um, and just for the council's consideration, um, I would say that at the wharf in particular, as well as other parks, we don't have a fully fleshed out and specified project as it relates to ADA that would be a great replacement in this case for the civic. The Civic, this is a project from an accessibility standpoint, a liability standpoint, um, and safety. Um, as Executive Director Reese spoke to, um, this, this is something that's been out there in terms of a concept and more specifics for a number of years, but it's proven to be a difficult one to fund through the city's general fund. So we've asked for a number of years, it's been hard to fund through the city's general fund. So this opportunity through CDBG to fund not just hand railing, but some of the less glamorous things at the Civic, like our toilets and strobe lights um, for individuals who might be hearing impaired. There are a lot of improvements we need to make to reach compliance at the Civic Auditorium to make it both compliant, but safer. And just to be clear, we were not looking toward at this time a, 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 a huge investment in the Civic Auditorium, but really a very modest and we hope strategic investment. Um, and what I mean, Mayor, by that is we're not we're not looking for a twenty million dollar investment in the Civic right now, but looking for strategic investments to keep the facility safe, accessible for the public, so we continue uh, can continue to be successful over the, the next say five years or more, in a sort of a transition period, uh, looking ahead to the potential Warriors uh, facility. So, um, and I'll just mention that that the safety is important for both the public, as Executive Director Reese alluded to. Uh, but important for staff as well. And we've had some staff incidents at the Civic coming down those stairs that can be treacherous. It's been flagged in the local media as well. And so um, that's why, that's really where this comes from as, as far as a proposal uh, to address a, a funding need that we've struggled with, a safety need, a liability need, but to invest in the Civic in a strategic way, uh, really kind of looking over the next five to seven year horizon. So I hope that answers some of that question and I'm happy to answer any more questions the council may have, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. I do have a follow-up question if I could. Uh, without reference to the wharf, does your department have other 
unmet ADA capital improvement needs that might be eligible for this category of funding? I'd say we do generally, but again, they're not they're not packaged in a specific way as far as a as a project. I'm sorry, say that again. I just didn't hear you. Yeah. So yes, we have many ADA needs throughout Parks and Recreation, um, but they're not packaged in a in a sort of project specific way. In other words, we don't have them specified to the extent that they're ready to bring to uh, this CDBG discussion today for funding. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Akili? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We would like to do at this point uh, is uh, we will take a brief break. We will come back from that break. We're going to have oral communication. We're also going to have, obviously, the item that many of you are probably here on this evening and uh, the mixed use project. We will take those up in, in due course as we move along. We will see you again at, let's make this. Uh, 27 minute break. We'll be back here at 620.
This session of the Santa Cruz City Council is back in order following an early evening break. We are on item number 17. This is a item with many component parts to it, but essentially relate in total to the downtown mixed use project proposal. We will receive a staff report uh, we will then take public comment on all aspects. We will then, the matter will come back before the council for action. Uh, we have a couple of issues that are combined in here, and that is all of those items that relate to the mixed use project and the item that relates to the appeal of the Parks and Recreation Commission decision that Council Member Newsom and I have brought forward to the council uh, as essentially an appeal. Let me s welcome staff here. Good evening. Nice to see you, sir. The floor is yours. Good evening, Mayor Keely and members of the City Council. My name is Tim Mayer, Senior Planner with the City. This evening's next agenda item is review of the proposed development of the Downtown Library Affordable Housing Project located at 113 and 119 Lincoln Street. Just to ensure that my presentation is visible to members of the audience. We'll take a second and get this all organized correctly. Ms. Bush will undoubtedly make this happen. Um, so as I was mentioning, uh, the project requests approval of a number of entitlements, including a non-residential demolition authorization permit, special use permit, a design permit, a lot line adjustment, and a heritage tree removal permit. The proposal includes several actions, including combination of two adjacent lots, demolition of the existing commercial building and city surface parking lot, and construction of the downtown library affordable housing project. The project site is shown here, bordered in red. The site is an approximately 66,921 square foot, which is approximately 1.55 acre, roughly rectangular area consisting of two adjacent lots located in the city's central business district. The two parcels composing the project site are bordered by Lincoln Street to the north, Cedar Street to the west, Cathcart Street to the south, and an alley to the east. Surrounding land uses include parking lots, quasi-public uses, and commercial establishments, including businesses along Pacific Avenue to the east. Here's a view of the existing lot as seen from the corner of Cedar Street and Cathcart Street from the southwest corner of the project area. Um, the existing city surface parking lot number four appears near the middle of the site, along with existing streets and sidewalks at the site's perimeter. Here's another view of the project site from its, this time from its northwest corner at the intersection of Cedar Street and Lincoln Street. Uh, the existing total fitness building at 113 Lincoln Street, uh, one of the two addresses making up the project area is visible here in the background. As proposed, the project includes a new 273,194 square foot, eight story building encompassing several components as listed on this slide. In addition to the project components listed on the slide here, uh, right-of-way improvements will include construction of new curb and gutter and expansion of sidewalks, which will be built at 10 to 20, 12 feet wide as directed by the downtown plan. A pedestrian access to the residences will be provided on both Cathcart Street and Lincoln Street. 
Emergency vehicle access and service access will be provided via a one-way alley leading north from Cathcart to Lincoln Street and aligned with the city's, excuse me, the site's easterly property line. This slide illustrates the proposed site plan. The building envelope shown here in gray would occupy most of the subject site in order to achieve project programming goals as directed by the city council. The library, childcare, and commercial uses will be located adjacent to the Cedar Street frontage, which is on the bottom here, and the north is pointing to the kind of the upper left. Um, while the parking structure would be placed further away, and back over here, at the east side of the site, with housing units positioned above this portion of the uh, building area. Four loading and unloading parking spaces are included along Cedar Street, as shown over here, uh, split into two different groups of two each. Um, and five on-street parking spaces along Lincoln Street, over here on the left-hand side of the slide, with the relocated bus stop provided on Cedar Street, just north of its intersection with Cathcart Street, as shown here. This slide shows the building's west elevation um, near the top of the slide. You can hear me okay. Thank you. Uh, the primary pedestrian entry to the project is located approximately mid-block along Cedar Street, so near the middle, shown over here. Closer. Uh, the bottom three stories include extensive glazing to provide visibility to the building's interior, creating a sense of activity and vitality. The structure incorporates numerous offset planes formed by a variety of curved projections and recesses. And the residential component is set back significantly from the primary frontage along Cedar Street. Distinct from the library, commercial tenant space, and childcare components for ready access while providing both privacy and separation. So the residential components shown here in the background. The east elevation of the building, seen at the bottom of the slide, shows the five-story residential component placed above the parking garage featuring board form concrete base and three-tone stucco with metal trim exterior. The building's north and south elevations are shown on the slide here. Uh, the parking structure would step down to a height of less than 35 feet as required by the downtown plan and would be placed adjacent to the street access from Cathcart. The design conforms to the Cedar Street Village Corridor design criteria as included in the downtown plan which advances the informal village qualities of the Cedar Street Village Corridor, promotes the vision of the city's downtown plan and provides a visually interesting and durable structure that fulfills the directives of the city council while enhancing the aesthetic environment and integrating a multi-use facility in the city's downtown urban core. State's density bonus law allows any residential project within a half mile of a major transit stop to request exemptions from maximum density controls, which are unlimited in the case of this project due to the project's affordability levels and its location within a half mile of a major transit stop. The base density plans shown here on the upper left present a fully conforming project with two stories of underground parking and shown in the upper left corner of the slide. Uh, the applicant has requested approval of a density bonus variation, proposes both an incentive concession and a waiver um, to allow for the additional height beyond the 50 foot, um, 50 foot limitation as specified in the downtown plan. The cost of subterranean construction um, make underground parking an option not feasible for the project and therefore an incentive concession is requested for placement of parking at surface level provide actual and identifiable cost reductions. Placement of the residential component of the project above the structure parking facility to provide for the number of residential units um, included in the project requires requests for a density bonus waiver because the project would otherwise be physically precluded from construction of the number of residential units allowable under density bonus law. Without the requested incentive concession, um, the project's parking component would be prohibitively expensive, and without granting of the waiver, the proposed development would be physically precluded from development of the number of residential units allowable through consistency with state density bonus law and the city's general plan in which residential density is indirectly regulated by the law or floor area ratio. This slide shows the multi-tiered architecture of the building, including the three-story library with commercial tenant space over on the upper left here, including um, uh, as well as the commercial tenant space and child care facility, um, three-story structure parking, and five stories of residential units. 
housing component includes 124, 100% affordable units, um, including 13 studio units, 48 one-bedroom units, 32 two-bedroom units, and 31 three-bedroom units distributed over five floors. The project provides 100% of the residential units as affordable units, exclusive of the manager's unit, consistent with city regulations, which require minimally 20% of the residential units as affordable units. The building's fourth floor, including a new green roof, appears at the bottom left-hand corner of the slide. And the fifth and sixth uh, floors are shown here in the upper right, uh, with offsets and planes, fitting units of a range of sizes while providing for interesting facades. And the building's seventh and eighth floor, again, are occupied here, as shown in the lower right-hand corner by residential units. Um, one thing to note is that the design of the project has undergone significant modifications from its initial scope and original concept. Early considerations uh, for parking capacity, for example, led staff to consider designs of up to 400 parking spaces, which have been reduced to the present scale with capacity of 242. Okay, I think what we're going to do, let, let's see if we can figure out what's going on here for a second, rather than repeating. Do, we got yeah, to idea what's going on here. That particular mic, you have to talk right on the microphone, yeah. Okay, I'll try that. Is that okay. There we go. All right, Thank great. you so much. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bush. Thank you. Um, as I was mentioning, the project has further uh, undergone design modifications to include 258 parking spaces um, strategically placed throughout the site, uh, far exceeding the minimum number of bicycle parking spaces re as required by the city's municipal code. Over the past several years, uh, through public engagement, the project has evolved from a combined library and garage project to a flagship downtown destination facility incorporating library, commercial childcare, parking, and significant number of affordable housing units as well as amenities such as a green roof and outdoor rooftop patio terrace as envisioned through public outreach efforts and as directed by the city council. A heritage tree removal permit is required for removal of any trees of heritage size as established by the city's municipal code. An application for heritage tree removal permit was submitted in October of 2022, which proposed removal of all 12 trees at the project site. The tree removal permit was supported by an arborist report, which identifies nine of, these, of the existing 12 trees as heritage sized trees. All 12 trees are exotic, non-native varieties with each tree exhibiting a range of adverse health and or other conditions. In September of 2022, an addendum was submitted prepared by the same arborist which clarifies the viability for retention and relocation of existing trees. The addendum describes the low likelihood for long-term health of any relocated tree at the project site. A subsequent addendum for a second addendum included detail of the condition of the existing magnolia tree near the center of the project site, whose health had declined appreciably since the preparation of the original arborist report. The landscape plan is shown here on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, integrates 14 city street trees, exceeding the code requirement for both the size and number of replacement trees required. The building's green roof, as shown in the lower left-hand corner, would further add to foliage and carbon sequestration capacity of the project um, site as modified. Um, one item to note as well is that um, the, uh, a recommended condition of approval related to planting of replacement trees um, is uh, relevant. Ordinarily, tree replacement in a one-to-one -one ratio is required with one tree planted on site for each tree removed. In the case of the proposed project, given the community concern related to impacts of tree removal, the recommended condition of approval includes planting of nine trees, one for each heritage tree proposed to be removed, in addition to 12 new trees planted off-site in the downtown area for a total of 21 trees planted to replace the nine heritage trees removed. Uh, potential locations for off-site planting of replacement trees have already been identified. This slide shows recommended conditions of approval which have been modified since the time of preparation of the staff report for today's hearing. Um, at the March 2nd Planning Commission meeting, the Planning Commission introduced several recommended conditions of approval. Uh, the first, as shown here, uh, the first condition relates to the provision of electric vehicle charging stations. And the second relates to the provision of building features accommodating a future potential food service use within the commercial tenant space included. Uh, staff have requested minor modifications to the conditions of approval as suggested by the Planning Commission as sh uh, shown in the strikeouts and as underlined here. The 
project is subject to the review under the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. Following a thorough analysis, the project has been found eligible for a statutory uh, exemption under Public Resources Code 2108.3.3 and a categorical uh, infill exemption under Section 15332 of the CEQA guidelines. The lot line adjustment for the project has also been deemed eligible for a minor land division categorical exemption, which is Section 15305 of the CEQA. The full environmental analysis is attached to the staff report for the project and has been available on the city's website for some time. Staff have made findings to support the proposed project. Staff recommends that the City Council acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the project entitlements, including the non-residential demolition authorization permit, the use permit, design permit, lot line adjustment, and heritage tree removal permit, based upon the findings included and conditions of approval attached to the staff report with modifications as noted. Staff and the applicant are available to answer questions. Thank you very much for your time. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you very much. Let me ask first if uh, council members have uh, questions, clarifying questions on this item. No? Okay. We will, uh, we will now go to public comment on this. Uh, this is uh, your mayor. Sorry, yes, I'm um, sorry. You had um, authorized 15 minutes for um, the group that originally yes. provided the appeal. I didn't know if you wanted to include that as public comment right. or no. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, let, I want to be real clear about that point. The appeal was actually brought forward by Councilmember Newsom and myself. So that I believe correct. we are essentially the appellants. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Now, the folks on whose behalf, I will be glad to cede my time uh, to folks who asked us to do that in terms of rather than Mr. Newsom and myself providing our argument, frankly, what we were interested in is making sure that the matter of, of the trees got before the council so that we could have a robust discussion about it. So any of you who want to speak to the tree issue, why don't we go with you first, and when we've exhausted that, then we'll go to folks who wish to speak to the project more generally or about some other aspect of it. Are you here to, to comment on the tree appeal? Come on forward. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Jane Doyle. Um, I'm going to have to read this. The following is a quote from Oswan of the Abenaki Nation. Only when the last tree has died and the last river has been poisoned and the last fish has been caught will we realize we cannot eat money. I'm here to request your compassion for some so-called last trees that are scheduled to die by your vote, if not by your hand. There are five, as I understand it, that the Arborist Company has declared healthy. Any architect worth her or his salt could easily design around them. It's done all the time. If you will permit these trees to stay, they will continue to take carbon from the atmosphere. They will soften the hard-edged look of the cement blocks scheduled for the lot, and they will give some shade on a hot day, in addition to any trees that new ones that are planted. I would like to assume that Mayor Keeley will support keeping the tree, the healthy trees, based on his support for Arbor Day, found under Mayor Proclamations on this meeting agenda. It reads in part urging students and citizens to plant trees to offset climate change and enhance our local environment and natural world for our present and future generations. So thank you, Mayor Keeley, for that. In closing, I just want to repeat the wise reminder from the Abenaki elder. Only when the last tree has died and the last river has been poisoned and the last fish has been caught, will we realize that we cannot eat money? 
Well timed. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bush, let me see. Uh, okay. So let me advise you what we're going to do is we have several folks joining us online, so I will simply alternate someone who's with us in chambers, someone online, someone in chambers, someone online. So now we will go uh, to, I believe, Ms. Marcus, would that be correct? Ms. Marcus, good, after, uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley and council members. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Great. So yes, my name is Laura Marcus and I am the CEO of Deanthas Community Dental Care. Over my almost 20 year tenure at Deanthas, we have partnered with the city in many ways, from providing dental care to thousands of city residents at our various clinics, to establishing a clinic for people experiencing homelessness at Housing Matters with CDBG funds, to our most recent plans of establishing a new clinic downtown on Front Street at Pacific Station South in partnership with Santa Cruz Community Health, which we expect to open in a few years. The new clinic will help us better serve up to 3,000 of the 18,000 Medi-Cal enrollees located in the city of Santa Cruz who need access to high quality dental care. Although some of our patients use public transportation, many, as well as the majority of our staff, need a place to park if this new clinic is going to be accessible. The downtown library project, including the parking garage, is something that our plans have been dependent on. Not only will it provide accessible parking a few blocks away, but it will also offer much needed and 100% affordable housing, which may directly support our patients. And it offers an incredible, beautiful, and modern library and spaces for other commercial tenants. With Deantha's recent multi-use project on Capitola Road with Santa Cruz Community Health and Midpen Housing, we have shown success in putting affordable housing on the same campus as other publicly accessible services. Projects like this allow for a maximum use of our limited available land in Santa Cruz, and the library project will make for a revitalized downtown and create a vibrant space for the community as well as affordable homes for so many people in need. Deanthas absolutely supports this project and we urge you to support it as well. Thank you for your testimony. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, I'm Nettie Calvin. Hi. Um, I'm here representing the Beach Flats area. And uh, I'm just really want to emphasize how valuable the trees are to me as a citizen, because in the Beach Flats area, we do not have yards. Everything is very paved over. And so I do appreciate the efforts that there would be replacement trees along with the building project. But I've noticed that the building projects in my area um, have trees that do not provide any shade. And so it doesn't make those trees unvaluable, but they simply are not the equivalent, even if you plant multiple trees of a heritage tree that provides shade. I would also like to emphasize that the trees growing in a parking lot are ill because they don't have proper land to grow on. And so I don't think that that constitutes removing them simply because they aren't doing well because they're growing in inhospitable conditions. So um, that said, I would also like to ask everyone to consider that the trees that are 50 or 70 years old and provide a certain value and beauty cannot be replaced for any value. No dollar amount could bring back those trees, even with the science and technology we have today. So I would ask that we please, as a community, really, even though we need housing desperately, and I agree with that, we need to consider keeping the trees as well because Think of the beauty that they could add along with that project so that people who go in and out of there could, could see beautiful natural objects in this very cemented area because we need to consider the high density aspect of our neighborhoods. So, um, and please consider that if we plant trees now, that is important and people 70 years from now will be able to appreciate them the way that I can appreciate these trees today, that we all can. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. It seems that we are to Ms. Bias. Would that be correct? Ms. Bias, good afternoon. Mr. Bias, thank you, Excuse Mayor. Excuse me. I'm Keeley. sorry, sir. My, uh, my no, apologies. Not, good evening. Not a worries. No worries. No worries at all. Uh, I want to say good evening, Mayor Keeley and uh, City Council. 
I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rene Baez. I'm a field representative for Carpenters Local 505. And I'm here today to just speak about three simple things which will benefit the great city of uh, Santa Cruz. And I believe these three things should also be basic labor standards. One, that's the use of apprenticeship programs. Two, that's health care for workers and their families. And three is uh, local hire. You see, projects that invest in apprenticeships, health care, and local hire is the right choice for the construction workers and the community. This allows the workers and their families to live in the communities that they work in. This also means those wages that are earned will be reinvested back into the local community as they spend their earnings. Um, we, we need affordable housing. We need housing. I agree. And uh, the construction workers who are working on these projects also deserve and need respect, dignity, and a livable wage. And to be upfront, the majority of the projects being built in the area do not have any labor requirements and could, and could be considered a crime scene just by how much these workers are being exploited and robbed of their wages and benefits. But projects like this have the ability to change lives for those who live right here in this, in this community. So my question is this, being that it's a public works and prevailing wage, um, will this project utilize apprenticeships? Will carpenters from local 505 right here in this community be able to work in this community and work on this project? Uh, why wouldn't we have local hire? Public works projects should have labor standards in place that generate opportunities for the residents. And because it's a prevailing wage uh, project, it's also vulnerable for wage theft. So I just want to know what the city is doing to prevent and protect the men and women who will be working on this project. What are we doing to protect them from being, ex being exploited by non-responsible developers and the non-responsible contractors that they hire? I just want you guys to consider the labor standards when planning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Baez. Good evening. Hi there, honorable, hopefully tree heroes. My name is Kersha Durham. I'm here talking for the trees and my students. Um, number one, I think, until funding happens, it doesn't make sense to touch our beloved trees, especially the healthy ones. Leslie Keeley has said some of my trees around my house weren't healthy, but they're there 20 years later. So until there's funding, let's not cut them and have a painful eyesore like the holes we had before by the Rittenhouse building. Remember that? People are drawn to Santa Cruz because of the natural beauty, not for the big buildings, not for the libraries, especially not for parking garages. We are drawn here, why? Because of large trees. Over 1,000 people in the last day have signed and sent letters, 1,300 people in less than 24 hours. That shows Santa Cruz people love trees, not tiny ornamentals that you've planted on Pacific after the earthquake, but large trees. Look at those liquid ambers. Please direct architects to design around our beloved trees. No one yet, not in the Parks and Rec meeting I was in, not in the Planning Commission meeting, no one yet has asked them to look at a design that has our heritage trees in them. So let's fast forward into the future. The tour guide leads you down to the large plaza by the beautiful big library. And there, instead of a flat plaza with treeless or tiny ornamentals, instead of having a tiny square foot child care patio, which imagine, Renee, the size of this, a child care patio, that small, they will have a beautiful, huge outdoor area. Here we are. Maybe we can call it the Fred Keeley Commons. It's full of magnificent big trees. Ooh la la. <laughs> Santa Cruz visionaries voted long ago to keep the precious trees. Look around at us. When I walk into town, I see canopies. It's the most beautiful thing. Please do the right thing. Large trees capture carbon. You know that. And you don't have the funding, so don't clear cut for a sad hole. Thank you. We will go to uh, someone online now. That would be Ms. Greensight. Good evening, Ms. Greensight. Ms. Greenside, I'll, I'll let you know that apparently you are still muted. Okay, I'm going to go to someone here and then we'll go back to Ms. Greenside. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Good evening, Council. 
persons in Mayor Keeley and Vice Mayor Golder. Um, I grew up on a 5,000 acre ranch in uh, Rancho Vistoso in Tucson, Arizona, and our hacienda was a fine old house uh, built in the 30s, and it was surrounded by a very lush oasis, uh, about an acre of really intense planting. My grandmother was a landscape architecture architect, and um, my one of my chief loves as a child was going up, and I built a, my first construction project was a tree house in a giant mulberry tree. It had walls, a uh, window, door, a roof, and running water with steel pipe. And, uh, uh, and I did that when I was in, in middle school. Um, and I used to go up there and get up there on a hot summer day and get way up in that mulberry tree where I had a hammock and hide up there because there was no ladder up to my tree house. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I could hear my dad and my mom down there, where's Johnny? You know, he's supposed to be doing his chores. And I'm not going up and getting him. Well, I'm not either. And uh, so that that was uh, that was my connection to nature. And, and when the mulberries were up, that was easy eating, too. So uh, that was, uh, I had that treehouse all the way through uh, high school. And, and it was just, it was a refuge for me because my brothers, I didn't get along with my brothers sometimes. So, But um, what I want to say um, I'm, this, I want you to consider this next comment to be a California Public Records Act request, an oral one, uh, under California Government Code 6254, at sequel. You all know how well I, I've handled that over the years. And I want to see any records of tree maintenance made on those trees inside the last 10 years. Now, I don't know how far back the maintenance records go, uh, but there's no excuse for those trees being in the condition that the arborist was, is describing, there's no excuse whatsoever. They all they need was good care. No excuse whatsoever. All these other trees in it are, are taken care of. So that records request is on the record. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll now go back to Ms. Greensight online. Good evening, Ms. Greensight. Is that better? Can yes, you hear is. me? There we go. Oh, thank you very much. I'll just get rid of the phone. Um, and I thank you, uh, Mayor Keeley and council members. Um, I'm sorry not to join you. I tested positive for COVID this morning, so um, I'm uh, working a bit hard to be here this evening, but thank you um, for et cetera. Um, I'm representing Save Our Big Trees, which was a group that was formed in uh, 2012 to 2015, when the city was um, weakening, changing and weakening its heritage tree ordinance without any environmental review. And none of you was on the council at that time. There's a bit of a myth that Santa Cruz people will um, sue at the drop of a hat. I can assure you that is not the case. We went to every meeting during that period and we submitted documents, we uh, gave testimony and we were ignored. So at the last desperation, we sought legal help. The three judges at the appellate court ruled in our favour and they upheld the resolution that forms the basis for your decision about the Heritage Tree Ordinance. Namely, a construction project, you can only remove it if a construction project design cannot be altered to accommodate existing heritage trees. During 2021 and 2022, letters were submitted to Ms. Lipscomb from the Sierra Club, from Save Our Big Trees and others reminding her of this resolution. And we got assurances that that was just fine, that they were aware of that. However, the public record shows that there was no discussion on trying to alter the design to accommodate any of the heritage trees as is required in that resolution. Although, as you heard from staff, there have been quite a few alterations in the design, but not one, not one um, discussion on accommodating any of the trees. This was despite a letter from Ms. Keedy in um, June of 22, where she wrote to Ms. Lipscomb and quote, she says, have any design changes been ass um, asserted that would save any trees per the resolution requirement? 
she received no response and the only time this issue was ever discussed was after the permit to remove the heritage trees was granted by the Parks and Rec Department. That is the only time the architect weighed in and said, well, we can't do that because you want to save all the trees. That was inaccurate. Or we can't do that because councillors directed us to use the whole lot. Well, that is not... Um, uh, that's, that's despite the consulting arbor saying that five trees were worth preserving. And he only added an addendum to that after he was advised that, no, our design is covering the whole lot. Planning Commission had an inquiry of strategies for the reduction in the heat gain of buildings with the facade. Well, the trees would achieve that. We are not about in any sense stopping this project at all. We just want you to do the right thing and follow your own codes and procedures and save a couple of trees. We think it's a small ask. It will improve the project. And I'll finish by quoting from the letter submitted on our behalf by attorney um, Bill Parkin, who says, if a public project cannot be slightly modified to accommodate the trees on the periphery of a project site, then any project can simply propose development throughout the four corners of a project site and not have to make alternatives to retain heritage trees on the periphery. This is absurd. The city is attempting to circumvent its own standards and impliedly graft onto the resolution the less onerous criteria that were rejected in Save Our Big Trees versus City of Santa Cruz in 2015. In fact, the decision by the Parks and Recreation Commission, the four who voted to up, uh, deny the appeal, was based on unsupported statements that the project cannot be altered in any manner to accommodate the trees on the periphery of the site. And he just asks that you should direct the project architect to review the matter. If this was honest and above board, we would have documents that said, well, we tried to do designs and here's our five, 10, 20 pages of why it wouldn't work. So I hope you will do the right thing by the trees and by the people who uh, are urging you to follow your own rules. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Greensight. Good evening. Um, my name is Joanne Katzen, and um, I want to thank um, the council, mayor, and the public for being here, especially. Anyhow, and I want to also mention that I have uh, four family members who can't be here, two work in San Jose, and <laughs> two are um, college students, anyhow, not in the area anymore. So they would be here and agree with me on what I have to say. Um, my association goes back, in, with Santa Cruz, goes back to 1979 when I was a student at the university. Like a lot of people, um, I spent many, many days um, going down the Pacific Garden Mall and when I wasn't in class, walking in and out of shops and especially bookshop Santa Cruz and Logos, I must admit, and occasionally spending some money, especially um, in those stores. Uh, I did not have much money then, but... I didn't even know, little did I know, a few years later that I would come back, become a teacher in Watsonville, as I was a bilingual teacher. Hello, Renee, we worked at the same school together. And <laughs> we. Um, and I was for over 25 years until I retired. I taught in Watsonville. Um, and I actually did spend a lot of time in Santa Cruz and still on the mall. Now, I've seen many changes over those years, none for the better, none at all. Um, as a matter of fact, for the worse, I've noticed the buildings going up, and I have never seen such monstrosities except in San Jose and Los Angeles, and that's the truth. Um, I have, I don't know who would approve such monstrosities going right to the curbs without greenery around. But anyhow, um, to get to the point here, it's, it, now I have a desire to, to avoid the, the downtown altogether, but um, one of the reasons I'm here is because I also couldn't be silent in the face of yet another drastic decision which will reverberate into the future long after all of us gone, and at least um, I think we should...
and let let those trees live. And um, if not us, who will speak for the trees? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think our next participant is online, and that would be Ms. Avalis. Good evening. Good afternoon, City. Good evening. Good evening. Good afternoon, City Council Men. My name is Isbeth Avilez. I am a housing coordinator, advocated at Housing Choices, and not Ms. Avalis, if I, if I could just pause you for a second. Your voice is very soft, so if you would speak up that we could hear you a bit better. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, City Councilman. My name is Beth Avilez. I am a housing coordinator advocated at Housing Choices, a nonprofit service provider helping people with devel developmental and other disabilities find and retain affordable housing throughout Santa Cruz County. I am calling in support of the of the development at Eden Housing that will include 124 apartments with 11 house set aside for people with development disabilities. The site is ideal, situated near trans transition and downtown, making it perfect location for development of a walkable, bikeable, and more sustainable community. We strongly support the planning committee's recommendation recommended that the support can be used for the affordable housing development, who can use the space to develop more affordable housing and deeper lev levels of affordability than that would be achieved under the inclusion of housing or ordinance. This is especially important for meeting the housing needs for Santa Cruz special needs population, including people with developmental disabilities, who require deeply affordable rents paired with a coordinator support services funded by San Andreas Regional Center. By having affordable housings available for special needs population, they will pro be provided with support, service to live in the community, and have an on-site resident coordinator to check in with them regularly, contact their circle support, aid and additional safety net for our clients. We hope to see the city commit to the creating housing opportunities, which increase housing accessibility for people with developmental disabilities so they can re remain in the community where they live or work. For a person with developmental disability, which can affect cognitive fun functioning, living without support for family or service providers can put them in an extremely vulnerable position. And we can only hope that this client was able to find some safety and stability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Until you get to the microphone, we can't, I can't hear a word you're saying. I'm okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. I want to thank you for letting me speak. Um, I am only briefly giving you information about... Would, would you be kind enough to state your name for the record? Susan Cavallari. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I have a uh, paper which talks about carbon sequestration by lot four trees. It was done using the um, information given by Dryad Arborist, um, and it is using my tree, um, I tree tools. So, with the loss of twelve large trees at lot four. If the, um, the calculations indicate that 49 trees would be needed in order to match those trees which have been uh, removed from lot four, and this would be 10 years after planting. So if you could look at that, um, it will take years to get the carbon sequestration that we need. So thank you. Thank you very much. Let's next go to Mr. Goldenkranz, who is online. Good evening, sir. Thank you, Mayor and Council members. I appreciate the opportunity. 
Um, I'm here as the chair of the County Democratic Party. Uh, we took a strong stand in favor of this mixed use project and in opposition to the ballot initiative that was on last November's ballot. Um, with respect to the ballot initiative, the people have spoken decisively. People of the city have, have declared that they wanna move forward with this. Um, I also have been watching this project through prior city councils and most recently the planning commission meeting. And I've seen the project improve every time it goes under consideration. Most recently, I think your planning commission did a commendable job in asking questions about sustainable materials, about the green roof, about the open space um, for the childcare center. And, um, and I thought overall, they really had their eye on um, positive aspects of the program in terms of the versatility of it moving forward. Um, I would like to say as a practitioner and teacher of environmental science that um, when the, the prior speaker did an analysis of the carbon sequestration of the trees, that in addition to the replacement trees, you got to think about the, the people's ability to live there and walk to work. I'm on the board of Santa Cruz Community Health. You heard our friend Laura Marcus describe a growing downtown. We have 100 employees who are commuting up from Watsonville and Salinas to work, to work downtown. And if they had a chance to live there and walk to work, that's where the carbon gets removed. So I, I think the council's done a great job, planning commission's done a great job, and I hope you will move forward and approve this project as is. Thank you kindly. Thank you, Mr. Goldencrantz. Good evening. Uh, greetings, Mayor uh, and Council Members. My name is Kyle Kelly, and I come to yet again support the library housing project. I think one one important part of <clears throat> to like recognize is the other everyone who's not in the room with us now, the people who have already been displaced or who even right now live in San Lorenzo Valley or Watsonville or Salinas that could be living downtown. And this is about looking at the forest instead of the, the trees right inside, right? This comes back to instead of worrying about carbon capture, let's just not emit the carbon. Let's allow more people to live downtown. Let's, let's allow childcare to be right near like where a lot of people are working uh, let's bring bring all of that together: library, housing, childcare. So I'm 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 hopeful that we can continue on with this project, um, and I think importantly, I hope that everyone is able to look and think about like, are that am am I a grandparent? Am I a parent? How many children do I have? Do we create enough housing for our own children or our grandchildren? And are we making sure that we're we're leaving room and leaving a powerful legacy for the future? So that's all I bring for you tonight. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, thank you. Thank you for your service on the school board. Let's go to uh, Mr. Snyder online. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, so I have a lot of thoughts about this project. Um, uh, you know, there's uh, there's definitely uh, something to be said for, um, you know, um, uh, new renewal of the library, but I think you're, you're, you're funding this entire project. You're kind of threading the needle by combining the library uh, funding, uh, the transportation funding and the, and the housing, uh, the low income housing development uh, funding. So it's all getting sort of lashed together in one uh, chimera project. And it's kind of a real huge, uh, you know, it needs a, it needs to be, sh uh, it needs to be, uh, I think it needs to be sort of uh, shrunken down. Uh, I mean, why I feel that way is, uh, you know, I, uh, our architectural uh, renderings of the finished project are usually, uh, you know, basically optical illusions. The finished project almost never looks like the the depictions. One thing that I know, um, you know, it's just uh, really uh, evident is that the central library is gonna take a huge hit in terms of how much floor space it has. If you compare uh, the current library to this uh, this uh, new uh, uh, two-story floor space you have allotted, uh, it's actually a reduction of I, I would estimate over over 35, maybe 40 percent in floor space. So the new library is actually going to be uh, and and the alley off to the side is just just sounds like a, a like a really uh, treacherous, dark uh, kind of uh, 
wild entrance for the UTC. Uh, University Town Center uh, has a beautiful view of the sunset and the magnolia tree and the and the church and 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 the horizon. Um, and uh, you know that's that's definitely going to get blotted out, uh, much like Lincoln Street. And um, I, I'm just not in support of it. But you know, it seems like it's moving forward. If you'd like to finish your thought, that would be okay. Uh, I don't have anything else to punctuate what I've already said. I guess that's 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 how I feel about it. I think. Well, thank you very much for calling in. Very much appreciate that. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Thanks for your time and consideration. Uh, this is really a crucial issue for the future of Santa Cruz. We all realize that. I want to push away a false premise at the beginning, and that is that... Would you, would you just for the record, state your name? I'm John Hall, yes, you are. and I'm going to speak uh, to some extent as a sociologist here, so I, I, I won't lecture. But, uh, uh, so I, I, I want to say, uh, you know, there's a false premise that we have to choose between affordable housing and saving the trees, or between a library and saving the trees. Uh, we need to dismiss that idea. We want to see badly, the people who want to save some trees want badly to see housing built in Santa Cruz. And we believe that we can, in this project, have both the housing, the library, and save two heritage trees. Sociologically, in the sociology of law, you have a problem if a city government does not honor its own ordinances and its own resolutions. Uh, Jillian Greensight has gone through the details of the Arborist Report that says five trees that are heritage trees are worthy of preservation. She's shown you that there is no documentation that any effort was made to design an alternative plan that would accommodate the trees, two trees, even just two trees at the perimeter, and include the library, the housing, the parking garage, etc. So. There is an issue of legitimacy of government if the city doesn't follow its own ordinances. I think that's something that you need to consider. The second thing, sociologically, is there's a great deal of social research, starting with the life and death, Jane Jacobs, the life and death of American cities, that shows that cities are for people who are on the streets, moving around, circulating, being with one another. I have never seen Public building. Hall, what I'm going to do, uh, because I interrupted you once, I'm going to give you another 15 seconds if okay. you, you'd be. Okay. I've never seen a civic building that didn't have an entrance other than being just a storefront style entrance. We can do better here. I urge you to accommodate, uh, to, to simply consider accommodating the two trees. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Hall, thank you. Thank you for your good work on this. We will go to Ms. Loijos, who is online. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Good evening, Mayor Keeley and City Council members. My name is Dina Logis, and I'm the Chief Strategy and Impact Officer at Santa Cruz Community Health. On behalf of our Board of Directors and the thousands of Santa Cruz City patients we serve, I'm here to express our support of the Downtown Library Affordable Housing Project. For nearly 50 years, Santa Cruz Community Health has provided high quality care to all people regardless of their ability to pay. As a federally qualified health center, we're also a designated health care for the homeless site dedicated to improving the health of the unhoused members of our community. In all, we serve the physical, emotional, and social needs of over 11,000 people, including over 2,000 of whom are unhoused. The housing crisis in our community continues to worsen with no end in sight. The need for affordable housing is the number one social issue facing our patients. If we could write prescriptions for affordable housing, we would do so without hesitation as that is surely the fundamental treatment that so many of our patients' lives depend on. As a community, we do not have the luxury of shutting down affordable housing proposals. We have waited too long to build new housing stock. 
The fear of change can no longer be an excuse to prevent people, young and old, from accessing a safe and secure roof over their heads. The library housing project, project is one important step in the right direction. The Santa Cruz Community Health urges you to support the library affordable housing project as is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Barbara Riverwoman. Um, I found myself longing today, as I thought about this meeting, for a fairy tale. So um, being a preschool teacher and telling stories, I thought I would write one. So I just wrote this. It's a little rough. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a perfect little town nestled between a flowing river and a great ocean the people in this town especially love their trees, and the trees love them back. The breath of the trees filled the people's lungs with healthy air, and the huge and beautiful white flowers on the magnolias and the flaming reds of the liquid ambers brought joy to everyone. But then two bad things happened. The little town became filled with monsters with strange names like Chevrolet and Ford and Tesla. And some people in the town made friends with the monsters and wanted to build more roads and houses for the monsters, even though the monsters breathed out po poison and they were not beautiful. So then there was a fight. Three wise women made a very good law that the city could not cut down any special trees until they tried, as Jillian said, very, very hard to make room for them. Three wise men told the city it shouldn't build a house for monsters in the first place. So once again, this time, the leaders of the little town paid a lot of money to some wise people, Nelson Newgard, to tell them what to do. Um, they said, the wise people said, don't build houses for cars. That will just make the monsters want to stay here. You should build parks for the future. So the leaders took a vote. And it wasn't a fair vote. They voted to cut down the trees. The same people said, maybe just a few trees. So the city leaders took another vote. And I will tell you, my little granddaughter, as I told her I would tell her later what happens tonight, I will tell you later tonight what happened at the end of the story. Thank you. I'll say this, whether or not I agree with you on that, that was adorable. <laughs> All right. Uh, our next caller online. <clears throat> Welcome. Good evening, Council. Um, my name is Eric Grodberg, and uh, I just wanted to clear up some errors that I've heard. The arborist definitely does not recommend retaining any of the trees. He found that they were all either unhealthy or in very poor growing conditions. And instead of just telling you what he said, I'm going to quote him because you've heard a lot of people telling you what he said and they weren't telling the truth. So this is a quotation. Quote, these trees will continue to increase in size, exacerbating current conditions. Many of the conditions observed can be expected to worsen over time. In my opinion, it is ill-advised to retain these trees on site unless extensive design accommodation can be undertaken to enhance their growing condition and reduce risk. Consider removing and replacing all 12 trees with sound specimens that will not achieve large size and provide sufficient growing spaces. So I would urge you to just go ahead with the Planning Commission's recommendation. The Mesro people lost and they just won't accept the will of the people. Also, I, I would say the um, two trees that seem to be at the center of their efforts are liquid ambers and liquid ambers are considered a nuisance tree and prohibited to be planted as landscape trees in many communities uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. So. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening. Coral Brew. 
Fred, uh, Mayor Keeley and Maybe. City Council. I'm here to speak for trees and birds. Trees are so welcoming in a city such as ours. Why has Santa Cruz become popular? It's for the, its nature and not large, tall buildings. Large buildings are unuseful when electricity or generator power is, not, is out uh, off the grid. The trees can bring us hope and compassion. Trees are alive. Trees can coexist with buildings, however, and a young person definitely needs and wants a tree. It is a relationship when we let it support us that way. People love them as part of the community now for many years. The community loves the trees. The trees have many benefits. One, shade. Two, pollution filtering. Three, carbon absorption. Four, beauty. Five, emotional. And six, mental well-being. I'll explore how this actually works. When small saplings are planted, it takes years for their maturity. Replacement saplings do not equal heritage trees. It is estimated that a cubic meter of, of wood absorbs just under a ton of CO2 in a year. These trees <clears throat> will outgive any building when the sun is too hot, the rain is too intense, and winds are beyond duration. Smaller trees would be uprooted in the severe storm. Large trees endure. Modern buildings are use, unuseful for heat or cooling when the power grid is out. Again, I say trees can bring back hope and compassion. They're a solid part of our early memories, DNA, and spirit. Please can, uh, thank you for considering keeping at least two or three trees. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Filippini is next online. Good evening. Good evening. Lyra Filippini here. Um, so Ms. Filippini, Ms. Yeah. Filippini, uh, at least I'm having a hard time hearing you. I don't know if you need to get closer to your phone or whatever it might be, but see if you can step that up a little bit. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, is this better? That is better. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, over the years, the Lot 4 project concept has changed and improved a great deal, and many of you have played big roles in those improvements. Now that the majority of city voters chose this project as the path to affordable housing and a new library, let's move forward with one final improvement, one that would bring a meaningful remnant from decades of community events and markets to the parcel's new life and new purpose. Yeah. Incorporating the two perimeter liquid ambers on the exterior would not only be beautiful, but also a step toward community healing, something I think we would all agree would be good. No pro programmatic goals would need to be changed for this to happen. Clearly, the other protected heritage trees that the Arborist Report did deem as, quote, worthy of preservation, end quote, would be less feasible to include because they're in the middle of the parcel. So no one's asking for that. But as has been demonstrated in the public record, there is plenty of space for all programmatic goals to be fully achieved and also include just these two particular beautiful heritage trees on the perimeter. This would enhance the project both physically and equitably. People really love these particular large trees. After all, they are our heritage. But beyond that, following the associated ordinance and resolution is the right thing to do. And from what I can tell, it's pretty clear the ordinance has not yet been properly adhered to. I find this understandable when looking at the complexity of the project and the politics that have swirled around it. Yet I have full faith that if you direct them to, these talented architects can do modest design alterations to include just those two trees and relatively quickly too. I understand you need permits imminently so project funding applications can be submitted in a tight timeline. The original tree removal permit stated that they were conditional on project funding. Perhaps that could be tweaked to also include consideration of the alteration. That way you still have the permits and be able to apply for funding right away. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Filippini. Good evening. Uh, 
My name is Darius Mosny. <clears throat> First, I want to say at the outset, I'm not a climate denier. In fact, I'm a climate realist, maybe a climate fatalist. <clears throat> I've heard a lot of discussion tonight about the trees and climate change and carbon sequestration. I brought my shop vac, and this is 10 gallons. This is the entire, met if this were water, <clears throat> water, it would be the entire greenhouse gas out output of China. And that's a hundred, and the equivalent in, in drops of water is 151,000. I'm an engineer, I'm kind of a numbers guy. Santa Cruz, the entire Santa Cruz County carbon output is 345,000 tons as of 2018 numbers. It's one drop in this bucket, this 10 gallon bucket to make decisions about climate mitigation in our little community based on greenhouse gas out output or trees capturing it, it's pretty really irresponsible. And I think it kind of demonstrates, you know, that to Matt, and this is just China, not India, not Western Europe, not South America, just China. We are one drop in this, this 10 gallon bucket. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's go to the next person online. I have a phone number, but I don't have a name. But let me uh, ask the person whose phone number ends in 6766. It's your opportunity to speak. Hello. Hi, good evening. You got me. Hi, it's uh, somewhat uh, commonly known as the other Fred these days. So I'm, uh, excuse me, I, don't mean, I, I do mean to interrupt you. We can barely hear you, so please do your best to speak loudly. Thank you, sir. Okay, Fred, Fred Geiger, Santa Cruz, sometimes known as the other Fred. Uh, what this is about to me is about the city following a law. And, you know, I'm tired as a taxpayer of seeing the city go, have to go to court so many times to defend things they've done that do not comply with the law, usually environmental laws. And then, in the end, having to pay the legal fees for both sides when they lose, and then complying in the end when they're forced to. The last three cases I'm aware of, this has cost the city over a million dollars in legal fees. Don't believe me, ask your city attorney. So we have some people here asking you to not even comply with the full law about these uh, heritage trees, merely to save two out of something like seven or nine trees. I think it would be pitiful if this has to go to court and project is lost, the library bond funding timeline is exceeded, all that nice affordable housing is jeopardized. I mean, how hard is it to say, cut a little uh, space in this building, a couple square feet here and there, these people want two trees, that's all they're asking for. What's the question? How hard is it? And it's, it's the law anyway. So, I mean, what's the hang up? Let the two trees be there, everybody's happy. I mean, I just don't get it. Is it just arrogance or City doesn't feel like they would ever have to comply with the law. I, I think it's disturbing, and the, the amount of cost to the taxpayers and wasted legal fees, it's completely unjustifiable. So comply with the law. It's clear that it's there. Excuses, you know, the trees are this or that. The law is clear. It says you got to design the building around the trees, and here people are only asking for two out of like seven or nine trees. So how, how else can you possibly go ahead and try to do this? Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Mary Odegaard. And I would like to see housing and trees on lot four. And I'm here to ask you to follow the city heritage trees code and request that the architects design a plan for that project that incorporates the trees. Um, it's a simple request. It's a very sincere request. Those trees have beauty, and they need to continue to stand. And we can have housing, and we can have trees. We don't have to choose between one or the other. And we have. A lot to be grateful for, and I hope that you hear our sincere request for the trees. 
All the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Sonnenfeld, good evening online. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, express my support for the library project. Um, this has been a, a, a very, you know, multi years long saga, and I hope that we're finally coming to um, some closure and be able to uh, move on with uh, the discourse around this. Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Measure O was uh, put to the voters and we uh, soundly defeated it at, a, uh, I think, close, close to 60 to 40. Uh, so nearly two thirds of the voters of Santa Cruz support this project and would like to see it move forward. Um, I think we're, we're all getting tired of, of debating every little single thing about this project. Um, it's been getting better and better and better. And um, as everyone who has spoken in support of this project this evening <clears throat> has mentioned so far, we need the affordable housing. Um, it's a great library project. It'll include uh, so many uh, awesome features for our downtown community. So um, uh, thank you for uh, all your hard work and um, just appreciate everyone who's uh, put so much uh, uh soul into into making this uh, a place for um for a, really the center of our of our downtown community thank you for your testimony good evening thank you so much of course my name is lisa ekstrom um i think all of us care deeply for the future of the community that's why we're here I think we also all share concern for the climate emergency that we're all facing. I recently heard someone say that if you want to accomplish nothing, convince people that they're on opposite sides of each other. And I believe we've all known the frustrations of that experience. For example, it could appear that one person's passionate protection of our heritage trees could be at cross purposes with another person's equally passionate push to get more affordable housing built as soon as possible. But what if we're not at cross purposes? What if it's not yes or no? What if it's, uh, what if, what is, sorry, what if trees or this project is actually a false choice? In fact, as we work hard, to create more much needed affordable housing downtown, these big trees will be even more of a crucial protection against rising levels of CO2, working hard to support environmental health, human health, even community health. It will take a very long time, as other people have said, for new sapling trees to protect us as the heritage trees already do. So what can we do together, honoring our need to affordably house more of our community and honor our ordinance and honor the trees that have been protecting us and continue to protect us? I come from a family of architects. I've seen many large projects change remarkably in their scope. And if it weren't for the robust public engagement on this project, as many people have mentioned, we could still be here today talking about a huge new parking garage with no affordable housing in sight. So please direct the architects of this project to create a design alteration to honor, accommodate, and save as many of our heritage trees on this site as possible. Thanks very much, Mayor and Council Members, for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. We'll now go to Ms. Webster online. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Good after. Uh, good evening, actually. Sorry, uh, Mayor Keeley and Council Members. My name is Felicia Webster, and I'm the Senior Housing Advocate at Housing Choices, the nonprofit service provider who will provide on-site supported services to residents with developmental and other disabilities in the future affordable housing project at the site by Eden Housing and for the future housing. 
I'm calling in support of the redevelopment of 113 and 119 Lincoln Street into a vibrant new mixed-use project, including a library and deeply affordable housing, situated near transit and downtown, making the perfect location for creating a more sustainable and inclusive community. On behalf of the city's nearly 400 residents with developmental disabilities, we applauded the developer for including people with developmental disabilities in their project plans. The city is currently home to nearly 300 adults with developmental disabilities, only a third of whom have been able to transition to living independently with the supported services they need to integrate into the community. Instead, most adults with developmental disabilities are living at home with aging parents due to the lack of deeply affordable housing available in the city, increasing their risk of homelessness or displacement as they age in place. This is because many adults with developmental disabilities are on fixed incomes from disability benefits or working part-time in low-wage jobs and struggle to qualify for most of the affordable units currently available in the city. By collaborating with Housing Choices, who provide on-site supported services for the 11 households living in the homes set aside for people with developmental disabilities, and offer units at the deepest levels of affordability. This project will address the housing needs of these at-risk adults wanting to live independently by meeting federal and state priorities to provide inclusive housing opportunities where people with and without disabilities will live side by side and helps to meet the city's legal mandate to affirmatively further fair housing for special needs population provided little other than segregated housing options. We look forward to being able to support future residents of this project and I strongly urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Webster. Good evening. Um, I have a point of clarification. I'm just wondering. I I represent Save Some Trees. We are the You're appeal. You're Ms. Marin, right? Yes. Yes. And, you... and I've been waiting because I thought it would be better for everybody to be able to make their comments. And I'm wondering, is that really true? Well, it, you can do it however you want. You do have extra time. Right. So you can do that now. You can do it at, as the last person to testify, however you wish to do it. Okay, I think I'll wait just because very it good. seems to interrupt the flow. Okay. Okay. Good, Thank good. You. Thank you very much. Chairman Goldenkrantz, welcome back. My mistake, sorry. Okay. Do you wish to testify on this, sir? Okay, I thought so. There we go. All right, good evening. Hi, good evening. My name is Eileen Vallian. I'm a longtime Dominican Hospital employee, and I recognize the need for community projects which prioritize new housing. Most Santa Cruz residents face increasing difficult, difficulty accessing affordable housing. Many of my colleagues at Dominican struggle to find homes within their budget, and certainly the vulnerable population we treat at Dominican struggles in this current environment. The new library project allows for more housing along with giving us a much needed new library, which I believe many of the library employees are in support of. I hope the council will support this important civic development. Thank you. Well, thank you. Ms. Duncan Merrill, online. Good evening. Uh, yeah, hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. Um, I am um, calling in to support the Mixed Use uh, Library Project. Um, I would like to applaud everyone involved for designing such an extraordinary project. The, the landscaping in particular, which is my passion as a landscape designer, um, is really quite beautiful. We are adding a rooftop garden to what is ex an existing surface lot that's just asphalt and 12 trees that are in a permanent state of decline. I am excited about a modernized library. I think it's incredible that we're adding 124, 100% affordable housing units. I am grateful for all the hard work from so many of my uh, <clears throat> local Santa Cruz city residents for working so hard on this project. And I applaud the city council for finally taking it up after years of obstruction from the same exact people who 
promised us that once the voters had a say, they would knock it off. They would stop appealing this mixed use project. They would stop lying to the public. They would stop standing up for 12 trees in decline. They continue to call it 12 trees, even though one of the ginkgos is barely a tree, it's barely hanging on, yet they include it in their count. I hope that this group has had enough that they have learned from the fact that 60% of our local electorate voted in favor of this extraordinary project. I thought they would stop, they haven't. They continue to mislead the public with um, untruths and um, <laughs> questionable facts. I, uh, but I personally would like to ask that our Santa Cruz City Council adopt this project without any changes it is an important project and it is also important to set a standard for our city that a small group who are highly litigious will stop the constant battle with our locals and at least allow this project to move forward. Thank you guys for your time. Thanks for everything. Have a good night. Thank you, Maggie. Is there anybody that's in chambers that wishes to speak still? Okay. Good evening. My name is Janice O'Driscoll. I'm the current president of the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. I was on library staff for 33 years, and I retired in 2019 as assistant library director. The Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries and its chapters are the fundraising arm that supports all the branches in the library. We have raised over almost $3 million to support the nine branches that have either reopened or about to reopen this year. So we have one more branch, the downtown branch. The downtown branch is very important because it is not only the branch, the local branch for the citizens, the residents of the city of Santa Cruz, but it is the hub of a library system. It offers collections, programs, and staff support to all the branches. We, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're doing great. I, I lost my, no, I lost my place. We're not going to count it against you. You're doing fine. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry. Um, what is really important for the library is that we have heard from citizens for the last seven years through numerous public meetings, through the media, and through the ballot box that they support the public library. Go ahead. It's time to build it. Let's get this done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Stetson online, good evening. Hi everyone, it's Grace Stetson. Um, I have had a lot of relationships with this mixed use project over the last year and a half, two years. First as the affordability and equity correspondent at Lookout Santa Cruz, then as the campaign coordinator for No on Measure O. Now as the communications manager at Housing Matters and also and potentially most importantly, as a renter in this community trying to find affordable housing. It is very difficult to find affordable housing in Santa Cruz. If you have not looked recently, it's become even more difficult since I first moved here. This project has been in development for years, as Janice and Maggie and Kyle and various other people have said, and was approved by over 14,000 city voters. That's almost 60% of voters when it was put on the ballot last November. This project has been decided and we need to move forward with it to move forward as a community. One of the critics of the project earlier mentioned that she considers projects like this to be monstrosities. I think it's a monstrosity that we are not prioritizing housing for all of our residents. We may be losing 12 non-native trees here in lot four, but we are gaining 124 units of affordable housing, a new library, 
child care facility and outdoor green space. I hope that we can move forward with this project sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening. Mayor Keeley, I want to just clarification because I just spoke on the trees before and you said we would get an opportunity to speak on the rest of the project at another opportunity, but the well, way well, things are going, okay, let me, I'm not sure. Yeah, let me make sure. Okay. What I was trying to say is those folks who came here to speak on the tree portion of this issue, I was trying to get them sort of together. Uh, okay, and, and I'll then, step aside if there's any left, okay? There we go. Every, everybody can testify one time, okay? One time. You don't get to come up on the appeal on the trees and then uh, separate. So whatever you have to say, say it. That, that's the opportunity. All right. So then may I ask who's read their bright yellow um, uh, packet that I included and in, in everybody, everybody here got one. Uh, what, yep. Why don't you say what it is oh, you want to say? Okay. Well, what I want to say is the loss of the space. The common public space, as I see, is the biggest tragedy. Okay, hang on just a second. I, Certainly. I, I, Mr. Just, Gold. Just hold for just, me for just a second. Hang on just Clarify who I am for the <laughs> record. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Tell you what I'm going to do. Tell you what I'm going to do. I can see where it might have been somewhat confusing when I made my earlier comment. You, you testified earlier on this, but what I'm going to do out of an abundance of comity to you is give you 30 seconds. Okay. Well, dig your yellow packet out and follow along with me because I think the most important point is the loss of the public space. It's a, we haven't, this city has not had an open space since 1910, when the streets were wide enough to turn a wagon with a four-horse team around. And the last opportunity we got was the earthquake. And we tried to pick it up there. But this is a public space that's mostly empty right now and is a, is a great location for what, what the, the folks that wanted to have it as, as a, basically as a public plaza. It could be used for many different things. And I put together a list of, of, of spaces all over the world here that are used family and a video that you I, I hope you had the time to look at but um uh i was going to make some comments about uh, uh from the lady who wrote the death and life of the great american cities public spaces are extremely important and what you're losing what you're going to murder here you're losing an opportunity that would cost at least five million dollars to replace that land because that's the price of land Per acre, two point four million dollars per acre. That's what the city paid for the front street. So I'm done. All right. Read this before you vote. All right, please. Thank you very much. You got it in plenty of time. Excuse me. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Would you also hand that to the clerk so we could have it for the well, record? Well, they, they had actually all the copies, but I got plenty of copies out here. Hand it to the clerk. We'll be glad to include it in the record as well. Thank you, sir. All right. And tell us how we got to this point. Uh, understood. Ms. Aguado, I hope that I have pronounced your name correctly. You are on. Uh, good evening. Um, good evening. Ana Aguado from uh, Head Start Under Encompass Community Services. Um, our program provides uh, services, uh, early child care uh, services to families across our county. Um, in, in my experience, I do oversee the social services part um, of our program and one of the major needs that families have mentioned um, is housing and we in addition to that um, our staff uh, struggle when um, families ask them for support in finding affordable housing and it's very limited um, so I, I do want to advocate for supporting additional housing in the community in addition I want to add that our program is on board to collaborate in the project to provide uh, child care services as part of the uh, project. Um, we do want to make this in an effort to interrupt, you know, the cycles of poverty. And I ask that you consider uh, approval of this project to support uh, families and our future generations. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Good evening. Hi, I'm Narayan Wilder, local activist and independent journalist. And um, 
you know, I come to speak as I think the one of the only people in this room under the age of like 25. Um, so I have a pretty important sure. perspective sure. on this. Um, <laughs> and like, yeah, I'm I'm feeling quite conflicted, um, to be honest, because I see, you know, I, I am somebody who is in need of affordable housing here in Santa Cruz. Um, I currently live in Boulder Creek at the house where I've lived for my whole life because I can't find anywhere to move out. Um, I just can't. I can't find anywhere to move into Santa Cruz, around Santa Cruz. It's just I can't find anything. But also, I do see the tree advocates, you know, things, particularly the it takes trees a long time to grow, it takes, you know, many, many, many years for such large trees to grow, but also I see the not wanting to delay such a deeply important project, you know, for further and further pushing it back. Um, just one of the other things that I kind of thought about was the large-ish parking garage that is still there, and those ideas of just like, there's this concept in urban design called induced demand, um, if you build it, they will come. So producing more car-centric infrastructure leads to more demand for cars. And, you know, in this particularly very downtown area, very closely proximity to the, you know, the transit center and the walkability, you know, I could also see not needing so much space developed to, you know, car parking and those kind of things. So I really don't know if I'm advocating for or against the program. Um, <laughs> I kind of just, I'm feeling very conflicted on it. Um, and just as a, you know, a youth who has a vested interest in this community, I've, I was born in Felton, I've lived in Boulder Creek my entire life, I've been a citizen here my whole life, I'm also a permanent pedestrian, um, so I just, a lot of prevalent perspectives. So, I don't know how I feel. Thank you very much. But thank you for sharing your ambiguous feelings with us that's good i <laughs> appreciate it <laughs> mr philip you're on you're online and you're on hi hey before commenting on the library could you clarify what happened to oral communications as you must have blown through that in a hot man a second that postponed i i am he's very sorry question. he's saying Hold that on oral just a second, communications sir. was He's saying that oral communications on the agenda was to happen before this item, but we could do it after. Oral communications going to happen as soon as we finish this item. Okay, thank you, sir. You're welcome, okay, sir. Uh, I will comment on the library. Uh, the library is a hugely controversial project that with no doubt indicates that a pervasive consensus never did, doesn't, and won't ever exist. And Measure O wasn't the straight up and down vote on it being junked up with other considerations. So it wasn't really a valid vote although Measure S was, that had a very different idea about the use of library funds. My objections are that it is clear you want to repeatedly, permanently sacrifice public property airspace that is really owned by everyone, used by the many, for the housing benefit of really very few housing prices or not. I don't know if you intend to insist residents be screened for some kind of a need basis. I hope not. We don't live in Russia, not yet. And I suspect nothing prevents people of means just snapping up a good deal. The real problem is inflation, and today's affordable housing is tomorrow's unaffordable housing. I hope in the future you get better consensus before embarking on the most expensive project ever undertaken here and put some limits on your ideas about giving away public property for the benefit of the few before it's all gone. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Keeley and Council. My name is Jim Meckes, uh, resident, past water commissioner. I grew up in Santa Cruz using the old Carnegie Library through high school. By the mid-60s, it was too small for a town of 30,000, so we built a current library. Our population has more than doubled again, 65,000. It's time. Please approve the project as, a, as proposed. Twice now, the public has voted support for a library that will address current and future needs of our growing city. We also need affordable housing, and this mixed development delivers 124 units, all affordable. Reducing the project size to, to retain existing trees reduces the ability to provide either sufficient library or affordable housing. The only obstacle is the claim of heritage trees. If council were to pass a law declaring trees to be elephants, 
Those trees wouldn't become elephants, only misnamed trees. Um, and when compared to mature redwoods, some locally are up to 2,000 years old, there's not much heritage to the trees that were planted as parking lot decorations behind the local J.C. Penney store 60 years ago. They're younger than I am. I don't consider myself heritage. The Arborist, Arborist Report says the current trees are in bad shape. They've had roots, roots and tops aggressively pruned. Over the years, the root crowns are partially buried, there's disease, and they do drop limbs. The mixed-use project will replace them with 21 new trees, plus a living turf roof on the buildings. Within a few years, this project will provide more foliage and much less heat island effect than the sickly trees and expanse of black asphalt at Lot 4 today. That's combined with a beautiful, airy, functional design and affordable housing. I ask you to please approve this project. Thank you very much. Ms. Kuehl, you are, I'm sorry, Ms. Kuehl, hold for just a second. The person whose phone number ends in 5652, you are on. Hi, um, my name is Candace Brown, and as I'm listening to this, uh, I was not involved in the, uh, the great battle over Measure O because I was dealing with the loss of a loved one. Um, but, you know, one thing that has always concerned me about this project is that it is in the 100-year floodplain. And if you are going to consider um, some modifications to the project for, you know, a handful or a few trees, it would be a rare opportunity to rethink um, what would happen to the library in a 100-year flood. Um, it is a three-story building, um, but there might be an opportunity to add another floor to put the community space at the bottom and the library collection up at the top um, because it's never been something that's been adequately discussed in my view. So we're talking about trees today, but we're also talking about a development that will be lasting for another 100 years, and it will live to see a 100-year flood. So I hope you will consider that, and it may be a rare opportunity to deal with it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Good evening, Ms. Matthews. Welcome back to Chambers. Thanks. Uh, you are faced with a very exciting opportunity this evening to make a major investment in the future of our community, and I don't want you to lose track of that. Um, this is, you have a wonderful staff report not to repeat it. The staff report touches on so many aspects of our city's general plan. And this project not only fulfills, but realizes so many of the goals in our general plan for affordable housing, for sustainability, for a vibrant downtown, for social equity, it goes on and on and on. They're all contained in this community vision and this project realizes them. This project also realizes hard work done on the library facilities master plan. 10 years ago to look at our whole system, as was talked about. And we've seen in the intervening years, almost all of the branches either completed or in the process of renovation. And we have seen, I hope you visited the branches, the excitement that those wonderful renovated or new libraries bring to those community communities. It's happening nationwide. And that's what we deserve for our downtown. We've seen the evolution of our downtown plan. I participated in the um, Vision Santa Cruz after the earthquake. And the downtown plan has evolved since then. Certainly now, um, with COVID, the changes in work, work patterns, we're, we're facing more changes for our downtown. And we need to accommodate that. We also have community imperatives for affordable housing that become only more severe every year. Um, I particularly want to call out the work that was done, the evolution of this plan, and the, um, the change of the design to be considerate to the Cedar Corridor plan stepping down as it reaches out into the less dense neighborhood. Um, I want to just show a couple of pictures, if I could ask one to be put. I want to show you my liquid amber chops. <laughs> We're going to freeze your time Thanks. here for a second. Technical, Make sure you technical get the time. pause here. They told me they could do this. <laughs> Maybe not. If not, you know, we'll. Can 
No. I'll just say I moved to Santa Cruz in 1970. Shortly after that, I live on Walnut downtown. But man, this street is bleak. It's hot. <laughs> so I organized tree planting along Walnut Avenue. And um, the first block, my block was liquid ambers. There I am. Look, an African thing here. That's 1971, trees for walnut. Next to that, we planted the trees, 1971. That's my little babe there. He is now 50-something. Um, the trees grew up. He grew up. Let's take a look at the next picture. Liquid ambers are not a great street tree. Those are those trees. They're brittle. They break. They have invasive roots. Virtually all the liquid ambers on walnut are gone. They're not a good urban landscape tree. I also planted the sycamores along the 200 block of walnut, and those, those are thriving. So I just, I just want to put street trees in perspective. Uh, finally, that third um, image that I showed you, um, just want to emphasize the, the map. Yeah, You're not going to be able to read this, but you'll see it. This is a Sanborn map. It's an old insurance map from 1880-something. Of this block of downtown, Cathcart didn't go through, Cedar didn't go through. There was a shooting gallery. There were stables. <laughs> there were a few single-family houses with outhouses. My point being, downtowns evolve. And what we see before us now is a plan that's been so well thought out. It combines so many of the needs and good resources of our community to really meet the needs of this community now and for the future. So I urge you to support it as presented, trying to save true two non-healthy trees that aren't suitable is just a fool's errand. It compromises the project beyond reproach. So let's realize the vision of the library housing project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matthews. Ms. Kuehl, you are online. Good evening. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So I'm actually calling because my daughter would like to say something on this issue. And then if there's any time left, I'll say something as well. Sounds fine. Hello, my name is Allison Cole. I'm asking um, you to save the trees because I care about the environment and animals. You should respect things that have been here longer than you. Thank you. So that one's my daughter, and she's actually raising her voice on something that she cares about. Um, many of you know I'm the president of the Santa Cruz chapter of the California Homeless Union, and I also work for a local nonprofit. I can definitely say we need housing. Housing is the number one thing that individuals who are unhoused need. Um, with that being said, I also love trees, and my daughter cries for the environment. So I just would like to say that if there's any way to save a couple of the trees and incorporate that in the design, I don't see any reason why you can't go back to the developer and say, you know, these trees are viable. We want you to save a couple of them. You know, we're we're hearing the community when it comes to that. So that's that's our two cents regarding this issue. Thank you. Ms. Kuehl, thank you and, and your daughter very much. Mr. Farrell, good evening. Good evening, Mayor Keeley and council members. Um, I'm here today just to urge you to support staff recommendation and uh, the public process that included review by the Planning Commission, which voted unanimously to support this project. And it included members on that commission who had opposed the project in the November election. So if the Planning Commission can see uh, the path to approving this unanimously, I'm hoping the same thing could happen today at Council. Secondly, the Parks and Recreation Commission considered the Heritage Tree appeal. They denied it. I think uh, the Commission serve at the pleasure and authority of the Council, and I urge you to support the Parks and Recreation Commission in their finding. Thank you. Mr. Farrell, thank you very much. Uh, first name, Chris, online. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Good evening. Hi. Um, so I would just encourage the Council to follow 
city ordinance um, you know if this is somebody else they would be red tagged probably for not following city ordinance and it's your ordinance and you should follow it how do you expect citizens to be lawful if their representatives are not following the law it just kind of reeks of um, <clears throat> backhanded shady deals and and um, uh, no transparency whatsoever um, additionally my, the problem with this program for me is cities throughout the world are um, not allowing cars into the center city of, of town to make it more livable and by providing 200 plus parking spaces in downtown you're just asking for more noise pollution and parking issues that were already that you already had said you know in a previous um, on item number 15 that you wanted to encourage vision zero and climate action and uh, plan support this does not support that whatsoever by inviting 200 and some odd cars into the heart of downtown it's not going to be it's not going to make for a livable city whatsoever so i think the architect should go back try to incorporate the trees per city of santa cruz city ordinance and um rethink about building a parking garage essentially it has a library attached to it and i'd also like to say that when i voted for measure s dollars for renovation of a library I voted for renovation of a library. I did not vote for a parking garage. So that's all I have to say. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ms. Seals, good evening. Good evening. I'll be brief. Um, mm. We love the library. We love affordable housing. People love trees. And these pictures, you should have had 60 of them, I believe, in the last few weeks coming into your email. And these were taken by people along the periphery, not in the inside. So there's tree five, which is quite healthy. You go look. It's obviously healthy. And also, uh, I think one of these is on a liquid amber. But anyway. Just to remind you, a lot of people in the city really love the trees. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seals. Good evening, sir. Um, Mayor, sorry. We got word that there is someone online who was not able to raise their hand, or we're not seeing their hand raised, so I'm going to try to unmute them. Very good. So just hold for us for just a moment here. Good evening. My name is Elaine Johnson. Hi, good Executive evening. We Director can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Please proceed. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council members, for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, I'm calling in to talk about the Downtown Library and Affordable Housing Project that I think is absolutely amazing and will continue and, and help to bring you know, the much needed housing that is needed here throughout Santa Cruz County. Um, I couldn't think of a better place to build 124 affordable housing, rebuild the library, which will have the child care facility. I grew up in, in a place in New York where we had child care facility and it was a, it was so impactful when parents dropped their kids off and knew that their kids were safe and they can come back home and pick up their children. So I, I'm here this evening to urge each and every one of you to support this project, allow this project to move forward, as we can continue to allow Santa Cruz County and the city of Santa Cruz for this project to continue to be its vibrant community that it is. Thank you so very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Now, let me see. Uh, the gentle lady who wanted to go last this is your opportunity. Here we go. Let's uh, hold for us for just a second here, or just one second.
just one second. We good? Good. You're on. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Linda Marin, and I am presenting for Give Our Trees a Chance, Save Some Trees Coalition. And um, slide, please. There are 12 groups and 896 individual people who signed on to our appeal of the tree cutting permit that Parks and Rec issued in October. Slide, please. Um, I feel as though a lot of this presentation has already been made by the general public, and I'm gonna try and zoom past some of it. Okay. But um, we were, I'll say, disappointed, of course, that on December 12th, the Parks and Rec Commission denied our appeal and upheld the tree removal permit with a four to three vote. However, we still appeal to you to uh, incorporate at least two of those perimeter trees, as you've heard many times tonight, uh, and fulfill the programmatic goals of the project on Lot 4. We're certainly not in opposition to that project. We're, we want it to be as good as it can be. Slide, please. How we got here, this is a, a thick slide, and I'll try to make it easier. Um, we based our appeal on the absence of any information from the city following our records request, indicating that the staff had given information or direction regarding the heritage trees on lot four when it communicated specifications for the multi-use project to the architects. But they did ask for information about the trees they contracted with um, an arborist at Dryad and got a report um, in January that the trees uh, were indeed, some were heritage trees, and that um, five of them were deemed worthy of preservation. And if you look at the um, management codes for 10 and 11, which are the sweet gum trees, liquid embers, they get a grade of B, which means preserve specific maintenance recommended. So these are not all failing trees. Five of them are worthy of preservation. Slide. Thank you. Um, one of the uh, things that allows a heritage tree to be cut down is that the, uh, a construction project design cannot be altered to accommodate existing heritage trees. Now, that assumes that the, the designer of the construction is informed about the heritage tree resolution and, and takes that into account in the initial design of the tree, uh, of, the, of the construction. Um, in June of 2022, Michael Guth, who's the head of the Santa Cruz, Cruz Sierra Club, um, was concerned when he attended an, a presentation to the city council on the first uh, go-round, I guess, about the, the project and heard nothing about heritage trees or the tree ordinance. Um, and he wrote to the city staff asking the developer to alter the current design to comply with the city's legal obligation with respect to its heritage trees. Um, and Bonnie Lipscomb wrote back, acknowledging the receipt of his letter and in the highlighted part, you'll see the designs and presentations to council have been project updates on the library component of the project specifically and have been conceptual in nature, which one would infer, infer means, oh, maybe there's still time. They're going to include the trees um, at some later point. Next slide, please. In September of that year, though, the same arborist was asked to submit an addendum to his original evaluation of the trees. He confirmed his prior evaluation of the trees with the five worthy of preservation, but he responds to what were called conceptual plans in June as the reason now why all 12 trees would have to be removed. And I quote, the building footprint encompasses an area including all 12 trees. He, he understood that, he knew that. Um, but what happened to considering the trees 
in the in the initial plans. Um, it, it looks to us like the trees were never considered for the design and project program. They were an afterthought, and that's not how the heritage ordinance, tree ordinance and resolution really work and were intended. So the question is, can they be incorporated without changing the project's goals? Slide, please. The space is there. Jim Rendler for For the Future um, says that it would take about 3,000 square feet um, to include the trees. And you can see the schematic there of trees 11 and 12 reaching into the building that much and reaching over the sidewalk that much. Um, and it all comes, it, when you uh, add it all up, it all comes to uh, the heritage trees taking 2,974 square feet of space. Slide. As we've mentioned m much today, the program, the programmatic goals changed for this project a lot over time. Um, it didn't used to have commercial and daycare, and now it does, and that's a great thing. Uh, and the council approved 7,000 to 9,000 square feet for that commercial and daycare space. Slide, please. Slide. Um, and what you can see here when you look at the um, highlighted portion to add up the commercial space, now it currently comes to 11,950 square feet. So that's three to 5,000 more than was even approved. Um, and th that, everyone knows that you can't just transfer that space to where the trees are. I don't mean to imply that it's so simple, but that there are there is space um, to be renegotiated in an, in an altered plan. Slide, please. So here we are, the heritage tree appears to have been largely disregarded until the appeal, um, but we are asking that a few trees be included in the project, and it would enhance the project, and there's space for it, and a, a benefit would be to everyone, the library, the affordable housing complex, the environment, the streetscape, and the community. S slide, please. Uh, the, the city council in 1998 was very foresightful in developing the heritage tree ordinance and um, resolution. We didn't have that much information then about global warming, um, and maybe that wasn't even a big um, consideration at that time. But uh, what they knew it, and codified is that these trees, these big trees of ours, are extraordinarily valuable. And the health and all policies uh, framework that the present city council has adopted is another one of those forward-thinking kinds of um, uh, forward-thinking acts on the part of you, your um, city council. Uh, all kinds of cities, of course, are, are doing heritage tree and just tree replanting, tree planting, tree transplanting in San Francisco. That's happening so that even big trees are being moved around to make more tree equity. Um, 50,000 trees uh, in San Francisco are being planted, and I think 75,000 in Chicago in the next five years. Slide, please. Um, if we closed our eyes and all just tried to guess what are the health benefits of big urban trees, we could probably come up with quite a few of these categories, but I think some of them would surprise us. Some of them surprise me anyway. And um, what uh, Yale Climate Connections has done is gathered uh, all information about health benefits of large, mature urban trees. And um, I think what's particularly interesting is the fact that um, there is so much positive impact on so many different aspects of our health, including immune system, which is surprising since there are pollens coming from trees. Um, but social cohesion has an po entirely positive impact from the research done. And then the most surprising one, I thought, was weight status. Like, who would have guessed that? Um, and I think the bottom line here is 
that there's constant de development of information and materials coming to us about trees and the, and the relationship we have with them and, what, and the relationship they have to our health and our well-being. Next slide. And besides health, of course, there's the whole issue of tree equity. And we've been talking a lot about uh, affordable housing. We know that um, there are going to be people living in these um, units that are maybe not having to drive anymore from Watsonville, as someone mentioned, um, and saving carbon that way. But um, why not let them have some big trees, too, for their streetscape? if the trees are already there, and in, they're not falling down, and yes, they have some acute angles, but they are still viable, they are deemed worthy of preserving, and um, I live with a, a liquid amber. Yeah, sometimes some branches fall, but we haven't had that experience with these heritage trees, actually. They're pretty darn robust. Next slide. Um, the, the urban heat island phenomenon is something I think we all know about. Um, and as we build more and more dense urban uh, structure and development um, to meet our, our arena requirements, um, this is going to become more and more of an issue for us. And um, in a heat wave, an added seven degrees, which is what this, this um, graph shows, um, in the daytime and a 22 degree uh, heat elevation at night because of the radiation uh, coming back out of the, all the concrete. Uh, well, that makes a big difference for health and for survivability. And, and we're lucky in Santa Cruz. We don't have you know, too many really big heat waves, but we're also still traveling into um, climate disruption that doesn't promise us to have the, the kind of climate and temperatures that we have always been used to. Slide, please. S size matters. It really matters with trees. Um, I know that um, many people have mentioned that um, there's going to be so much replanting or, or sapling planting to replace these trees. And that's good. All of that is good. But the uh, amount of trees, really, that it would take to replace just even one heritage tree, like one of the liquid ambers, is about 29. And the, uh, the impact won't really be beneficial to us in the same way at all as the liquid ambers ever will be, because we won't plant trees that big. and They'll never get that big. And um, we will we'll have less benefit than we can have with the trees we, we've got right now. So, slide. Thanks. Santa Cruz values our large trees. We all know that. Um, and uh, Santa Cruzans especially value the trees on Lot 4. They're sacred to some people. They're welcoming and protective to others. They're challenging and uplifting to the climbers. And overall, they provide a sense of place that runs deep, like roots, in the collective psyche and culture of this town. And I'm sure you felt that at a farmer's market, or um, queuing up for a Martin Luther King march, or meeting a friend at the food trucks, or listening to musicians under one of the trees, or attending a rally, or just finding a shady spot to park your car. The trees have accompanied us so consistently through all the seasons and chapters of our lives here in this city, we love them, and what we love connects us. It will be painful and hard to lose them. And our children love these trees too. They are heritage trees after all. They are meant to be inherited by those children who grew up loving them. Imagine the addition of a magnolia to the children who will spend every weekday and the child care center. Slide, please. We know this project will require the removal of all the trees inside the perimeter of the project. And we know there's a timeline for getting funding and moving forward, and that's important. 
Although it is very hard for the tree lovers to let so many precious friends go, we know this project needs to go forward. So we're <coughs> saying goodbye to those trees. <coughs> My own timer. <laughs> Slide, please. Two more slides. So we ask that you please consider asking for a design alteration to incorporate some trees. A, a real question, how long could that take? Would it be worth actually just asking even how long could that take? Um, we hope you'll set a date to consider both options and choose between alternatives and move forward. Slide, please. And we thank you. And um, I know we're all exhausted. I can't imagine that you want to ask any questions, but if you do, um, please do. And we look forward to this project being the very, very best it can. Thank you. Thank you very much. The way we operate here, that should have been the last presentation. So I am out of an abundance of interest in making sure no one's opportunity is shut off here. Does anyone who's with us in chambers wish to make additional comment? I see we have two online, but let me see if there's anyone with us. Seeing, hearing none, that's the last opportunity for folks who are with us in chambers. Let's go to Mr. Meckel. Hey, good evening, uh, good Council. Evening. I wasn't planning on being one of the last comments, um, but I appreciate you taking mine. I just wanted to say, as we consider health and equity in this project and with these trees, that we also consider the people not with us tonight who are not able to comment because they're either working or they live too far away. They don't know about this project. Um, there are any other reasons that they couldn't be here with us tonight. Uh, the people who are gonna live in this project are low and very low income individuals in the county. As we know, there are about 12,000 people on the wait list for affordable housing. Those are the people that will be living in this project. Right now, those people may be spending upwards of 30% of their rent on housing. Maybe they're rent burdened, maybe even higher than 30%, 30, 40, 50%. These people will have a place to live that is truly within their budget and not causing their family to choose between groceries or paying rent this month. Uh, just something to consider as you think about this. I hope you'll go forward and approve this project, uh, get it moving so we can get more affordable housing in the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next with us, and I think the last person who's going to provide testimony, Casey Beyer. Uh, good evening, sir. Welcome. Mayor Keeley and good Council evening. I want to uh, congratulate you for running a really well-run meeting tonight. It's important that the public has an opportunity to comment on uh, an important issue like this. Um, the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce has been instrumental in supporting this project since 2015, before it even went to the ballot with Measure S. It's important to notice that over the years, uh, we have been engaged in the opportunity to watch the City Council, a uh, number of uh, committees, work through the public process to come up with a great project. And really, this boils down to two things. One, people and the economic vitality of Santa Cruz County. Uh, we are at a, a, a crossroads where we're talking about two trees versus children. And I wanna emphasize the word children again. The next generation of educated people are our children. They will use a library educate themselves to read, to learn, and be part of the community. This project has done instrumental things to make sure that we make that a reality. We can talk about native trees, we can talk about moving a farmer's market, we can talk about a garage, but we're talking about the future of Santa Cruz. I urge you to support the staff's recommendation. It's imperative that we do this and move forward. We've been through this for eight years, and now is the time to build a beautiful project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Byer. We appreciate your testimony. 
All right, it seems now as if all testimony has been provided. The matter is back before the council. I want to make sure, Mr. Condotti, I want to make sure that we, that I handle this correctly. As I understand it, we have an appeal. Should we act on that first and then act on the project in chief? I think the council can take action on the entire, entire package. Uh, body of issues that are before you as indicated uh, in the recommendation section of the agenda report. Okay, very good. Thank you. I will recognize Council Member Newsom for a motion. Oh, excuse me, I am sorry. I'm going to recognize Ms. Brown for a motion first. You have a question first? Okay, let's go. Uh, I have a question for the city staff. Can the heritage trees on site be accommodated without reducing the current programmatic features of the project? Thank you for that question, council member. Um, there is a uh, memorandum from Jason Architecture that has a tree by tree kind of breakdown of the impacts of retaining those individual trees to the project. And so I think that's probably the most instructive. Um, and for that, uh, I believe Abe Jason with Jason Architecture may be available on the line and perhaps he can speak a little bit further to the precise impacts uh, to retaining any trees, particularly trees 10 and 11, if Abe is available. Yeah, happy to speak to that. Mayor, council members, thank you for your time tonight on this important issue uh, at, you know, at hand for the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I'm gonna uh, share my screen, I believe I can do that, uh, to uh, provide an exhibit that was uh, provided along with a tree analysis that the city prepared for this project. So give me a second to pull that up. Um, so you should be able to see my screen now. This is uh, the exhibit that was prepared along with the, the memorandum uh, for, for trees on the project. and. What you can see is the heritage trees, each identified by a number, and uh, the area of the heritage trees as it impacts the library footprint in blue. Um, this is the first floor of the library. Excuse me. This is the first floor of the library, the second floor of the library, and then the mezzanine level of the library. So you can see that the uh, the heritage trees have a significant impact on the footprint of the library. I think it's also worth noting that you can see in this um, exhibit that the the footprint of the trees, uh, you know, sort of as defined as an impact within this memo in this exhibit, are drawn uh, tightly to the tree canopy. However, the reality is we would uh, not be building directly to that tree canopy. So you uh, really would look at a radius another four to six feet beyond the tree. And you can imagine um, sort of how significant that impact was uh, if you draw a line kind of along the edge of these trees. Um, you, you know, with, with all the heritage trees, you would be looking at a sort of significant and detrimental impact to the library. And even if you look at the trees individually, um, any single tree uh, as it impacts the library would have a, a significant domino effect in terms of uh, programmatic function, layout, and square footage. Um, and I'm happy, happy to answer, answer any specific questions, but I think that sort of generally describes the impact uh, of the trees. Council member? Good. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I have a motion that I sent to the city clerk. Um, Bonnie, if you could pull it up. It's a long motion. I couldn't provide it in advance because Don't we worry, operate under go. the Brown Act. Let's go. Um, okay, um, so you can go ahead and read along with me. Um, so my motion is to approve the heritage tree removal permit. Uh, applied for on October 12th, 2022, for removal of the following trees, um, using the numerical designations established by Dyad. 
um, conditional upon city council approval of a building permit for the library affordable housing project on lot four. Two, direct that the city staff have the library affordable housing project developer and architect to develop an alternative conceptual design for the library affordable housing project that could accommodate the two liquid ambers. Those are trees 10 and 11, um, kind of there on the corner or towards the corner um, uh, on Cedar <coughs> and Lincoln. Uh, to be provided to the city council no later than May 1st, uh, in, the, in the spirit of not delaying, uh, direct that the alternative conceptual design for the library affordable housing project shall not sacrifice any programmatic goals of the downtown library or child care center Direct that city staff have the library affordable housing project developer and architect consider in its alternative conceptual design uh, the possibility of incorporating tree number five, which is a non-heritage tree. I'll just keep, I'll summarize, paraphrase here. Uh, pursuant to these requests, direct the council at its next meeting following the provision of the alternative conceptual design, make a decision either to affirm that the final design will accommodate heritage trees number 10 and 11, possibly tree number five, as provided in an alternative design, or approve the heritage tree removal permit conditional upon city council approval of a building permit for the library affordable housing project on lot four, and affirm that for pur the purposes of seeking sources of funding for the library affordable housing project, this motion would establish a decision framework for final development uh, of architectural construction plans and the decision concerning which alternative to pursue shall have no effect on the final issuance of a building permit for the library affordable housing project. Is there a second? Motion fails for lack of a second. Mr. Newsom is recognized for a motion. I'd like to make a motion to accept the agenda item. Make the motion. I'm sorry. I'll make a motion. Yes. Please. I'd like to make a motion. To I'll second that. Well, well, let me hear your motion. I'd like to um, make a motion to accept the agenda item and the stack recommendation. Is there a second? There is a second. Motion and a second. Under discussion. Uh, you can open on your motion, sir. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. So uh, this project uh, was approved um, by close to 60% of voters uh, in November. Uh, and I think this project will be a great addition to downtown and by extension to my district and by extension to the city. Uh, it provides uh, 124 units of much needed affordable housing. So housing for, say, construction workers and social workers and teachers in our community. Uh, and it also provides a state-of-the-art library uh, that the community can enjoy that has uh, great features such as a child care center, which as a parent I think is a great thing, especially since it's for working uh, families. Uh, now, I, I want to thank those uh, who came out and expressed their support uh, for the heritage trees and for the heritage tree issue, and I appreciate uh, your concerns on, on the issue. Uh, Mayor Keeley and myself um, have been working on this issue uh, for quite some time uh, to find something that we think uh, will help address this issue. And I want to thank Mayor Keeley uh, for his work that he has done uh, and on this issue. Uh, now part of that work, we want to offer a condition for this project, and I'm hoping that can be uh, brought up see uh, the condition condition number 73 uh, so the condition uh, that I am I am putting forward is one it reads a total of or the modifications are a total of 14 24 inch box size replacement street trees shall be installed around the proposed library building to replace the nine heritage trees to be removed to accommodate the proposed project. Additionally, city staff will plant 12 street trees of 24 inch box size at all site locations within the city's greater downtown area. Locations and species uh, shall be identified by the Parks and Recreation Department consistent with the downtown plan and approved street tree list. 
Additionally, another 10 trees shall also be planted in the greater downtown area. In total, 36 replacement street trees will be installed in the greater downtown area to offset the nine heritage trees currently proposed for removal at the library site. All such trees shall be planted prior to issuance of certificate of occupancy for any affordable housing unit. So while this project would typically require planting nine new trees. Let me do this. That's an amendment to your own motion. So I want to make sure we get a second if that's what you're looking for here. You're, you're making an, an yes, additional sir. motion here. Is there a second? Ms. Golder seconds. Please proceed. All right. Thank you. Uh, so while this project would typically just require nine, the planting of nine new trees, uh, one tree for each heritage tree that's being removed, this project with this con condition attached will be required to plant 36 new trees or four times the typical number. And the goal with this condition is to offset the uh, loss of carbon sequestration that will uh, take place with the removal of the heritage trees on site. And it seeks to do so by adding 36 new trees to our downtown ecosystem and creating a great uh, eco ecosystem. Um, so in closing, I think with this uh, condition, this project will make a great um, investment in our community. It will provide much needed affordable housing. It will provide a great uh, library in downtown that we will be able to enjoy and that our children will be able to enjoy. And it will help um, build and um, keep a vibrant downtown ecosystem. Debate or discussion? I'm wondering if I might uh, add the additional condition on here that appears, uh, which is when the removal of magnolia trees occurs, staff shall evaluate whether wood from the magnolias can be salvaged for use on site as benches, tables, artwork, play equipment, or other amenities in coordination with the project architects. Is that acceptable to you? Yes. Make a motion, seconder. All right, with that. Uh, if I might comment briefly, this community believes in re reduce, reuse, recycle. Seems to me if uh, we're going to go down the path that uh, the gentleman wants us to go down, which I want to go down as well, uh, that we should uh, reuse to the degree possible and integrate those uh, into this project. Uh, I think it, it is a way to honor the history of those trees uh, as well. Questions or comments, Ms. Brown? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you uh, to my colleagues for uh, thinking about the trees and, and how to address this, this major challenge we have related to carbon sequestration. I just want to make a few comments here uh, that I, I wasn't able to make in the context of m my attempted motion. Um, <laughs> and so I just want to say a few things. The community members who initiated uh, this appeal and who have, they've really been asking, many of them, um, there's a lot of overlap between the folks who filed the appeal and people who have been working very hard for a very long time uh, to, um, to rethink uh, the way that we approach our, our planning of downtown and particularly with respect to Lot 4 and the current uh, the existing library site. And they've been very dedicated to that. And, um, and they're asking us to consider incorporation of at least two of those heritage trees. Um, and it's been more than a robust debate. Um, as you, those of you probably are here, you've been following it, you know. Um, and it's been protracted and difficult. Um, I believe the project before us is a better one because of those conversations. It's, it's a much better project today. Um, and it provides a range of community benefits, affordable housing. Um, and, and I felt that this could be another opportunity to improve the project. Um, there's been significant alterations, but no real attempt. It doesn't feel to me and uh, the appellants uh, or the original appellants, um, you know, have, su have suggested that or they've, they've made that claim. And, um, you know, they argue that the city isn't following its own laws with respect to the heritage tree ordinance. I'm concerned about that. I take that very seriously. Um, and I'm concerned about climate change, as we all are here, I imagine. Um, and it will take decades for replacement trees to um, 
to provide the same carbon sequestration benefits that we see now with old, older mature trees. You know, I teach about this and, um, you know, I, I talk about it and it's just so clear, the science is so clear. You know, and then I get into this room and we have to make uh, very difficult uh, decisions and weigh real world uh, challenges, <laughs> right? And, and, and trade-offs. So um, it's, it's hard <laughs> for me to, to drop those concerns. Um, you know, people are asking for, uh, you know, these trees, not just for the, the carbon capture, but for shade, you know, tree canopy, to soften the streetscape. Somebody said to me yesterday, that's all we're asking for is that you think about softening that, the built environment um, that we all move through on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it could be a small step to do that, to, um, you know, a small gesture to help heal the divisions that I have seen arise in our community over this, of all things, a library project. Um, I mean, it's just staggering that um, we, we are find ourselves in this place. Um, so, you know, I guess I'll just, and I don't believe that it's a trade-off. I, th I thought maybe this could be a way to, to try to figure it out a little bit. And um, given that that's not happening, um, I, I do want to say, though, that I, I genuinely believe it's a much better project than it was um, when we got started, and um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Uh, thank you to um, everyone who worked on this, and thank you to the speakers here in chambers and who um, called in. I know it's been a long evening. Uh, I want to just also acknowledge that I met with some of the members who spoke um, from the Save Give the Trees a Chance group, and I did follow up um, to find if there were any alternatives. And what I, the information I got back from staff and the architects um, went back to that question that Ms. Marin asked, that would it impact the goal of the project? Would it delay the project? Would it uh, compromise affordable housing units? Um, and, it, and the information I got um, pointed to that it would. So I, I appreciate um, your motion, Councilmember Brown, but ultimately I'm in support of the motion before us because I think that we do have a great project and a better project because of the dialogue that's happened in the community. Um, and I hope that this is an invitation to continue to have these conversations. Hopefully we're moving ahead with this project, but there will be many more projects that will come before us. So let's continue to have dialogue so that we can make each project that comes before us a better one. And, and I appreciate, okay. no, I appreciate no. the... Um, no, you can't. No, you can't. <laughs> Thank you. Back before the council. Uh, I appreciate the added conditions as well. Thank you. Ms. Watkins. Yeah, I'll um, keep my comments brief because I think a lot of them have already been said. And I also appreciate the motion before us. I, too, had a chance to meet with a lot of individuals, reached out to our staff to understood what, understand what could be possible, and ultimately learned that, really, we have limited choices here. Having been on the council throughout a number of votes in regards to this, this project, you know, the community's fingerprints are all over it, right? And that it has made these improvements element by element and transition by transition. And this is another iteration of that. I particularly am proud, one, to have really championed and wanting to see the childcare. I think that's huge. So I just, I think there's aspects of our project that we can be really proud of. And I really appreciate what the addition was in regards to the reuse of the trees. I think, you know, what, um, what I really get is a sentimental attachment to these trees and to what this represents for our community. And, and nobody wants to be in the position to have to make these types of choices, and that's our job. And so how we can integrate them in a reuse purpose is a really creative um, solution. I just really appreciate that addition. So I'll conclude my comments there. Thank you. Ms. Golder. I, too, will keep comments brief. Everything um, a lot of people have said I completely agree with. and. I, um, I don't think this has to be an us versus them. I have reached out to many of you to speak to you about this issue. I love trees. I spend every weekend hiking in the, in the woods. I grew up in Bonnie Dune. And um, I also am really proud of this project and I can't wait to see it to completion. Having visited the Capitola Library about three times in the past six months, 
are gonna hate this. I had to circle the block three or four times to find a parking space because it was so packed with people and so many people wanted to be there to read the books, study, gather in groups, and it was just such a beautiful space that um, it's really a, a magnet for that community. And so I really wanna see that um, here as well. I also asked if this, if the two trees could be saved and if it would impact the size and the scope of any aspect of the project, similar to um, what um, Mr. Newsom asked. And I'm just not willing to compromise that for the community. And I think you'll all remember when I asked about the trees being repurposed back a couple years ago, when I reminded you that the trees that were planted at Santa Cruz High Memorial Field in memory of students that were killed in World War I had to be cut down. They repurposed them into a beautiful bench as you walk up the stairs next to the names on the wall of all the students that lost their lives in World War I mm. through the current um, Gulf Wars. And it's a really beautiful thing. And so I don't think, I know I was mocked on some people's um, social media and some of the people that love to troll me online, but I really think it's a great idea and um, I'm really happy that it was an addition as well. So thank you to everybody for your teamwork and I do hope this is still an open invitation to any member of the community that wants to have a dialogue about these um, projects moving forward because there's going to be a lot of redevelopment in the next three and a half years while I'm sitting here. Thank you. Mr. Kandati. I yes. would like to ask you to respond to the issue of whether we have sufficiently covered everything or we didn't. Uh, a couple things. Thank you. Um, the, the project architect is available if the council have qu has questions about the efforts that were made to incorporate trees into the design while achieving the, the primary objectives that the council outlined in uh, moving this project forward. Second thing, uh, council, is that uh, staff mentioned some modifications to the conditions of approval in their presentation uh, and have slides to show the council if you'd like to review that. But I want to make sure that those were incorporated into the motion. Or in as the well. motion. Okay. Further questions, comments, debate, or discussion? Ms. Watkins. I know that we're all, t we're all tired, but I do know that the community does want to know if this has been thought through in terms of the architect incorporating these into the discussion. So if that individual is available, I think it'd be really great to hear from you. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor. Good, good evening. Uh, Jim Rentler for the Future Housing. Um, I, I just wanted to speak real quickly. I really appreciate the consideration tonight. One thing I, I wanted to make very clear, um, our architects from the start, we we're familiar with, this is not you know, our first project in Santa Cruz, we are familiar with the ordinance. We, from the start, from the initial city RFP being published, did make good faith efforts to try to incorporate those. Um, and you know, as noted in the previous, I don't wanna belabor the points that we brought up, but I did want um, to add on to what Jason said, uh, Abe from Jason Architect said that, you know, the, the site, especially, it's not just the canopy, there's also soil, um, a lot of uh, differential settlement, the, all the soils downtown, the site is not unique, high water table. There's a lot of other challenges from a constructability uh, aside from just the pure impacts to the building footprint. But I wanted to make sure that that was clear. This isn't something that we have not tried to incorporate into the design. Um, and we have gone about that in several iterations trying to figure out how it could work. And the reality is you know, we're proud of where we are right now. I think this is a much better project than where we started. And I really appreciate the um, amount of uh, time and energy that everyone has put in on both sides to really get to where we're at. So I just wanted to note that for the record. Um, appreciate your consideration and I'm available for any questions that you have. I wanna ask if that was responsive to your question. That was. Was, very good, thank you. Further debate or discussion? Ms. Brown. It's not debate. I just want to make a, one, a concluding couple of comments. Um, so like uh, one of our earlier speakers, uh, you know, and I've said this, this project is greatly improved and, you know, and I'm very much supportive of the, the efforts that have gone into making it, uh, providing more community benefit, affordable housing, all of the things. Um, and I am like uh, the, an earlier speaker, I am torn. I, I am now torn. I, I came into this completely opposed. I am now torn, um, but um, I'm afraid to say that this is not gonna be a unanimous vote. 
I think the, the 40 or so percent, a little upwards of one third of the people who um, weighed in on this um, are gonna get one seventh of the vote tonight. So um, I just wanted to say that to be clear about why I'm doing what I'm doing. Very good. Further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Um, thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. Watkins? Aye. Councilmember Bruner is um, disqualified herself. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on oral communication. Anyone who is with us who wishes to speak on an item not on our agenda but under our jurisdiction can do so at this time. Good evening. Good evening, Council and Mayor and uh, Associated Administrative Assistants and leaders of the the Litigation League. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that uh, um, the point that I tried to make and the, and the effort that I put to, to get those packets to you people, and I, I don't feel like they even got looked at. And, okay, and I'm, uh, okay yeah, I'm, yeah. hold on a second. Sure. No, hold on. This is oral communication on an item not on our agenda, but under our jurisdiction. You are commenting on an item on our agenda tonight. Oh, okay, so all right. I, I apologize. Excuse I, I, me. I we got it off track. Excuse here. me. We won't talk over each other. I okay. won't do it to you. You don't yes. do it to me. Right. If you want to make a comment on something under our jurisdiction but not on our agenda, please do so. Thank you. Um, the bigger picture for me is the fact that uh, this city, and I've been researching this for more than 25 years, has been misspending the park fees and the and the Quimby fees uh, since 1972 on the facilities tax and since 1980 something on the Quimby tax. And um, I want to work with the city and with Tony to see that it gets fixed. It's been ignored and Barrisoni told me to just go ahead and litigate. Uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, you know, it's the taxpayer that loses. I, I presume and Mr. Condotti would get paid for whatever work he did to defend something that, but I've seen a lot of sloppy litigation and one of the sloppiest litigations that happened recently was the ordinances that the two, was two or three ordinances that were passed to control crowd events and, and rallies, et cetera. And right after that, two months later, we had one of the most massive interruptions of the city we've ever experienced. And so you can't just write an ordinance. I mean, that ordinance had things in it like, uh, the normal flow of traffic. Now, nobody could tell me that you have the data on the normal flow of traffic of all, all the major riders in, in the city, because I don't know what it takes to take that, 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 that information. So it, it's a matter of, uh, you, can't, you can't control public behavior with an ordinance in language unless you really work out what, what, how are you going to defend it and how are you going to enforce it. And, uh, I'm working really hard to see that the Quimby Act is, is properly interpreted and enforced and that money is going where it's supposed to because the main thing I've been trying to find out in the last six months, nobody in the city's heard of a Nexus study. And I did a whole PDF of the entire city's website and I found one reference to Nexus study on a traffic study. But, that, but there's supposed to be a Nexus study according to AB 1600 okay, and, so and what I'm going yeah, to do I'm, I'm is, close too far. No, 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 just, no, I'm starting to gallop, I'm sorry. Hold on, a second. hold on a second, I'm trying to help you out here. All right. What I was gonna say is, when you and I had our little call right. a few seconds yeah. ago, I intruded on your time. Take five more seconds and wrap up. Okay, well, you'll hear from me again. Okay. Mostly in right. <laughs> We do believe you on All that, right. sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. We appreciate Good night, everybody. Good night, sir. Uh, any further business to come before the council? We have people online. There are people online. Thank you. Mr. Phillip, good evening. Uh, yes. Um, hey, I don't suppose I could have three minutes, could I? Two and a half. <laughs> it is important. It's better. It's not the usual leftist fashion. It's better than that. Anyway, and if you could start my time over, if you're only going to give me two minutes, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you're not going to do that. 
Okay, on 228, when the Westcliff damage was discussed, it was stated that it would be irresponsible to tell you we're going to put Westcliff back the way it was. It was actually irresponsible to combine a retroactive emergency repair cost item with a take it or leave it sparse on details authorization to do a one way study, prematurely deciding to put into effect the one way Westcliff adaptation management plan without giving council other options to consider, yes including putting it back the way it was and whether the first test of that plan shows in fact it is a failure that needs a reevaluation. As to the 2021 Westcliff Adaptation Public Works Plan, it was interesting to read all the many, many listed Westcliff CIP projects listed were unfunded and almost all funding was expected to come from somewhere else. Hey, how's that going? After my review of the plan, which does have a few things going for it, I still find it troublesome in its priorities. I find his priorities are of a nature conservancy type where no kidding stand is the highest priority, meaning let nature mostly take its own course and not instead a people priority, which is hardly mentioned. I note the first bullet points of the various sections read as such. Number one, protect beach width. Number one, minimize coastal armoring. Number one, improve multimodal transportation. Number one, minimize coastal habitat loss, which tells me cars, houses, and even public infrastructure like Westcliff Drive itself are zero priority expendable. This is known as a radical managed retreat coastal adaption plan. If you're keeping score, the plan score at Woodrow so far is Pacific Ocean 10, Westcliff Coastal Adaptation, adaptation Plan 0. It is the Thank you, sir. of sustainability. Thank you, sir. Ms. Kuehl, good evening again. Good evening. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I just wanted to talk about the fact that we don't have, um, and again, this is Alicia Cool, president of the Santa Cruz Homeless Union. We do not have a 24 hour available warming center or shelter during this crisis. That's one thing that was not on the agenda today. Um, I think that the crisis response for the unhoused population has been really unacceptable. Um, with all the money that flows through, I think we should have had a better warming center and maybe even motel vouchers um, for people during these emergencies. I wanna talk about the fact that today's the third anniversary of Food Not Bombs has been serving food now every day for three years. Um, and instead of supporting them, um, you know, the city continues to try to regulate them with that permit process. And it's not that they don't want to comply, it's that people need to eat no matter what. And, you know, Food Not Bombs cannot allow the city to regulate whether people can eat or not. Um, and I also want to go over just a couple of hard numbers because I hear a lot about, you know, violence against women and preventing that. And, um, you know, women and children are most vulnerable. Of our homeless population in 2022, we had 2,299 of those people's 1,774 were unsheltered, 32% uh, were female, 12% black, 39% have been in foster care before. We had 332 veterans on our streets, 93% unsheltered, um, 222 individuals that identify as children and transitional age youth, 97% of them were unsheltered. 48% uh, are living in tents, 38% in vehicles, and 14% just on the streets alone. Out of those individuals, 68% access free meals. And that's the importance of Food Not Bombs and, you know, services. And so while you're talking about funding and all of these other things, I would urge you to consider these numbers and provide more for our homeless population. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kuehl. Mr. Snyder. Hello. Good evening. Uh, let's see. Uh, I wanted I wanted to uh, mention a little bit about how I did some uh, uh, some data analysis of uh, some information from the uh, police department. So it's a public safety uh, uh, issue that I want to speak to. Uh, so uh, back in uh, 2021, uh, Facebook uh, posts uh, listed all of the vehicle break-ins and their locations within the city. Uh, so I, you know, I, I 
I counted up the number of uh, lines in the data set and I ran it through a, uh, a simple uh, word frequency counter and got some statistical data on uh, which, which, uh, which streets, which roadways in the uh, city have the most uh, petty victimization of vehicle owners. And uh, so it was real clear. Uh, we were speaking earlier about um, uh, Laurel Street and, um, and, you know, the unsafeness of it. And this is sort of related. It's kind of the broken windows theory, uh, you know, of uh, where uh, a little bit of disorder creates, a, a, you know, kind of the impression that, uh, you know, more antisocial, uh, higher level antisocial acts become more acceptable. So you'll see, uh, yeah, like uh, there were people in the lower, that happens to be one of the two zones that constituted, uh, so uh, streets off Laurel Street, uh, uh, Chestnut and Felix uh, and uh, Shelter Lagoon, uh, they're, they're, and that, they had as many as Ocean Street, and Ocean Street had the most. And I want to talk a lot about Ocean Street, uh, just because I feel really strongly that Ocean Street uh, needs a lot of care. Uh, it should, uh, I think it should be put in sharp focus by the city, making Ocean Street uh, more livable, uh, more nicer. It is kind of a keystone or uh, it is kind of a very central part of the city. Uh, you know, it, with respect to, it's the first thing that everyone sees and the last thing everyone sees when they leave. Thank you so much. Mr. Schneider, Mr. Schneider, thank you very much. I do not believe we have anyone else online, is that correct? Okay. Uh, oral communication, please. Uh, yeah, I would just also like to um, echo the concerns about the like police harassment of Food Not Bombs recently, um, the incident on Lot 10, and the incident here outside of City Hall, um, particularly the incident in Lot 10 citing health and safety concerns, um, when I would argue that, you know, enforcing the not distribution of supplies to people is a much greater threat to public health and public safety than like, you know, people setting up some tents without the proper permits. Um, and so I just would like to echo that um, as somebody who has, with people directly in my life, experienced homelessness. Um, I was, my mother has been struggled to live in this county for my entire life just to stay near me. Um, I was born into homelessness and so these things are quite concerning to me and you know I find that the you know when the police do their job of siding with property over people um, it it threatens and directly endangers the lives of the most vulnerable members of our community and also um, I'd like to talk about a few other things that are more me um, this one just came up earlier there's not a single active water fountain on this entire city hall campus I was thirsty during the break and I was like, where can I get some water? And I couldn't. There's, and this is a broader problem throughout the larger municipality area of just there not being public amenities for citizens to use when they are thirsty or they need to pee. Or um, the next issue I'm gonna bring up is if they're standing at the bus stop and it happens to be raining and most of our bus stops do not have any kind of rain guard of any kind and some that do, um, they only have rain guards on the top um, and then the sides are just open. And the bus stop I was actually sitting at this morning to come here um, was insufficiently protecting me because the winds were high enough that the rain was being whipped from the side. And so none of the bench was dry at all. I had to like, sit up on the bench. Yeah, there's just a variety of public amenities concerns that I think the city could be doing better to address. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you very much. Participating, we appreciate that. Ms. Bush, no one else online. No one else here. Before we adjourn, I want to thank our police officers for being here today. Thank you very much. We appreciate your presence. Thanks for all of those who participated today. A motion to adjourn and be in order. Ms. Golder moves, and, <laughs> and everybody and their brother and sister makes a second, but I'll say that it's uh, Ms. Watkins. <laughs> Not debatable. Those in favor say aye. Aye. This motion carries. We stand adjourned. No, it's always fun. Every time. Every time. Make me laugh every time. <laughs>